What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so about a month ago, at least I wanna say about a month ago, Ego Raptor over at Game Grumps had a question about Marvel. You know, he was like, well, I just finished reading House of M, I wanna read more X-Men, where do I go next? And it was a really good question because I was sitting here thinking about this and I was like, man, that's true. Like a lot of people don't know because the X-Men just kinda like spun out into a litany of titles. It's always been that way. You originally had X-Men back in the 1960s and then you had uh, Uncanny X-Men in 1975, which was like the creation of a second line of titles. And then in 1992, you had X-Men Volume 2. So then you had X-Men and Uncanny X-Men is two publications running at the same time. And as the X-Men grew to be more and more popular, you had all kinds of things, you know, X-Men Deluxe and you had X-Men Unlimited, you know, and then eventually that spun out. You had Extreme X-Men and then you had New X-Men and Astonishing X-Men. And you had so many different X-Men publications that it just baffled the mind. People didn't really know where to start or where to go. So uh, this video goes out to Ego Raptor. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever else is interested in, in this. But when Joe Quesada took over Marvel in the early 2000s, uh, Marvel was coming out of the comic bust, right? I mean, the comic book industry almost collapsed. Marvel had to sell off the rights to a bunch of their characters in movie form in order to stay afloat, which is why Fox has the X-Men, the Fantastic Four. That's why Sony has Spider-Man. That's why Universal had the Incredible Hulk for a while, I think. I, I, they might still have the Hulk, now that I think about it. But, you know, Marvel was uh, was selling off things left and right. And Joe Quesada said, okay, here's the problem. We spent far too long building, you know, doing world building. What we need to do is we need to get back to basics. We need to get back to a core set of groups. We need to get back to a core set of people, focus on those, and then basically rebuild. It was effectively a reboot in a lot of different ways. It's just Marvel doesn't do New 52. They don't line wide reboot. They don't start everything back at zero again. They just say, let's revamp and change things up. Now, Joe Quesada did this in a couple forms. It was Avengers Disassembled and House of M. The Avengers were very, very easy to basically reset. I mean, they're just a team. All you have to do is just break the team up. All you have to do is just give a reason for why the Avengers can't be Avengers anymore. The issue was that Tony Stark bankrolled the Avengers team. For those of you guys who are wondering how the Avengers made their money, how they got paid, Tony Stark was the one that took care of all that. He gave them a place to stay. He basically paid their bills, made sure they had money. They, they received a stipend, but it was enough for them to take care of the things they needed to do. All Joe Quesada did was come along and say, hey, look, if we're basically going to reboot the mutant landscape, if we're going to get rid of the, the Avengers, then why not kill two birds with one stone? And so what he did is he grabbed Scarlet Witch, a character whose powers had been ambiguous for years and years and years, and said, okay, let's go ahead and just change this up a bit. Let's go ahead and just use her as a way to get rid of the Avengers and then eventually reboot the mutant landscape. And so what he did is, or at least what Marvel did with Avengers Disassembled, is they had a segment in the story where the Scarlet Witch had basically controlled the mind of Tony Stark, or at least modified his body's physical structure to the point that he appeared drunk. And the result was that because people thought that he had relapsed back into, uh, back into alcoholism as bad as he was during the events of Demon in a Bottle, the stocks of Stark Industries just plummeted. Now, they didn't fall so bad that Tony Stark couldn't take care of himself, but they fell bad enough that Tony Stark could not fund the Avengers anymore. Anymore. And so the Avengers basically had to break up. Now, of course, the whole basis behind this was because the Scarlet Witch was convinced that the Avengers had taken her kids. She was convinced that her kids were real. The Avengers had taken them and she basically waged a war against them. But at the end of Avengers Disassembled, after this great big huge conflict and the death of Hawkeye and so on and so forth, Marvel went into the House of M. And that's what this does. This basically picks up with the idea that at the end of Avengers Disassembled, Magneto had taken his daughter, Wanda Maximoff, and said, I'm sorry I'd, I'd abandoned you for so long. I'm sorry I had ignored you for so long. Clearly, you have a serious illness that we need to sort out, an illness of the mind, come with me to Genosha and we will go sort that out. Of course, Genosha being uh, a mutant refuge that was wiped out during Grant Morrison's new X-Men by Cassandra Nova. You'll find that video down in the description, by the way, where Cassandra Nova sent Sentinels and wiped out 16, uh, 16 million mutants. But this initially picks up with uh, with Wanda Maximoff giving birth to children. Now, this is really kind of cool because keep in mind, for years and years, it was Wanda Maximoff and it was Vision. They were not really like a power couple, but they were an interesting couple within the realm of Marvel Comics, essentially an android in a relationship with, uh, with a biological woman. Of course, the question being how the world are they going to reproduce but somehow they managed to find a way but remember this is basically wanda's perfect dream this is her you know situation where she's like yeah you know we finally have kids myself and vision finally have a family everyone who loves her is there she doesn't feel neglected she doesn't feel abandoned of course dr strange was delivering the children her brother quicksilver's there magneto's there this is a perfect dream the issue with this is that xavier appears and says you need to stop you have to stop doing this and this is the first step to casada and marvel showing us the powers of scarlet witch up until this point it had basically just been probability manipulation. It was a plot device. It was Scarlet Witch's powers do whatever it is that she needs to do in order to defeat whatever villain she's facing at any particular point in time. That's basically how her powers worked. Now, it wasn't as though she would single-handedly do it. It would just be like, oh man, the X-Men are on the ropes. If only we had this one thing, well then suddenly it's there. Suddenly the one break they need to win the battle is there because that's just what Scarlet Witch's powers do. 
too. And so because of that, she was basically this character that was just kind of out there in left field. And because there was no real foundation for her abilities, because there was no real, you know, solid concept for her powers, aside from some measure of magic or hex or something like that, then eventually fans just kind of stopped caring about her. And so because of that, this is basically Kasada and everybody saying the Scarlet Witch is warping reality. She's literally changing reality around her. And that's what's happening here. Not only that, something else that I'd like you to notice is that with regards to her powers, they're growing, they're progressing, they're becoming more and more potent to the point that Xavier can't curtail them anymore. And that's effectively what's been happening here. During the time when she's been in Genosha, during the time that she's been under the care of Magneto, that somewhere along the line, Xavier had basically arrived here and he had shown up for the purpose of trying to figure out how to control Wanda Maximoff's powers, how to bring them back under her ability to maintain. And again, this is always one of the focal points of Charles Xavier, because keep in mind with a Sun Legion, Legion's multiple personalities always ran amok. You never knew if you walked up on David Holler, you wouldn't know if you were talking to David Holler himself, if you were talking to Susan and Sunshine, if you were talking to the Orgamas, you wouldn't know which personality you were talking to. You could have been talking to like Endgame for all you know. And so the idea was for Xavier to always go through and try to find a way to keep his son's powers under control. And so because of this, this, you know, history with dealing with Legion is basically brought over to Wanda Maximoff. The issue is that as far as Xavier is concerned, this can't be controlled. Her powers can't be contained. They're growing too extreme. They're growing too potent to the point that she'll become a threat to the entire multiverse. And that's actually something that we'll focus on once we get to the end of House of M is how far reaching the powers of Wanda Maximoff really go. Because at the end of the story, she basically becomes a multiversal threat. Like it's, it's stupid how powerful she is at the end of the story. <laughs> But in response to the increasing powers of Wanda Maximoff, the fact that they can't be kept in check, uh, Xavier basically calls a calls a meeting of the Avengers and the X-Men. Now, the reason why this is done is because in the end, these are the two top teams in Marvel Comics. It just makes good sense, right? I mean, you know, sure, he could call together the, a group of the X-Men, but there are individuals who have a lot of experience with Wanda Maximoff because she was part of the Avengers. At the same time, the X-Men have faced off against her. And so it's just one of these things where it's kind of grabbing everybody that's had any kind of a role in, in Wanda's life. And the reason why is because Xavier is quite seriously pondering the idea of killing Wanda Maximoff. It's him basically saying her powers are growing too extreme to control. Somebody is going to do something and for all we know, she could just destroy the universe itself. And so he says her powers are too extreme. We basically have to find a way to bring it down. Now, the cool thing about this is the way that Bendis wrote this story, Bendis is really, really good when it comes to like interpersonal relationships among comic book characters. He's extremely good when it comes to writing characters and how they relate to others. It's one of the things that I love the most about his stories. That's why Doctor Doom being Iron Man right now and infamous Iron Man is so cool because it's a huge change from the status quo that we're used to when it comes to Tony Stark. But the idea here is that Quicksilver essentially has to, you know, is confronted by Magneto. Of course, Quicksilver spending all his time, you know, with his son. But the issue here is that Quicksilver is like, you got to do something. You know, they're going to kill your daughter and you have to do something. Now, the funny thing about this is that when it comes to Magneto, he's always been a bit disconnected from everyone, from mutants, from humans, so on and so forth. Sure, he's looked to protect mutants, but in this scenario, he's basically basically walking a nice edge. On one hand, his daughter's powers have grown to the extreme and they can't be controlled. On the other hand, it's his daughter. And it's one of these situations where it's like, you know, a father of any real measure would stand against the world and would watch the world burn if it meant that he could keep their child, you know, keep his child alive. That's the kind of sentiment that Magneto's feeling right now. But the issue is he's kind of torn because it's like the world could literally burn because of Scarlet Witch and her stream extreme powers. And this is the question that he has to Quicksilver. What would you have me do? Would you have me just kill everyone? Would you have me just stand guard here like a sentinel in Genosha? And anybody who comes knocking on the door of our home wanting to take out, take out Wanda Maximoff gets killed. What would you have me do you know and so it creates this really weird situation because in the end there's uh, there's arguments on both sides for example cyclops is like as charles xavier you've stood for the preservation of life even preserving the lives of people who would see you dead you stand for the preservation of life this is no different but it is and that's the huge thing here this isn't legion all right it's not like he's just gonna read the minds of people i mean sure legion launched legion quest he went into the past he intended to kill magneto xavier jumped in the way but it was him doing what he thought was the right thing to do he was still in full control of his faculties. The Scarlet Witch is not. It would be like if Robert Reynolds turned into the void, lost his mind, and decided to eliminate all things in existence. You know, if the Sentry basically became the bad guy. That's basically what's happening here, and that's the case that Charles Xavier is making. This is not her in full control of her faculties. She's insane. She's lost her mind. And so in the end, what they agree on is they say, look, if we're really pondering the idea of killing Wanda Maximoff, if we're really pondering the idea of killing someone who's been a friend, an enemy, an ally, you know, one of the most powerful beings we've ever met, then the very least we should do is ask her how she feels. 
else. I mean, at least ask her what she thinks. Now, I don't know, I'd love to see how that conversation goes down. Hey, Wanda, we're thinking about killing you, but we just want to know how you feel about that. <laughs> I'd love to know how that conversation would go down. The problem is that once they all race over to the location of where Wanda Maximoff is supposed to be, she's gone. Not only that, Charles Xavier is the first one to disappear. Now, we'll find out why Charles Xavier is the first one to disappear, but Charles Xavier is the first one to vanish. After that, people just start disappearing left and right. They're just gone. No one knows where they go to. They just vanish from one location to the next. Finally, Spider-Man's the last guy left. Things just sort of distort, and then we wake up with Peter Parker when he's in his apartment, you know, with a baby crying, and he's married to Gwen Stacy. Now, this is one of, this is where we basically learn what it is that the Scarlet Witch is doing. The Scarlet Witch effectively created a perfect world. That's, that's kind of, you know, what she did. Not really perfect, perfect, but perfect in, you know, 90% of the time. I mean, there were some people for like Ben Grimm, the world just absolutely sucked. But for the most part, it was perfect in, in almost every way, in the sense that everybody basically got their heart's desire. For example, we initially pick up with Steve Rogers, and that's kind of the crazy thing is because for him, um, he basically didn't have to outlive his friends. He was able to fight and, you know, continue fighting in World War II. He survived the experience, and he lived a life alongside his friends. Now, there is a tie-in for Captain America, and it focuses on all that, basically how uh, married to Peggy Carter for a while, they eventually got divorced, but it was the idea that for a time, he got everything that he wanted. His life progressed the way that he wanted it to initially, but that was the whole crux here, is Steve Rogers was literally always living in the past, and so what he got was the life he wanted in the past. The problem is with the modern day, he was never thinking about the present. He was never thinking about the long term. All he wanted to do was go back where his life left off, pick up from there, and continue on. That's what he got, but then everything began to go south. From here, we actually end up joining with uh, Cyclops and Emma Frost. Now, this actually makes a lot more sense, and one of the reasons why I say that is, in Marvel Comics, Cyclops and Emma Frost being together was something that had long since been running. I mean, really, you know, with Jean Grey, with her character kind of being out of the picture, with her being killed off, coming back, and then being killed off again, it basically set the stage for Grant Morrison to kind of mix things around, you know, dance things around. It was a chance for Chuck Austin to do the exact same thing, and to basically remove Jean Grey from the equation and to pair up Cyclops and Emma Frost. The result was that once they became headmaster and headmistress of the Xavier Institute after the events of House of M, that it made sense that the two of them were going to be together, but it was really this idea that they always shared a connection, and so even if their minds had changed only recently, the two of them very much saw themselves together. They saw themselves as a legitimate couple, but again, this is really only because Jean Grey is not part of the picture, but even if she was, it wouldn't matter because this is still part of Cyclops. If this was a perfect world, Jean Grey could be brought back by Scarlet Witch. Jean Grey could be resurrected, and Cyclops would be with Jean, but instead, he's with Emma Frost. And so, from here, we kind of pick up with, uh, with the irrelevant characters that became relevant. And this really hits home at the heart of what the Scarlet Witch did. We basically talk about the idea of characters who basically get a perfect life, who get a perfect world. For example, we pick up with Allison Blair, we pick up with Dazzler, and no matter what it's super effective might say, no matter what Faust might say, Dazzler's never been relevant. She was never a relevant character. But, neither was Simon Williams, and neither was Carol Danvers. Now, people will look at me and they'll say Carol Danvers was never really a relevant character. No, she was cool when she was on the Avengers, but she was never able to hold a solo title for any measure of time outside of her initial appearance. And the reason why was because back then, she was a sex object. She was one of the earliest characters that was used in order to bring in young boys into comic books. But once more and more characters started popping up like that, Rogue and so on and so forth, when uh, Mystique was kind of transformed, her physical design was transformed to make her very, you know, very um, interesting to young boys. <laughs> the result was that, um, you know, Carol Danvers just kind of took a back seat. Nobody really cared about her character that much anymore. We know that just because of all the changes her character went through and so on and so forth. And so, you know, her and uh, and, and Simon Williams and Allison were kind of like the, the lower echelon characters in Marvel Comics. But in the House of M, Allison Blair has her own TV show. Simon Williams is wildly popular. Carol Danvers is the most popular superhero on the planet. They all have the lives that they were looking for. They all have the lives that they were wanting. Now, from here, we actually switch over to Cincinnati, Ohio. And this is kind of cool because what this shows us is that not everybody goes on to live this huge, grandiose life or even amount to any measure of a superhero. Instead, we actually end up joining Kitty Pride, And Kitty Pride is just a mutant who's a teacher. Now, that's the cool thing about that is because what that tells us is that Kitty Pride, is when she was part of the X-Men, all she ever wanted to do is be a teacher. She just wanted to teach the next generation of kids. That was it. She didn't want to do some great, big, huge, grandiose thing. She didn't want to be massive in terms of being a superhero and so on and so forth. She just wanted to make sure the next generation was able to function adequately when it came to understanding their abilities, understanding what they were capable of. Now, from here, we actually end up joining with, uh, with Doctor Strange. And this is actually kind of a cool moment here. And the reason why I say that is because Doctor Strange is actually speaking to his client, Robert Reynolds. Now, the funny thing about this is this basically shows us how the Void compares to Scarlet Witch. One of the questions that I get a lot is when it comes to the, 
the ability of beings to warp reality, how do they compare to one another? Is one stronger than the other? When it comes to that level of power, it's really not a measure of which one's stronger than the other, just because of the fact that if they were to actually fight and use the full potential of their powers, it would just lay waste to the universe. I mean, it would just it would just result in the end of all things. I mean, that, that would really be what would happen. We saw that during Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, when the Beyonders, these, you know, beings that were just stupid powerful from beyond the multiverse, invaded the multiverse, started killing off all the cosmic entities, and then fought the fought the living tribunal. It just resulted in the death of everything. I mean, every, you know, all these different cosmic entities just started getting obliterated because they couldn't stand against that kind of power. With regards to the Void, the Void is the evil aspect of the century Robert Reynolds. Robert Reynolds, again, is, is one of Marvel's versions of Superman alongside Hyperion, Gladiator, a few others here and there. But the other half is he basically deals with multiple personality disorder. The Void represents every dark ambition, every ounce of hatred, every bit of distrust that Robert Reynolds has in his body. The problem is that the Void being so filled with anger and power is insanely powerful. There's the what if story for Siege, I think it is, where the Void kills the Marvel Universe. It wipes out everything in existence. Of course, you'll find that video down in the description as well. But what this also tells us is that within the House of M, the Void still exists. And so this gives us two ideas here. The first is that the Void is an intrinsic part of Robert Reynolds. As long as Robert Reynolds exists, the Void will be there. The second is that the Void is too powerful to contain. The Void is too powerful of a being for the Scarlet Witch to just eliminate. Because if this was the dream life that everybody had, Robert Reynolds wouldn't have the Void. <laughs> the Void wouldn't be there. And so because of this, this basically tells us the Scarlet Witch cannot contain the power that the Void possesses. The Void will always come back. The Void will always be there. And of course, we find this when Robert Reynolds is talking to Doctor Strange about how there's this black wall, this, this black darkness that always tries to encroach on him, but it always ends up going away. And so, of course, what we also learn here is that Doctor Strange is not the Sorcerer Supreme. Doctor Strange is just a psychiatrist. That's it. Like, he literally just listens to people's problems all day long. And again, this ties into the idea that Doctor Strange was just tired of listening, you know, tired of being the Sorcerer Supreme. He was tired of having to jump from dimension to dimension, losing his humanity. He wanted a simpler life, and a simpler life is exactly what he got. And so from here, we actually end up, end up transitioning over to a Colossus. And that's one of the coolest things about this, is because with the character of Colossus, he doesn't, he's never part of the X-Men. The X-Men were never formed. And what this basically tells us is that was his sole purpose. The only reason why Colossus ever came to America in the first place was because Charles Xavier went to him and said, we want you to be part of the X-Men, I want you to be part of a team that can help, you know, help fight off evil in the world. And Colossus said, okay, without Charles Xavier being there, and we'll, we'll find out why Charles Xavier isn't here now, but without Charles Xavier being there, Colossus didn't have a reason to leave Russia. And so he's basically been there ever since. He has his mutant powers, but he's not a superhero. He just lives a solitary life in Russia by himself. And so it creates a really interesting situation. But at this point, we basically pick up with Wolverine himself. And I know a lot of you guys were kind of like, when do we get to Wolverine? We pick up with Wolverine himself. And the, and the issue here is that Wolverine basically just remembers everything. Thing. He know he remembers everything before the events of House of M. Now, Bendis does not tell us why, at least not initially. He does not tell us why it is that Wolverine remembers everything before the House of M. He just does. Now, Bendis will do this. Bendis will do this in stories that he writes. He'll basically introduce plot devices. He'll introduce some character that will just serve no other purpose than to give him a way out than to give Bendis a way to end the story. It doesn't mean it's bad. Everybody does that. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just sometimes the way he does it is bad. For example, Ulysses in Civil War II. <laughs> Bendis didn't know what to do with him, so he basically just made him a cosmic entity, and then Ulysses just kind of went out into the universe, and that was the end of him. He'll probably never be seen or heard from again. But that's essentially what happened to his character. That's what Bendis does sometimes when it comes to these things. And so with Wolverine waking up right off the bat, he wakes up to what appears to be Jean Grey, but is actually revealed to be Mystique. Not only that, we actually also find out that like Toad, that Jessica Drew, that all these people are here, and then he finds out that he's actually on a S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, but it's not S.H.I.E.L.D. That is basically Magneto's own personal helicarrier, or I guess one of the, the mini helicarriers that Magneto has at his disposal. And so again, it's kind of jumping through these memories of uh, of Wolverine as he's, you know, recollecting all the way back to when his powers uh, first manifested, his first battle with the Incredible Hulk, the Weapon X project, you know, his wife, the conflict with Jean Grey, Charles Xavier, all these different things. And it's basically him saying, what in the heck is going on here right now? Things are are not supposed to be this way. Now, something that I want to talk about here for a second is the nature of reality warping. When it comes to Marvel Comics, whenever a reality is distorted, or whenever a reality is changed, like a new reality, a new universe is created, like the House of M, what happens is it's not like it just picks up all of a sudden. It's not like if you were walking down the road, you know, you're walking down the road of this universe and then you just hop over to the sidewalk. It's not like there's nothing behind you. There's everything behind you. There's a whole backstory to the House of M universe. There's all kinds of things that were there. And so essentially what is happening with regards to this House of M universe with Wolverine is that this universe, when the Scarlet Witch created it, she created this universe dating all the way back to its initial introduction.
destruction, you know, during some big bang that led to the creation of this reality. And things began to unfold the way universes always unfold, the creation of planets and creation of solar systems and galaxies and so on and so forth, all leading up to this point. Essentially what's happened is it's like the mind of Wolverine has been transferred over to this House of M reality version and the result is that he just kind of wakes up now the way this was initially written it wasn't that way the way this was initially written the main marvel universe had just been gone it was just it just disappeared and this took its place but when marvel went through following the events of house of m and they started talking about this universe and how everything was affected marvel basically said this was an alternate reality that the main marvel universe still continued on but wolverine's mind had just kind of been sent over it was it was a strange situation that's one of the issues that marvel had with their multiverse and one of the reasons why they got rid of it going up into secret wars was because it got to the point where it was really difficult to maintain and it was really difficult to explain it and to understand what was going on in comparison to normal stories. But the long and short of this is that Wolverine's basically coming to the recollection that everything's wrong here. He shouldn't be in a relationship with Mystique or they shouldn't be sleeping together at the very least. You know, he doesn't know anything that's going on. He doesn't recognize any of these ships. You know, when he jumps off the helicarry, he lands on the ground. You know, you've got Simon Williams, who's really popular. You've got Mary Jane Watson, who's an actress out of Hollywood that has, an, you know, one of the best actresses in Hollywood. You know, you've got people that are celebrating Spider-Man, you know, you've got all these weird things going on and he doesn't understand why. So for him, he's like, reality has been screwed up. Reality has been distorted. And so of course the journey of Wolverine takes him to the most logical place, right? I mean, when it comes to Wolverine, I wouldn't really say that he trusts people, but I would say that he does have things that are familiar to him. And the most familiar thing resides in West uh, Westchester County in New York, which is of course the Xavier Institute. And so when he gets there, he literally just kind of breaks into the home only to find out that it's not Charles Xavier's home. This has never been the home of Charles Xavier. This was just the home of some random family and he literally just kind of showed up in their house and it was just a really weird situation but at this point he kind of takes off to a local diner you know basically calls 411 says i need a name charles xavier based out of new york charles xavier doesn't exist charles xavier isn't there and so what this does is it basically follows wolverine as he begins to try to go through and try to discover everything that's happening and that's what makes this kind of cool because of the fact that we're literally following him we're following the only guy that seems to know what's going on the only guy who seems to realize that this reality has been distorted this reality has been screwed up and so of course along the way he's being chased by Mystique, by Jessica Drew, Nightcrawler, Toad, and Rogue. But this is basically kind of like a, a reimagining of Team X. You know, when it came to the concept of Team X, that was basically where Wolverine first got his start. You know, Wolverine, of course, developed his powers when he was a kid, and he just kind of went on the run for a little while. He was part of the Civil War, World War I, World War II. He fought alongside in, in a lot of these different conflicts. This all eventually led to the 1960s when he was paired up with, uh, with Sabretooth and a handful of others in a joint venture between uh, the United States CIA and Canada's clandestine destined group Department K to basically operate as Team X and they carried out a bunch of black ops missions but because of the fact that Team X was basically governed by the CIA eventually he was rolled into uh, the Weapon X project which led to the adamantium bonding process and all that kind of good stuff but the idea here is that this is basically a reimagining that it's a government sanctioned black ops team that carries out missions for really for, for Magneto since Magneto is the one running the show here but uh, um, again this really just kind of unfolds with him just going against his own team and it really makes sense here because the thing you got to keep in mind is that Wolverine's basically the leader of this team because he knows how to counter every one of them and that's one of the cool things when it comes to his character in the house of him universe it's still intact his his history is still intact you know his experience as a fighter is still intact his ability to to basically challenge a multitude of people and fight all of them at the same time whether they have powers or not is still intact and so he can literally take on the entirety of his team and hold his own against them the problem is that as he's making his escape from you know this i guess his former teammates he's suddenly met by cloak now cloak is one of these characters alongside dagger that just kind of appears in the background of stories they basically just kind of exist for the purpose of forwarding the plot <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to say that because I'm really excited about the Cloak and Dagger TV show, but that's all they ever really were. They were just kind of plot devices. They just serve the purpose of helping the story move forward. They were always background characters. They were always small time. They had some important roles here and there. For example, you know, Cloak had a really important role during Civil War when he uh, teleported the entire conflict from the negative zone all the way to New York. But aside from that, he was always just a small time guy. But Cloak basically has the ability to imbue people in his, you know, in his cloak and then just teleport them to any location. And so because of this, Wolverine's teleported to Luke Cage. Now, Luke Cage runs this kind of criminal underground to a degree. And it's interesting because, again, this basically shows us that Luke Cage himself, while he was a hero for hire, he rather would have been a guy on the ground level. He rather would have been a guy that was, uh, you know, I guess not really fighting crime so much as maintaining control of the streets. And so this seems to be more of like a power play for his character in the sense that when it came to Luke Cage, being a good guy was cool, but he rather would have been a guy that was running more of a show that had more of an influence on what happens on the street level. And that actually makes sense because that was the same thing with like, uh, with Old Man Logan. 
Logan. In Old Man Logan, we saw where the villains took over the world, Dr. Doom had his own section of the country, and Dr. Doom turned it into a safe haven. He was like, anybody who comes here will be safe from all the other villains who were out there, from all the other bad guys. He made it a refuge. Instead of ruling it, you know, with an iron fist like Kingpin did, like the Incredible Hulk did, like Red Skull did, Dr. Doom turned his area into a refuge. And that's really seemed to be what was going on with Luke Cage. Luke Cage ran the streets with an iron fist, but if you were an innocent, if you were a bystander, if you were doing the right thing, he would make sure that no harm came to you. And so it was really kind of cool with regards to, to his character and what he did. But with regards to Magneto, this is when we basically switch over to Genosha. And again, Genosha was a safe haven that had existed for quite some time. The way this worked was it went all the way back to the 1990s. And Magneto was basically being re reworked as a traditional villain in the 1990s. Because under Chris Claremont, uh, Magneto had kind of been changed up to where he was, he started out as a villain, he became an anti-hero, then he became a good guy where he was leading the X-Men. But Marvel had always kind of felt, especially when it came to the Scott Lodell era after Chris Claremont and Jim Lee, um, Marvel always felt that Magneto should have just been an archetypical villain. He should have been the villain of the X-Men, the one they keep facing off against. And so this led into the events like Fatal Attractions. This led into Onslaught Saga. It led into a lot of these really, really cool stories. But Magneto had basically threatened to wage war against the Earth and the governments of the world gave him Genosha, an island unto himself where mutants could be safe from the persecution of humans. Eventually, this led into Grant Morrison's new X-Men in 2001 with the first story arc ES4 Extinction which saw this weird persona this weird aspect of Xavier's sister or something strange like that basically a chick named Cassandra Nova taking control of Sentinels and wiping out 16 million mutants in Genosha and so after that after the events of ES4 Extinction Genosha was always just a wasteland it was always just this barren place that was once the home of millions of mutants and nobody ever really wanted to go there it was like you know it was this place that Magneto ruled where there was no one to rule but it was the place he always called his home and so again with this House of M. This shows Genosha restored. Not only that, Genosha is much greater than it ever was. It's a huge, illustrious, futuristic city. It's how Magneto always envisioned it. It's how we always imagined it. And so again, this is just kind of us being told everything that's going on. Not only that, the Scarlet Witch has children. Her children have the ability to control reality. And so her kids are wildly powerful in terms of their capabilities. But this is when Ben just starts to introduce a plot device. And it's what he always does. In House of M, it's a girl named Layla Miller. Layla Miller is presented to Wolverine by Luke Cage. And the reason why is because Wolverine says, this isn't how things are supposed to be. This reality has been screwed up. This reality has been distorted. Now, Layla Miller, the reason why we say she's a plot device is because her powers are never explained. Her powers, there's there's no real explanation in terms of what it is that she can do. It's just, she knows how universes work. She's like, I just know how things work. I just know how things are supposed to be. There's no explanation to exactly what her powers are. She's just there and she's just like, I know that things have been screwed up. I know that things have been distorted. That's it. That's And that's that's basically been to saying, here's a character that's going to get us out of House of M. Now, from here, it's a matter of going through and waking up people. And that's what Layla Miller had been doing. Layla Miller had been going from person to person, initially starting out with Luke Cage, going to Cloak, going to, you know, these various individuals and waking them up to the way that things were supposed to be. And the first person they go see is Emma Frost. Of course, again, Wolverine's basically kind of guiding them here because he remembers all these different members of the X-Men and who it is that's the most prominent, who it is that's the most powerful, and who it is that would likely be on their side because the last thing they want to do is wake up somebody like Juggernaut who's going to turn around and just start attacking them all. So that's the, <laughs> that's something they don't want to do here. <laughs> It'd be funny, but it's something that they don't want to do. So waking up Emma Frost, this is when we basically find out that when Scarlet Witch had warped reality, that she had done it using the mind of Charles Xavier. That's why he's not here. Of course, Charles Xavier is also basically dead. Of course, we find that out, you know, and, and we'll find that out in the next video. But it's something that I think is well known with the story being 12 years old or something like that. But the idea is is that she had basically seized the mind of Charles Xavier. She had used his mind to read the minds of everybody in the world. And what she did is she altered the House of M or she altered the universe to give everyone in the world their heart's desires. Now, it wasn't surface thoughts. It wasn't like they were walking down the street and they were just thinking at the time she happened to read their minds, man, I really wish I was the most popular superhero. It wasn't like that. It was her basically reading the, the core of who they are, the most fundamental part of who they are and what they're about, what it is that they want the most in their heart and soul and gave them that. And so even if they didn't know what they really wanted, the Scarlet Witch did, and she used the mind of Xavier, and then she altered reality in order to achieve that. And so this is when uh, Emma Frost basically lashes out. This is her saying, this entire place, the you know the reason why Magneto is running the show here is because Magneto always wanted to run the show, that he always wanted to be the one in charge. He always wanted mutants to be at the top and humanity to be subservient to mutants. In return, Magneto's, you know, I guess monarchy is called the, the House of Magnus. That's why it's called the House of M. It's the House 
house of Magnus. It's the house of Magneto. He's the most powerful being in the world. He's the one that runs the show. And so in response to this, Emma Frost basically says, we have to go find Magneto and we're going to kill him. Because if all this happened, then it had to have been because of Magneto. It had to have been because he basically got his daughter to do it. He told Scarlet Witch, alter reality, change things to this perfect world, and then everybody will be happy. Everything will be okay. Okay, so continuing with House of M, now that I think about it, after recording that last video, because I haven't uploaded, I usually record like four or five videos in a day, but after recording that last video, I was sitting there thinking, I was like, maybe we should like do a really quick explanation of what happened in the House of M universe. So uh, for the Civil War event, there was a House of M tie-in. Actually, there was a, a handful of House of M tie-ins. I want to say it was a story arc, but the idea was that it basically laid out how Magneto rose to power. And all that really happened over the course of those stories was that Magneto was basically attacked, you know, it was uh, it was an attack on mutants uh, in like the late 1970s i want to say close to 1980 and uh that resulted in, in magneto discovering a plot between the government and uh, basically the military in an attempt to get rid of mutants and the result was that the president at the time i think it was richard nixon was basically ousted and then mutant lives were put at the top of the list in terms of priority that is to say mutants could not be harmed now this had the benefit of making sure that xavier's dream of a peaceful coexistence came to fruition but it was only ever temporary what ended up happening here here was that mutants basically began to infiltrate all different forms of government because nobody could attack them, nobody could harm them. Going through and, and killing a mutant was treated harshly than killing a human. And the result was that new laws were passed by mutants for mutants, and then eventually Magneto used the entire uh, conflict as a rallying point, took over Genosha, and then made himself leader. He literally became Charles Xavier, but on a more, on a not really an evil scale, but on a more power-hungry scale. And the result was that Magneto basically rose to prominence as the most powerful being in the world in terms of political power as well as its capabilities because remember magneto controls anything that has to do with metal with the electromagnetic spectrum and so he could kill people by just pulling the metal out of their bodies so on and so forth and he's wildly capable in terms of his abilities but again you know kind of following up to where we left off in the last video uh this is again another instance where bendis just kind of shows that nobody knows what Layla miller's powers are and the reason why we say that is because when it comes to fleshing out people's uh, people's abilities this is one of the foremost traits of emma frost it's not the sole purpose she serves but when it comes to different mutants whose powers are investigated, it's usually Emma Frost who does that. For example, she took control of Iceman's body one day and then came to the realization that if he ever gained full control of his abilities and pushed them to the extreme, he would be an Omega level mutant. The same thing with Jubilee. The Jubilee is basically detonating matter on a subatomic scale. She's just not doing it on a huge degree. But if she ever tapped into the full gambit of her powers, the result was that she'd be able to just basically create nuclear explosions on the world. She could just detonate matter on a scale that would just create the equivalent of atomic blast. She'd be able to wipe out entire cities, it'd be insane how powerful she is. Emma Frost is always kind of the go-to person for figuring out how it is that people's powers work. And even non-mutants, for example, during the, the, the events of New Avengers, which will actually come out after this, Brian Michael Bendis launched the story reintroducing Robert Reynolds as who is the Sentry. And the idea was to basically explore the personas of Robert Reynolds and the Void. And this is when Emma Frost began to dive in and began to realize if the Void ever reached full potential, full power, it would be totally unstoppable. And so again, Emma Frost serves this important role. And so with her showing up here and basically investigating the mind of, uh, of Layla Miller, trying to figure out how her powers work and then saying, well, we don't know. And Layla, Layla Miller just kind of saying, well, I just know stuff. It, again, it's been just basically saying she's supposed to be a throwaway. She's supposed to be a character that's supposed to go away at the end of all this. Now, the cool thing is that she won't. And in fact, Layla Miller will become one of the coolest characters in Marvel Comics for a little while. Like she was really interesting for a time, especially with her whole part of, uh, I want to say X-Factor Investigations. Is that right? X-Factor Investigations with Jamie Madrox. I want to say that's what X-Factor became following the house of m and i want to say he was they operated out of mutant town at least i'm pretty sure that was the case uh but that was all part of decimation which comes directly after this but the idea is that again you know with cyclops coming back again cyclops and emma frost being a couple cyclops is woken up as well and this is when cyclops is just like what you know and he just kind of starts puking his guts up after realizing that he and emma frost were kind of together not only that it was also the notion that everything around him has been screwed up everything around him has been changed now at this point it's just kind of like this mad dash to start waking up people left and right first they go to Peter Parker. And I think Peter Parker is one of the best parts of this because in this world that Spider-Man lived in this House of M universe, Peter Parker was married to Gwen Stacy, Aunt May, and uh, was, was still with Uncle Ben because Uncle Ben was still alive. He literally had everything he wanted. The issue here is that for his character, he basically had to kind of masquerade as a mutant. He had to pretend that he was a mutant because if people found out he was a human, he wouldn't be anywhere near the same kind of freedoms that mutants have. And so instead of simply saying, well, hey, I was bitten by a radioactive spider one day and I gained the powers of Spider-Man, 
and he just said well it was a genetic mutation i have a genetic mutation that gives me the abilities of a spider and so because of this where he's waking up is basically him realizing it's all gone you know the death of gwen stacy at the hands of uh, of green goblin venom being married to uh being married to, to mary jane watson all these aspects are part of his life that everything he's lived is not real and it's a crushing experience for him because he learns this while he's out shopping with gwen stacy uncle ben and aunt may and so he basically has to look around and has to realize that everybody that he knows is gone everybody he knows everybody that he cares about is no longer part of the equation here but continuing this trend of going through and, and waking up various people i mean this extends to kitty pride to dr stephen strange to carol danvers carol danvers is kind of the messed up one because it's like it's like they go to her and they're like hey look remember how, you know how like you're the most popular superhero in the world and she's like yeah it's like well you're actually really irrelevant like you're powerful but like no one really cares about you that much sorry <laughs> it's kind of a messed up it's kind of a messed up situation but again you know daredevil matt murdoch i mean all these people are just being woken up now the cool thing is they actually run up on uh steve rogers and the idea is like well they know who he is because remember in the in marvel comics captain america is a rallying point i mean captain america the what he says is is almost law like when captain america comes along and says hey guys look i think we should take this course of action the discussion's over people are like okay let's do that like that's that's how captain america functions in marvel comics and it's so cool it's, it's one of the coolest things because people trust him that's one of the reasons why hydra captain america is so cool and that's why i am hyped for secret empire because it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be one of the coolest things to see what happens when the superheroes learn the hero they trust the most is a bad guy but in the end they basically say look it'd be cool to have captain america on our side steve rogers is an old man physically he can't fight and so even if they were to wake him up and let him know what was going on i mean one the shock might kill him and two he would be virtually useless to them because there'd be really nothing he could offer which is a total changeover from the things that we're used to seeing i mean it would almost be like steve rogers is the one guy you want in your corner but they don't have him there's there's no need for him because he's not there now from here we also end up picking up with clint barton now again clint barton effectively learns that he was killed by scarlet witch remember during the events of avengers Dis uh, disassembled we talked about this in the last video during the events of avengers disassembled when the scarlet witch basically attacked the avengers and started manifesting all these kree warships out of thin air that clint barton basically sacrificed himself to destroy the kree mothership now why he couldn't just take the quiver off his back so he wouldn't die i have no idea but the fact remains here that he ends up just sacrificing himself because of what it was that the scarlet witch did he learns that here he learns you're supposed to be dead like you're not supposed to be alive you're supposed to be gone and so for him it's a crushing experience because what he does is he temporarily runs out on him now of course he ends up coming back but this also coincides with the arrival of like toad mystique jessica drew rogue all these characters basically being told hey look what you know in this house of him is not how things are supposed to be their memories are basically restored or at least they're woken up to how things are supposed to be now the funny thing about this is that uh is that when mystique finds out that she was sleeping with uh with wolverine that the two of them were together like she freaks out and slaps him <laughs> <laughs> how dare you like she just freaks out and slaps him and it's just a funny reaction because you know it's, it's a very human reaction for her but mystique is very inhuman in the sense that, that i mean she's a mutant but like she's really cold and calculating too and so it's kind of a, a funny situation here but with hawkeye effectively running out the idea is look we don't have time to worry about him because all he really does is shoot arrows anyway who cares we have bigger fish to fry and so what happens is they all basically start making these battle preparations they start making these battle plans of course they take over one of the shield helicarriers and the idea is we have to go take out magneto we have to force him to basically set things back to the way that they're supposed to be. Now, from here, it's kind of like this great big huge gala that's being held this day. It's almost like all roads are leading to this particular moment, and we have the arrival of Doctor Doom. Now, this was a tie-in that came into the House of M by way of the Fantastic Four, and Victor Von Doom, really, you know, like Reed Richards, Susan Storm, all those guys, they were dead. The only one that survived the experience of the whole cosmic radiation thing was, uh, was Ben Grimm. But the idea here is that Victor Von Doom isn't so much like an equal to Magneto. I mean, nobody is but he has been plotting to overthrow him but even then victor von doom knows this is a fool errand just because of the fact that magneto could easily kill him if he chose to but the whole idea was that victor von doom was trying to find a way to subvert magneto's control of the world and what this does is this really begins to sort of go into what jonathan hickman would focus on some four or five years after the story was written with the fantastic four when the council of reeds that is to say this council of all these different reed richards from the multiverse would basically say no matter what universe you're in victor von doom will always try to acquire absolute 
absolute power. That's what he does. That's how he is. No matter what his circumstance is, he will always try to attain absolute power. It's the intrinsic basis behind himself. Now, in terms of the House of M being a dream universe and in terms of Doctor Doom getting everything that he wanted, this is basically him, you know, replacing the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four never existed here. But again, this is just kind of in business's interpretation of what it is that Doctor Doom would want. In truth, I think the best interpretation of what Doctor Doom wants most was during the ultimate Fantastic Four when he switched bodies with Reed Richards, when he became Reed Richards. That was one of the coolest things when it came to that, that line of stories. But that more or less seems to be the goal here within this story, that there are no Fantastic Four, that there's no one there to challenge the rule of Doctor Doom except for Magneto. And even then, he's working against Magneto to take his place. Now, Magneto knows this, and Doctor Doom knows that he knows, but Magneto pretends that Dr. Doom doesn't know, and Dr. Doom pretends to believe that he believes that Magneto doesn't know, but he knows that he knows. Everybody knows. <laughs> Under Siege 2, Dark Territory, I love you. But regards to all the characters that are going on, you know, all the, all the things that are happening here right now, this is, again, really just kind of like a last-ditch effort. I mean, you have really like a combination of heroes and villains working with one another for the purpose of setting thing, setting everything back to rights. So, so what this does is this coincides with a Sentinel basically crash-landing or intending to crash-land in Genosha. Of course, Magneto is able to keep this from happening, but then it's basically this huge onslaught by Spider-Man, She-Hulk, all these different characters all showing up at the same time in order to basically fight off Magneto. Now, the cool thing about this is that while that main conflict is going on, it serves as a distraction. That's really all it is. Pay a lot of attention to everything going on here so that you don't look over there. And the reason why nobody wants anyone to look over there is because Cloak and Dagger, Layla Miller, and Emma Frost are going to try to find Charles Xavier. But the issue is they basically run across his headstone. Now, remember, because of the fact that Cloak can teleport and make himself intangible, he goes underground only to find out that there is no casket. There's no body. There's no nothing. This is more of a memorial than an actual grave for Charles Xavier. And so the question is, where is Charles Xavier? Now, at this point, we transition over to Dr. Stephen Strange, who basically makes his way into the personal quarters of Scarlet Witch. And this is cool because Scarlet Witch knows everything. I mean, it's not like she altered her own memories in the process. She remembers everything that's going on here, right? I mean, she's just like, when Dr. Strange shows up and he says, you have to set everything back, you have to make things normal, where's Charles Xavier? She's like, I don't know where Charles Xavier is. And then this is when she basically starts to go through and give everybody, or at least give us as the reader, an extra explanation of what's going on. And what we learned was that back in the earlier part of the story, when uh, Quicksilver and Magneto had this great big huge argument, it kind of left with Quicksilver and Magneto in the room and then switched over to uh, Xavier's meeting with the Avengers and the X-Men that Magneto basically left. And Quicksilver was talking to Scarlet Witch and said, you know, you could fix this. You could make everything right. You could basically warp all existence. You could change reality and give everyone the world they dream of. You could give everyone the world that they love. Now, this was done by Quicksilver out of love. This was done for the life of his sister to make sure that she stayed alive, but it was also done for the purpose of the family. It was done to basically make sure that no one would have a reason to seek out her death and destruction. And so with this particular revelation coming to Doctor Strange, of course, it gets passed on to Emma Frost, but then they're interrupted by Magneto. Now, this is probably one of the coolest moments in the story. I absolutely love this story. And the reason why is because when Magneto is basically woken up by the way things are supposed to be, he's woken up with the memories he had, plus whatever everybody knows at the time. And so it's kind of like this shared state. That is to say, you know, Emma Frost just kind of gives him the knowledge of what led up to this moment. And this is when Magneto basically learns that Quicksilver screwed everything up. And so this is when we get this really cool moment where Magneto just kind of lashes out and just shouts, what have you done in my name, boy? And I love that so much because this is Magneto at his angriest. And we've never really seen him in this state before. We've seen Magneto irritated. We've seen him miffed. We've never seen him like lashing out angry at the world. I think the closest that we ever really saw to this was when he ripped out the adamantium of Wolverine. But even then, he was more like irritated. He was, it was more like, I'm tired of the X-Men getting in my way. Let this be an example, you know, which of course led into the Onslaught saga when Xavier shut down his mind. But in his wrath, in his anger, Magneto kills Quicksilver. And in response to this, Scarlet Witch loses it. Now, this is why I say this is Scarlet Witch at her most powerful, the most powerful that she's ever been in the history of Marvel Comics, because her emotions come into it. For those of you guys who don't know, when it comes to characters with superpowers in Marvel Comics, their emotions usually govern the state of their powers. That is to say, they usually keep their powers in check with rational thinking. They keep their powers in check by trying to make sure things don't spiral out of control. But when a person's emotions get the best of them, their powers just 
run amok. Those mental safeguards they put in place to keep themselves protected end up losing it. They end up going absolutely insane. The only real exception to this that I could probably think of would be like Franklin Richards. Like Franklin Richards in its most powerful state was during Hickman's Fantastic Four, but that was because he had lived long enough that he was able to channel his powers in whatever way he needed to. Plus, he basically absorbed the powers of his younger self. So it was like two Franklin Richards in one. But that's just an instance of how a person can basically control themselves without allowing their emotional state to cause their powers to run amok. Molecule Man's the same way, but with Scarlet Witch, she was already mentally unstable, right? I mean, she was already basically insane. Now she's insane and she's grieving. And so she literally lashes out at Magneto and takes his mouth away. I mean, alters reality so he doesn't have a mouth anymore. He can't talk. And that's why I say things are kind of crazy because when it comes to people who can warp reality on a, on a cosmic scale, they usually just kind of like modify things or they use their powers to make other people go away. They don't usually use them for like small purposes, like taking someone's mouth away. The only time I've ever actually seen this done or seen something done like this, where reality itself was distorted in such a fashion was during the Crooked World storyline with Mad Jim Jaspers, uh, where you literally had Captain Britain trying to face off against Jim Jaspers and Jim Jaspers kept changing reality around him, where like, you know, Captain Britain would suddenly be like in a schoolboy's clothes. It was weird the way things were unfolding, uh, but it was basically showing that there was nothing he could do to stop Jim Jaspers. It was actually kind of a, a cool moment here, but this is also Scarlet Witch effectively lashing out. Now, something to keep in mind here is it's not just her emotional state. I mean, it is. She's very, very emotional here. I mean, she literally, you know, she really just like resurrects Quicksilver, uh, but it's also all the pain and all the suffering that she's experienced. And the reason why is because you got to keep in mind, she remembers everything from before she altered reality with the House of M. So she remembers being chased after by people in small villages who considered her and Quicksilver to be freaks. She remembers being abandoned by Magneto, but then Magneto coming back and using them for his own ends, for his own evil schemes. She remembers having a relationship with Vision only for it to come crashing down when Vision's basically his personality was removed and he was just reduced back to a sentient robot. She believed that she had kids and she did at one point only to find out that they were basically just the shards of a demon entity named Mephisto who had been conquered or been defeated by Franklin Richards. All she's known is struggle and strife. All she's known is loss. That's it. And all that emotion, all that anger, all that wrath, all that pain and suffering all finally comes to a boil. It all finally comes to a head. And when it does, just like anyone who can't take anymore, she just lets it all out. The problem is that when it comes to someone like the Scarlet Witch and the kind of power she possesses, there's splash over. All right, everybody gets a piece of the pie, whether you want it or not. And so she ends up just saying, no more mutants. And so things just kind of snap back. Reality goes back to normal, but when it does, 98% of the mutant population lose their powers. Now, this is not something known right off the bat. Instead, it's discovered over the course of a few minutes. Instead, well, I guess it is kind of right off the bat if it's a few, a few minutes, but basically we just kind of jump back to New York. We pick up with Layla Miller, and then of course we end up joining an Avengers Tower where Peter Parker is back with Mary Jane Watson, but then we jump to the Xavier Institute. And what we end up having is Emma Frost outside the Xavier Institute with a full recollection of everything that had happened during the events of House of M, with the last utterance being no more mutants. When she gets into the Xavier Institute, all but 27 kids have lost their powers. They're all gone. I mean, vanished. They're humans. They have no abilities whatsoever. Now, there are a few people here that do have powers. For example, Nightcrawler still has his abilities. Wolf Rain, ironically enough, remembers everything, like from his whole life. Every single thing. All the memories that he had that were screwed, you know, that were skewed, that were screwed up, where he couldn't tell what was true and false, all of those have come back to him and he remembers everything. And it's kind of interesting because this is basically a soft reboot for the character of Wolverine. That's basically what had happened to him because one of the intrinsic aspects of his character over the course of his publication history was his memories. I mean, let's say that like tomorrow you wake up in a house of people that you don't recognize. You've never seen any of them before. And you say, what in the hell's going on? What am I doing here? And they say, well, what are you talking about? This is your home. You've always been here. I mean, you, you wouldn't know what to expect. Well, then let's say like as you're trying to figure out what's going on, some, you know, kid comes to you and says, hey, like they're lying to you. You've never been here before. This is not your home. Well, then what's true and what's not? Suddenly your, your entire life's in a tailspin because you don't know if you've really been in that house the whole time. You don't know if they kidnapped you and, and messed with your head. You don't know what's going on. That was always the aspect of Wolverine. And one of the core concepts of his character was trying to flesh out the memories of which ones were real and which ones were false. Now he remembers everything. And so again, this is Marvel kind of going back and clearing out a lot of that history, removing a lot of those things. The downside to this is 
is that this will begin the downward slope of Wolverine. This will begin the downward fall of Wolverine, where his character will become more and more of a plot device of a punchline within the realm of comics, as opposed to becoming someone that you can really kind of, uh, not really identify with, but you can really kind of follow the struggles of as he's trying to regain his life. Now, with regards to the huge impact of the Scarlet Witch, when Emma Frost goes to Cerebro, remember this device that allows her to, or really allowed Xavier and those who use it to see the entirety of the mutant population, they find out there's only a few, like a handful here and there. There's, you know, five or six dots kind of scattered around the world. What this means and what we'll find out is the entirety of the mutant population has been reduced down to 198 people, where previously there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of mutants around the world. Now there's only 198. Now keep in mind, this happens before Civil War. And so this is the reason why during the events of Civil War, the mutants never became involved. There was a time where Tony Stark showed up and said, hey, like, I would really love to have you guys on my side. Emma Frost and Cyclops said, no, we're, we have 198 mutants. We're certainly not going to put those lives in jeopardy for your stupid Civil War against Captain America. So they basically stayed hands off the entire time. Now, the reason why they were able to do that is because as this story goes on, what we end up having and going into the events of Decimation, which we'll talk more about that in another video, but what ends up happening is with the mutant population so low, humanity says, well, we kind of have to step in. We have to do something because of the fact that something happened here, even if it's only for the sake of self-preservation to make sure that we keep all the mutants in one place. They basically turn, you know, the Xavier Institute into a safe haven where the remaining 198 mutants were at least a handful of them, most of them end up residing there. And so they were basically under government protection. The government was basically saying, you guys are not bound by the restrictions of the Superhuman Registration Act. That act doesn't apply to you. You do not have to register your identities, which doesn't matter anyway, because we all pretty much know who you are and we have you in one location. But of course, with Magneto being one of the people who lost his powers as well, the question everyone has, at least those who remember the events of House of M, the question they have is, where is Scarlet Witch? Where is Wanda Maximoff? Magneto has no idea. And so what this does is this begins to sort of bring the story to a close. And we end up joining this, uh, this really cool monologue with Hank Pym. And what Hank's basically saying here is that when it came to mutant powers, they were composed of things. They were composed of matter. They manifested themselves as physical matter and they resided within the body, whether it was, you know, Wolverine's healing factor, whether it was somebody's ability to, to warp reality, whatever it was, those powers manifested physically, which means they couldn't all simply just vanish. They couldn't just disappear into thin air. Those powers had to go somewhere. Either those powers formed another planet, those powers became a star, those powers are just kind of dispersed on the atomic level and just floating out in the atmosphere, floating out in space, but they had to have gone somewhere. And the question is, where did those powers go? Now, eventually, this will all sort of come to a head in Avengers vs. X-Men almost 10 years after this story was written. But following the House of M going into the future of Marvel Comics, it stopped being about the X-Men versus the X-Men, and it started being about character development. It started being about growing or, or kind of reestablishing the X-Men mythos with the numbers being reduced, how the X-Men deal with that, and all these different concepts that delve into that very idea. Okay, so uh, I am moving. <laughs> I am moving to Colorado. And uh, usually whenever I go on like trips or I'm moving or something like that, um, I just kind of throw out some pretty easy to digest stories, nothing too complicated or nothing too wild. We finished Jason Aaron's run on the Incredible Hulk, which I think is a pretty good stopping point. After that, I think it doesn't really get very interesting and we can just kind of dead end into uh, the events of, of all new, all different Marvel. But for this video, I wanted to cover the 198 because this deals with the God Mutant. <laughs> it deals with Mr. M, Absalon Mercator. This guy is nuts. Like it's crazy the kind of things that he can do. Now he had appeared in Marvel comics prior to to the events of House of M, and he took up residence in a place called Mutant Town. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Mutant Town was one of these places uh, in the realm of Marvel Comics that was basically home to mutants for a lot of different people. And so the idea was that it was really like a mutant only area, but it was really kind of like for cast offs or people who really hadn't just found their way, who weren't part of the X Men, they weren't part of a villain team, just kind of like a no man's land for a lot of the mutant population. Some chose to live there, some chose to live regular lives and live other places. But the fact remains that uh, Absalon had kind of found a place for himself there. By just being a handyman. That's really all he did. He just kind of hung out and that was really about it. But he's a guy that has the ability to warp reality. And so it was really kind of crazy in terms of stuff that he can do. Truth be told, what we see here in this story, I think is about as, as extreme as his powers ever got uh, in terms of us seeing what it is that he can do. But it's pretty impressive too, some of the things that he can pull off. But the 198, this story takes place almost immediately after the events of House of M, which is to say after the Scarlet Witch warps reality. And in fact, it actually picks up with Magma. Now Magma is a character who's been around for a long time. She was made 
made by Bob McCloud, I think it was, and Chris Claremont. Uh, but she goes back quite a way. She was part of the New Mutants. She was part of the Hellions. Uh, she had a relationship with Empath for a while, which is actually something that's invoked in the story. But at the time that this aspect is being done, you know, this era in her life, she is a teacher for the uh, Xavier Institute and had actually gone on vacation with her boyfriend, Antonio. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's not a lot of information given about Antonio. Uh, where Magma has the ability to, you know, literally manipulate Magma and so on and so forth, uh, Antonio looks like a guy who can manipulate fire. And the two actually go together pretty well. And so he actually convinces her to leave, like to, to take an extra extra week on her vacation. And they just go to like La Cumbra, I think is what it is, to a volcano, basically, and just kind of poke around and have fun and explore their powers and so on and so forth. The problem with this is that, remember, when the Scarlet Witch warped reality and she basically created House of M and then said no more mutants and set everything back, what it did is it created this wave that spread throughout the world and just started stripping people of their powers. So it's like an ocean of power that was just riding around the planet and people were just losing their abilities when it passed over them. In this instance, the loss of Antonio's powers coincide with the fact that they're inside a volcano. So he's literally melted alive just by the sheer heat and the magma itself. Magma would have been able to stop this, right? Like she would have been able to prevent it, but it happened so quickly and so suddenly that there was no saving this guy. And so in a fit of rage, she loses her mind and lashes out. Now from here, we pick up with a couple of ancillary characters. You know, for example, a group called Purity. Now Purity is not to be confused with William Stryker's Purifiers. They're a whole different organization and they'll be focused on, you know, in the events of Messiah Complex, assuming that we get around to it. But the Purity group is really more of just like street thugs masquerading as, hey, we're making the streets pure of mutants, so on and so forth. But following the events of House of M, with word getting around to a lot of people in the world that, you know, 2.8 some odd million mutants have basically lost their powers, that what this does is it sets in motion the idea of a lot of these anti-mutant groups rising to prominence more so than they were before. Instead of slinking around in the shadows, taking pot shots here and there, they effectively came out of hiding because now they have the courage with there being so few mutants left. And so because of this, it immediately draws the attention of a guy by the name of Toad. Of course, a young woman is attacked, you know, because of the fact that these purity guys are kind of crazy, but Toad, of course, helps her out, but this girl was basically scalped in the process. Now, in terms of Absalon Mercator himself, we actually end up picking up in Bellevue Hospital with the psychiatric wing and the arrival of Absalon Mercator. Now, of course, what he does is he actually meets a girl by the name of Hannah Levi. Now, Hannah Levi was a girl who basically had a tongue, like a prehensile tongue like Toad, but she has no real, like, crazy powers, right? Like, she's not like a telepath or a telekinetic or anything like that, but she's drawn the attention of Mr. M because they were friends of Mutant Town. So again, Mr. M's kind of going after those people that he was friends with, individuals who may have lost their powers or something along those lines. But Hannah Levi is basically a crazy chick. You know, she's more or less insane. And Absalom Mercator actually cures her of her insanity by basically reworking the synapses in her brain. But of course, Absalom's also aware of the fact that mutants everywhere have been depowered. And so Hannah basically, you know, besieges him to actually travel over to the Xavier Institute and see if it's possible to fix the various mutant population to see if he can either restore their powers or at the very least, try to provide some measure of order. Now, the crazy thing about his character is he actually arrives at the Xavier Institute and when he does, he phases through a solid wall and immediately takes out the Sentinels. Now, these are not the Sentinels that you're used to. These Sentinels belong to the Office of National Emergency. Now, the Office of National Emergency was basically organized and structured uh, for two purposes. The first was to deal with the possibility of mutant threats and the second was to protect the mutant population in the event that something like this happens. And so what happened is, you know, following the events of House of M, what we had talked about in Decimation was the idea that the Office of National Emergency was mobilized. The Sentinels, as they exist here, are actually manned, meaning they're not autonomous, they're controlled by individual people, and they basically stand outside and around the Xavier Institute to keep people in and to keep people from getting out. And so because of this, with Absalom just kind of showing up and just walking through walls effectively, uh, some people view him as something akin to a, to a mutant messiah, while others view him as dangerous. Now, of course, the X-Men are the ones that view him as being the most dangerous. In this example, uh, Emma Frost and Cyclops. But of course, they're also in somewhat of a weird situation too, because prior to this, there was a lot of Xavier going on in the sense that prior to Xavier taking off, hanging out with Magneto while the Scarlet Witch was being dealt with before she warped reality, Xavier would basically answer these questions, teach people the things they needed to know. But right now, Cyclops and Emma Frost are flying by the seat of their pants because the first instance in which they basically become headmaster and headmistress of the school officially, meaning that they are basically running everything on their own, absent Charles Xavier in his entirety, which means no one knows where he is. Things go absolutely awry. Everybody's looking at the Xavier Institute as a safe refuge. Things are about as crazy as they can get. And then suddenly they have this guy Epsilon who just shows up and he's doing things like automatically evolving organisms, manipulating reality on a scale that people can't really begin to comprehend. Not only that, this girl Lorelai, who had basically, you know, been scalped by these purity guys, he just immediately regrows her hair. This is the kind of power that we're talking about here. And so leading to the war room, a conversation 
communication between the X-Men, you know, the core members of the group addressing everything that's going on. The first thing that comes up, you know, for discussion is Mr. M himself. Now, of course, going through their analysis, looking at his powers, looking what he's capable of, the first thing they say is this guy is an Omega level mutant. Now, in truth, Mr. M is beyond Omega level. And there's only a handful of mutants who are like that, but he is a beyond Omega level mutant, meaning that there is no limit to the abilities that he has. And he's a universal threat, which means that he could presumably be, you know, kind of evolve into this universal being, a cosmic entity or something along those lines. Now, that's usually the case when it comes to people who can warp reality on such a scale in the same way that he can. So, of course, where the X-Men can't really wage war against a guy like this, because of the fact that he seems to be coming in peace, they just kind of let things go and say, look, you know, we'll keep an eye on him. We'll just kind of keep things in check and, and we'll eventually see what's going on. Now, with regards to the 198 and this sort of turmoil that begins to erupt, this all really starts from the idea that some of them want to leave. And this is when we start running into the issue of no one gets in, no one gets out. So for those people who are in here, some of them look at it as a safety place. You know, look at it saying, look, these various extremist groups cannot get to us. For others, they look at it and say, this is a prison. We're not allowed to leave. Now, of course, what this does is this brings in Valerie Cooper. Now, Valerie Cooper has a long standing history in Marvel Comics. Uh, she was basically, you know, the, the government liaison for X Factor. But by being associated with the X Factor team, which in turn was associated with the X-Men, it made her friends to a wide array of the mutant population when it came to superheroes. And it made her an enemy to a lot of villains. Valerie Cooper is about the closest thing the X-Men have to a friend when it comes to the government sector of the United States. So because of this, Valerie Cooper is the one that basically organized all this stuff. She's head of the Office of National Emergency. Uh, she's the one that's basically safeguarding the mutants. But ultimately, this rebellion or this, this revolution of sorts is leading to some turmoil just because of the fact that there are those who want to leave, but they're not really allowed to leave. Now, of course, Absalom Mercator steps up yet again in the middle of this conflict and basically says, look, you guys don't need to be fighting. He literally brings everything to a halt. Like he just stops the Sentinels and simply just, again, gives us another display of the extreme power that he possesses here. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The stuff he's going to do later on is going to be absolutely nuts. But we also pick up with a guy by the name of John D. Now, John D is kind of a weird situation here. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact that, that John D or Johnny D or whatever you want to call him is basically a new introduction to Marvel Comics. But he's, he's kind of strange. He has this weird appendage in his chest. But what it basically does is it creates voodoo dolls of people. So all he has to do is introduce a strand of DNA and it'll pop out this little voodoo doll that he can basically control to make it do almost anything he wants to. In this first instance, because of the fact that he had spoken with Magma because he had pulled a piece of her hair, it ultimately gives him the ability to make a sort of voodoo doll of her that he can use for, you know, whatever purpose. And her physical body will do whatever it is that he does with that doll. Now, of course, from here, we pick up with this first major revolution among the 198. And the reason why is because of the fact that these mutants who are residing within the Xavier Institute are basically told, look, because of the fact that some of you guys wanted to leave, we can allow you to do that. But the problem is you cannot leave unsupervised. Now, this is the danger of this whole thing. In truth, Valerie Cooper has the best interests of the mutant population at heart. She's literally doing what she believes to be the right thing. And what she says is, we are going to allow you guys to leave uh, under two conditions. The first is that you guys carry an emergency cell phone, you know, so that you guys can basically uh, contact the Office of National Emergency if anything pops off, people try to attack you, whatever the case may be. But we're also going to tag you guys so that we can keep track of your location. Now, the first part isn't a huge thing. Walk around with a cell phone, whatever. Most folks will probably just make long distance calls and probably abuse it. But the problem with being tagged is that now they feel like animals and rightfully so, because that's the whole crazy thing about this. One thing you guys got to keep in mind is that when it comes to a lot of these mutants who are residing within the Xavier Institute, they all come from different walks of life. Some of whom who have extremely exotic appearances took up residence in mutant town where they didn't have to worry about the oppression of people. Others were Morlocks. They resided underground. Not all of them had the benefit of walking around like Emma Frost with no one having any idea that they have telepathy or some power that's simply undetectable by physical appearance. And so for a lot of these folks, all they've known is struggle and strife. All they've known is people giving them a hard time because of their physical appearance or because of the way their powers manifest or because they can't control their abilities or any number of things. And then to be told, hey, look, this is a safe haven that you cannot leave unless you allow yourself to be imprinted with a tag. This inevitably leads to conflict. It inevitably leads to battle between all these different individuals. Now, of course, what also ends up happening here is we end up finding out that, again, Johnny D's been going through and making all these different voodoo dolls of all these different mutants that reside within the Xavier Institute. Now, he doesn't have all 198, but that still makes it pretty dangerous because he could single-handedly instigate a rebellion in and of himself. Now, at this point, we actually pick up with a guy by the name of Mamomax, I think it is, is how you pronounce his name. Uh, but he's a guy who basically has the form of an elephant. But the problem with this is he's one of a handful of individuals who left, who agreed to getting tagged, and then ultimately ended up taking off. The problem with this is that when he's basically insulted by a normal person, a 
and begins to lash out. What we end up finding out is that where Valerie Cooper was told these tags only serve the purpose of monitoring where these mutants go, we actually end up learning that these tags also contain an electric shock that will literally keep them in check, that will keep them from lashing out. And if they do lash out, it'll basically shock them and subdue them. Now, the reason why this is so significant is because of the fact that the fear of these mutants comes true. They're basically being treated like animals. If they act out, they get an electric shock until so they learn what to do and what not to do. They're very much being treated like dogs. The other half of this is that one of these guys basically goes about sort of, you know, doing his own thing, but he's a drug addict. Now, where a voodoo doll had been created by Johnny D, Johnny D begins to experiment, begins to toy around, and in the process, strangles the voodoo doll, which in turn kills this mutant. Now, the problem with Jazz basically dying here is that people don't know exactly why, and mutants, these various mutants who feel threatened, begin to make false corollaries. What they basically say is, well, Mamomax over there said that he was shocked by his tag, and Jazz over here died, so that means that the tags are killing people. That's the conclusion that they come to. Now, Valerie Cooper is basically told, look, here's the whole reason why this is being done. Of course, getting the information from her superior General Laser at the Pentagon, who's really the guy kind of spearheading this whole thing. And what he does is he actually makes a legitimate case. He says, look, the reason why we tag these guys is because when you have that many people from that many walks of life who are all confined in a singular space, it's only a matter of time before something pops off. Whether we're the ones that caused it, or whether they caused it on their own, they were inevitably going to lose their minds. You know, to paraphrase Star Wars, they're animals and we're treating them like animals because in a lot of ways, they're acting out just like children. But the other half of this is that they're terrified. All they know is that some of them died and they don't know why, or at least one of them died and they don't know why. And so when their life is on the line and they feel like prisoners, it's a return to the life that they tried to escape from when they joined the Xavier Institute in the first place. And so ultimately what ends up happening is in the middle of all this fray, Absalon Mercator shows up and starts taking people's tags out of their necks, you know, because the tags are attached to their skulls, they can't pull them off on their own. But he begins popping out, you know, their tags using his ability to transmute matter and basically says, look, by the declaration of Cyclops himself, those who don't don't want to be here are allowed to leave. So if anybody wants to leave with me, we're walking out of here and there's nothing they're going to be able to do to stop me, which there isn't. There's nothing they can do to stop him. And this is when we get another example of his reality warping power. He walks up to the Eastern wall and transmutes matter. So he basically breaks the wall apart and creates a doorway for himself. That's the kind of power we're dealing with here. That's why it's so crazy. And that's why it's so extreme, because what do you do with a guy who can literally do anything when he's leading all these people, when he's doing things like walking on water, that's why things become so dangerous because now Absalon Mercator is not not this mutant that has the ability to warp reality. Now he's a messiah. People look at him and say, oh, he's going to lead us to the promised land. They look at the extreme power he possesses and they start viewing him as a mutant god. And so that's why things get really, really dangerous here because now faith comes into the equation. This inevitably leads to Cyclops and Emma Frost and so on. These guys showing up where Absalom Mercator has taken these mutants, this little island right outside of uh, the Xavier Institute and says, you guys have to come back. Now keep in mind, Cyclops does not want to battle here. One, because they have no hope of winning if they were to actually fight Absalon Mercator under normal circumstances. And two, because of the fact that he's trying to preserve what's left of the mutant population. The mutant population, when it comes to people who gain powers, it's not like normal humans. With mutants, there's no guarantee that if mutants procreate, that another mutant could be born. We've seen a litany of stories where the mutant gene suddenly just ends. It just stops. And that's really the concern that mutants have here is because with there being no guarantee that two mutants procreating will lead to another mutant, their numbers at 198 are small enough as it is. Is. And it's entirely possible that with 98% of mutants losing their powers, that there will be no mutants born. Now, of course, that's really the premise of everything that takes place between this story and Messiah Complex with the birth of Hope Summers. But that's still a very legitimate concern for Cyclops and his crew. And so what ends up happening here is where a conflict initially, you know, begins to erupt. And we end up finding out that Johnny D is basically manipulating the bodies of these various mutants to instigate a conflict. We also end up learning that Johnny D is basically working for the Office of National Emergency, working for General Laser and putting his powers to nefarious uses, literally instigating a conflict that will result in this sort of mass destruction among all these mutants. And so what ends up happening here is Absalon just kind of lets loose. He literally just like encases everybody and says, no one is going to fight. There is not going to be any conflict here. You will not harm my people. Now, again, this is an extreme demonstration of power because with a guy that can warp reality, if he's angry at you, then you're probably done with all your living. And that's exactly what's going on here. I mean, he's not really killing people, but it's the possibility that with a wave of his hand, suddenly 
suddenly everybody except his people are gone. Any number of things could happen. That's the kind of power that you're dealing with. We end up having Johnny D using his powers along, you know, to basically create this conflict between these mutants. But with Absalom Mercator having such extreme abilities, his attention immediately focuses on him. And so where a lot of these mutants are acting against their own characters, where they're doing things they wouldn't normally do, Johnny D basically uses the power of Leech to touch Absalom Mercator and take his power away. Now, this is a pretty significant thing because remember, when it comes to the character of Leech, he was always identified as a mutant that had the ability to touch other people and suppress their mutant powers. But we didn't know how far that went. Really, up until this story, we didn't know if there was like an upper echelon where there's just a level of power that he just cannot deactivate because it's intrinsic to the environment around them. That's really the way a lot of mutant powers work. With the character of Absalon Mercator, if he can warp reality on a universal scale, does that mean that he's part and parcel to the universe itself? And if so, is Leech trying to deactivate his power the exact same thing as trying to destroy eternity? Absalon being able to manipulate reality is just a byproduct of his mutant factor. And if Leech can shut off his power, he can shut off the power of anybody that he comes across. So I would surmise that in truth, Leech is probably the most powerful mutant in the world by virtue of the fact that the best defense or the best offense is a strong defense. If you can shut off the power of anybody that exists, who's going to oppose you? I mean, all it would take is Leech with a handgun walking around the world and the mutant population doesn't exist anymore. The fact remains, shutting off the power of uh, Absalom Mercator also allows uh, Johnny D to basically manipulate the power of magma and destroy Absalom's physical body. So again, it's kind of a MacGuffin, kind of a, a caveat that leads to Absalom Mercator being defeated and it's effectively demoralized the entirety of the rebel population among this mutant group. But ultimately what this means now is they just resign to their fate. They don't know what's going to happen next. And so in this last little moment here, what we end up finding out is that we're a uh, funeral is more or less being held, this kind of visitation for Mr. M, that his coffin's actually empty and that he's kind of evolved into a next, you know, stage of evolution in the sense that he just kind of manifests as butterflies. It's kind of weird. The guy liked butterflies. He comes back as butterflies. I don't really know. But it really just kind of ends on this high note, basically saying that nothing ever really dies. Things just sort of evolve. And it's this, this kind of positive note that is going, it's kind of the calm before the storm in the sense that everything following this gets pretty dark for the X-Men. Things get pretty brutal. Okay, so we are jumping into our X-Men chronology, and I'm not sure what day I'm going to upload this on, but whatever day it ends up being will probably just be our X-Men day. Uh, X-Men, I've been reading forever. I mean, it's, it's the first, you know, one of the, the very first comics that really got me into comic books per se. The first comic I ever owned was Sovereign 7 and something by Batman, although I cannot remember what in the world it was. There's an old Batman comic, and I cannot remember what it was, but the villain was like this guy that wore all black, and he had like sharp claws, it looked like, and like you try to drown Batman in like the suit. I think maybe it was after Nightfall. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, but I don't remember if it was Bruce Wayne Batman or if it was like John Paul Valley Batman. But I cannot remember for the life of me, but it was just a Batman comic. And I know it's a needle in a haystack considering we've got 900 some odd detective comics and God only knows how many hundreds of Batman comics. But I've been trying to figure out what in the world that is. And I've been trying to figure it out forever. So if anybody knows, if just on that little description alone, <laughs> you have an idea of what I'm referencing, post it down in the comments. I will be checking. So hopefully somebody has it. But but um, when it comes to the X-Men, it's interesting because the X-Men have, have existed in Marvel Comics for decades. The problem with this was that with Chris Claremont writing the X-Men for 17 years after he left, after Jim Lee left as artist in the early 90s, the X-Men just sort of began to falter because nobody was really able to bring the kind of character development to the X-Men comics that Chris Claremont was able to do. This was compounded by the mid-1990s comic bust, and we don't need to go into that. Suffice it to say, it was a point whereby Marvel almost went bankrupt. And so by the early 2000s, Marvel was basically reshuffling everything. And the result was that we got something called X-Men Reload. Now, X-Men Reload was this mid-2000s initiative that was really kind of this idea of just reshuffling the whole X-Men mythos and then just kind of boiling it down to its core roots. Because over the course of the 17 years Chris Claremont wrote the X-Men, over the course of the subsequent years that other writers like Scott Lodell and, you know, Grant Morrison and so on and so forth wrote the X-Men, the issue was you would get mutants who would be rolled into a story, they would appear once, and they would never be seen or heard from again. And the problem that Marvel faced was that the number of mutants out there had just grown too high. And so because of that, X-Men Reload was designed to literally reduce the number of mutants down to the most popular characters. That's why we got the event called House of M. It was designed to basically eliminate so many mutants that were there and just boil it down to its core roots. And so following the events of House of M, we got this sort of branding initiative called Decimation. And so with Uncanny X-Men, what this does is this picks up with the fall of the Greys. Now remember, with our X-Men days, we're covering almost 
everything. So you guys will basically find out what all was happening on like the X-Men universe side of things in Marvel Comics. We've done it with almost everybody else to this point. I mean, we're in the process of doing it with Avengers and New Avengers. We've done it with Captain America. We've done it with Iron Man. We've done it with Spider-Man. Because of that, with Death of the Grace, this is designed to actually wrap up in a lot of ways the character of Rachel Summers. Not in the sense that it's going to kill her off, but in the sense that it's basically sort of allowing her to quote unquote start anew. Now, under normal circumstances, I probably wouldn't have covered this, but Rachel Summers is going to have a pretty significant role once we get to the story of X-Men Deadly Genesis, which basically brings back the character of Vulcan, which is the third Summers brother who's an Omega level mutant. But Rachel Summers will be the means by which he basically learns everything that's going on. But with Rachel Summers, she's really, really intriguing. So in Marvel Comics, as most of you guys probably know, they had a story called X-Men Days of Future Past. And X-Men Days of Future Past, at the time that it was written, was basically a worst case scenario, right? It was the answer to the question, what if the X-Men failed? What if Charles Xavier, Moore McTaggart, the mutant geneticist, and what if a political figure, Senator Robert Kelly, were all taken out by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants? What would humanity's response to that be? Well, of course, as we know from the story, humanity responded by restarting the Sentinel program. The Sentinels became autonomous. They conquered the entirety of North America, humans and mutants alike, and set their sights on the world. And so the story was kind of a race against time because it was the idea that the very, you know, various European nations had effectively bonded under one goal of eliminating the Sentinel threat from North America so it wouldn't infect anything else. And so they were basically launching nuclear weapons at the US. The result is that Canada, the United States, all these different territories were at risk of being totally obliterated. And so you basically had the efforts of a handful of mutants who had survived and were living in internment camps that were trying to keep this from happening. Rachel Summers is one of them. Now, the way in which this timeline fits in is a little bit weird, so bear with me here for a second. In Marvel Comics, when you see a story that takes place in the future, for the most part, that's the guaranteed future. Usually the story involves somebody going back and changing things. The Days of Future Past was a story where the Sentinels conquered North America. And so the question had to be asked, if that was a future where Sentinels conquered North America and they were trying to stop that future, then what happens to it when they succeed? To that universe where the Sentinels conquered North America, it becomes an alternate reality, is exactly what it does. And so essentially, with Kitty Pride's mind being sent into the past, warning the X-Men what was going to happen, and ultimately saving the day, it meant the Days of Future Past future became an alternate reality. The future was unwritten. We had no, no indication of what the future was going to be until somebody came along and wrote a story that involved the future. In the Days of Future Past reality, Jean Grey and uh, and Cyclops had a, had a child, and that child's name was Rachel Summers. But Rachel Summers, like her mom, was a telepath and telekinetic, and that was it. That was really all there was to her character initially. But she was the one who sent the mind of Katie Pride into the past and warned the X-Men that Days of Future Past would happen and what would start that whole process. The problem with this was that because it became an alternate reality, the future was basically unchanged in that universe. Days of Future Past progressed just like it did. The long and short of this is that because Rachel Summers basically looked around and realized the future didn't change, the question was, why? Why is her world still the same? And so what ended up happening is Marvel wrote a story called Days of Future Present. And what that was designed to do was roll Rachel Summers into the main Marvel universe. And so what she ended up doing was in truth, basically jumping from her own universe into the main Marvel universe and into the past of the main Marvel universe. And so the result was that we basically got this new character who was the daughter of Jean Grey. Now, all of this came out of the death of Jean, came out of the Phoenix Saga, the Dark Phoenix Saga, so on and so forth. So Jean Grey had been dead for quite some time. You know, she had been gone for a little while. And then of course she ended up coming back as, as we all know. But the idea of bringing Rachel into the fray and, you know, really kind of brought in a new dynamic. And it was really interesting. Following Chris Claremont leaving the title, she just sort of bounced around from one story to the next, and nobody ever really fleshed her out. There were a couple times where she went to go visit the home of Jean Grey, but she never really tried to bond with the family or anything along those lines. And so following the events of House of M, because of the fact that Rachel Summers was basically in the white hot room, which is to say this sort of multiversal space, meaning that when House of M happened and all the mutants lost their powers, she was unaffected. When she showed back up in the main Marvel universe, she realized everything had just sort of gone to pot. And so what what this did is it kind of centered on an existential crisis because, you know, with her being a mutant and so many mutants having lost her powers and her having been, you know, one of the few who retained her own, then it really get kind of, you know, inspired this desire to travel back and visit her family. Now, remember, this is not Rachel's real family. And I say that because of the fact that she's from a different universe. She's the daughter in, of Jean Grey and Scott Summers from an alternate reality. So, but the bonding process happens almost immediately. I mean, basically she kind of shows back up. She starts talking to everybody. And this had been something that had been a long time in coming. I mean, she'd met them like once or twice, but they knew who she was. I mean, in terms of her being the daughter of Jean and Scott, you know, from a different universe and so on and so forth. But it was cool because this bonding basically gives her a home that she never experienced before. Because one of the things about Rachel is that because she was universally displaced, 
place, it meant that she didn't really have a home of her own. But for her, it wasn't that bad because the home she came from was, was awful. But the cool thing is that with her bonding with everybody, learning about her own past, talking to various people, one of the other people that she comes into contact with is basically her grandma. And the irony of all this is that her grandma doesn't like Rachel. She hates Rachel in every sense of the word. But a lot of this really stems back to, you know, this woman and her husband giving up Jean Grey to Charles Xavier. Now remember, at the time when Jean first started to manifest her powers, it was one of those, those things where no parent really knew what to do. Because Jean Grey was one of the first of a handful of mutants that publicly began to display powers. So it's not like her parents had a, a, a template. It's not like they knew where to go. Charles Xavier popping up and basically saying, I run a school for gifted children, for people that have abilities like your daughters. I can help your daughter cope with her powers, so on and so forth. It was a welcoming thing. The problem with this was that Jean Grey's experience, as a lot of us know, as part of the X-Men, was tumultuous. She was the weakest member of the team. She eventually was catapulted to the strongest member of the team. She was a, a harbinger or a possessor of the Phoenix Force. She died. She was resurrected. She died again. She was resurrected and then finally died. I mean, a lot of these things started taking place with her character bouncing around and all these sort of scenarios happening. But at the end of the day, her parents were largely left in the dark. They weren't really told everything that was going on. Instead, they would just see their daughter on TV fighting crime. They would learn that their daughter had died. And so it created a really strange sort of scenario. You know, Rachel Summers being there basically reminds the parents of Jean Grey of all the things they missed out on and the idea that it may very well have been a mistake to allow Jean to go with Charles Xavier. So again, you know, she's very much a reminder of the mistakes they feel they've made. And so ultimately what ends up happening is there's this massive family reunion that takes place. And it's cool because Rachel gets to meet all these members of her extended family that she never knew about before. The problem with this is that almost immediately after this, this family, you know, begins to have their whole get together, people start dying rapidly. And it all happens within the span of 24 seconds. From right now until I say that we've moved on, everything that we talk about happens in the span of 24 seconds seconds. First member of the family dies, John Gray. Following that, we end up having Fred Harriman. He ends up dying too. All these members are killed from being impaled. They're killed from having all these assassins start jumping in out of nowhere, and they all start dying. We have uh, Nightcrawler who immediately teleports in alongside a, a handful of other X-Men, you know, getting people out as best they can. And the reason for this is because of the fact that when Rachel Summers immediately starts realizing that people are dying, she sends out a kind of psychic backlash. Now, this is kind of a, a side effect, you know, so to speak, for lack of a better word, of her being in the situation that she's in. Remember, Rachel Summers, having operated, having lived in Days of Future Past, hardened her in a lot of different ways. She was combat trained, combat focused. And so in this scenario, when you suddenly have all these greys dying, you know, that so far happened in the span of eight seconds, Rachel panics. This massive psychic backlash that goes out hits Emma Frost first. Emma Frost immediately picks up what's happening, alerts the X-Men, Nightcrawler teleports in. All that happens in the span of eight seconds. And so it's crazy because these assassins take no prisoners. They're there for one goal, and that goal is to take out every single member of the Grey family they can find. This is a very powerful and a very capable group. And the reason why is because this group is part of the Shi'ar Empire. They're basically an elite squad of assassins. They were sent here for the purpose of eliminating what was left of the Summer's line. Now remember, Rachel is not a weakling. She's not a person easily taken out. And by all standards of measurement, by this, you know, Shi'ar assassin group, they can't really kill her. She's still in possession of the Phoenix force to a degree. And the result is that she can't be killed through traditional means. Instead, what they do is they effectively brand her. And what this means is they'll be able to find her anywhere in the universe, no matter where she goes. Now, the other half of this is that because this is a Shi'ar elite guard, this allows us to sort of bring in a discussion about the Shi'ar empire. Now, in Marvel Comics, you got a lot of different empires that exist out there. Humanity is just a bunch of folks who live on Earth, and there's some really powerful people, but that's it. We reside on one planet. Most people don't even know about the various alien races that are out there. And so the Shi'ar Empire is a massive empire. It basically spans almost the entirety of its galaxy, consisting of thousands and thousands of worlds. But they are an amalgamation of races. You know, unlike the, the scrolls, which is basically the scroll empire and they're all scrolls. The Shi'ar is a variety of different races who have all sworn fealty to the to the magistrix or the magister, whoever it is that's running the show at the time. But this assassin group going through is, is designed for one purpose, to take out these various people. Now the X-Men are a threat, but at the end of the day, they're not necessarily indefeatable by this group. And in fact, because of the fact that the X-Men have faced off against the Shi'ar Empire at different points over the course of their publication history, what this means is that the Shi'ar does have a pretty solid understanding of how to get into Earth, deal with the various superheroes who are there, how to avoid them, if at all possible, how to get their target and how to leave without being, being seen. The problem is they didn't really bank on Rachel Summers being there. And that was the cog in the wheel, broke the whole scenario wide open. The other half of this is that the grandmother of Rachel Summers, the mother, 
mother of Jean Grey despises her existence. And this is one of the crazy scenarios because her mother is basically grieving within the span of 24 seconds, which, you know, we've basically ended this 24 seconds. Every single member of her family has been totally obliterated. They've been totally wiped out, destroyed in a multitude of different ways. It happened so fast that half the people who were there didn't even know what was happening before they died. The whole idea of Elaine looking around and saying, everything I know and love is gone. And it's because of you. She blames Rachel. The cool thing about this is her blame is not necessarily misplaced. While Jean Grey was the Phoenix Force, and while Jean Grey had died, following the battle between the X-Men and the Shi'ar Imperial Guard during the original, you know, Phoenix and Dark Phoenix sagas, what this meant was that the Shi'ar Empire was largely hands-off. The problem with this was that when Rachel Summers appeared and then basically wielded the Phoenix Force for the first time, what it meant is that the Phoenix can not only be possessed by Jean Grey, it can be possessed by the bloodline of Jean Grey, and that presented a whole new credible threat. Because when the Shi'ar Empire looks at the Phoenix Force and sees it as a harbor of the end of all things, meaning when the Phoenix Force, if it loses its mind, it'll destroy all that is. The Shi'ar Empire is operating in the preservation of the universe. But if Rachel Gray can have the Phoenix Force, Rachel Gray's child can have the Phoenix Force, and her grandchild can have the Phoenix Force, and so on and so forth. And so even if Jean Gray was able to maintain control to a degree, even if Jean Gray was a benign host for the Phoenix Force, even if Rachel hasn't necessarily displayed herself as an overt villain with the Phoenix Force, it does not mean that a grandchild or a great grandchild or some descendant later on down the line would basically use the power of the phoenix to destroy everything in the universe and so this is an act of preservation by the shi'ar empire it's not an act of aggression in the sense of being rooted in malice and so because of this the anger of elaine is not misplaced rachel summers is a good person she is a hero but she's the cause of all this whether it was her intention or not is irrelevant the fact is her actions brought this down on everyone now of course with the rest of the x-men showing up the battle's a foregone conclusion there's no possible way for this Shi'ar assassin group to possibly succeed. It's not going to happen. As a result, the Shi'ar assassins group basically bails out and they essentially just take off. And so what ends up happening here is it's really just sort of this bonding moment between Rachel and Scott Summers. When it came to Rachel and when it came to Cyclops, their bonding was strong insofar as they were more friends as opposed to father and daughter. And it's been that way with the offspring of Cyclops and Jean in a lot of different ways. Cable, who was time displaced and came back to the present day, the relationship between the two was very strenuous at first. It was really one of those things where Cable was more like, look, your emotional attachment is a distraction and I've got a mission to fulfill, so I'll catch you later. While you did know they were father and son, albeit Cable looking vastly older than his biological dad, they weren't didn't really bond as a father and son normally did. It took quite some time in Marvel Comics before that was fleshed out, but it was interesting because with the character of Rachel, she never really bonded on the same level. I mean, she did to a degree, but it was really one of those things where it was hard for her and Jean Grey to bond together. It was hard for her and Cyclops to bond together because Rachel represented a future where they died and everything had failed. She represented the worst case scenario for everything the X-Men did as basically all for nothing. And so it's sort of, it's sort of interesting. The problem with this is the story sort of putters out. It sort of ends in a lackluster way in the sense that Jean Grey basically takes her family into the white hot room, the afterlife, more or less. That's really kind of it. The reason why I say this is kind of lackluster is because, I mean, with, with the white hot room, it's weird. So, okay, here's one thing I want to flesh out in this video. I want to talk about this for a second. I want to talk about the afterlife in Marvel Comics. Marvel has depicted the afterlife in a variety of different ways. Where does an average person go when they die in the Marvel Universe? So originally, you just had Hela in Marvel Comics. And I know this has almost nothing to do with the X-Men, but bear with me for a second. Originally, you just had Hela. And when the old Stanley Jack Kirby stories were detailing, you know, tales of Asgard and, you know, all that Asgardian mythos, basically anybody who died went to the realm of Hela. And that was it. Those individuals who died in battle, they went to Valhalla. When Mistress Death came along, then it was basically an argument of, okay, we have to split the difference and we have to find a way to reconcile the two. So what Marvel said is, you have the realm of Mistress Death and you have the realm of Hela. Hela takes the souls of those individuals individuals who believe in Asgard, but did not die an honorable death. Those individuals who believe in Asgard and did die an honorable death in battle, presumably, they'll go to Valhalla. Everybody else goes to the realm of Mistress Death, and that's it. Well, then you had Chris Claremont come along and he started writing the X-Men. Jean Grey becomes the Phoenix and she learns about the White Hot Room, which is depicted as one of the various iterations of death. And so then that question becomes, how does that reconcile into everything? Now, if I remember correctly, Jean Grey met with a guy when she was in the afterlife. And that guy, I think, was an aspect of Mistress Death. And it was basically 
basically Mr. Smith saying that when people are in the afterlife, how they perceive that afterlife is contextual based on the life they live. So not everybody goes to like, heaven. Not everybody goes to like hell or someplace like that. But then again, you also have all those realms that exist out there. You've got the realm of Mephisto, basically this demon entity who takes the souls of those he tricks. You've got a heaven in Marvel Comics. You've got an actual hell in Marvel Comics. There really hasn't been this sort of consolidation in Marvel about how all those things intertwine and how all those things reconcile with one another. And so the White Hot Room is just kind of this place where the Phoenix goes to do its work. And that's really it. That was the explanation that was given by Grant Morrison. That was the explanation that was was continued by Greg Pak during Phoenix End Song. But the general gist of this, from what I've been able to grasp when it comes to the White Hot Room, is that Jean Grey is basically able to take those individuals and sort of usher them to the afterlife. This is the only instance that I believe I've ever seen Jean Grey lead anybody to the afterlife, but it does bring that into the equation and it does say it's possible. But it is kind of interesting because it does bring a lot of these things into fray. And so ultimately what ends up happening is that with her entire family being totally eradicated by this assassin group from the Shi'ar Empire, what ends up happening here is Rachel Summers basically swears revenge. And so what this is going to do is lead directly into the events of Deadly Genesis. It's going to lead into the events of Rachel Summers coming across Vulcan. Vulcan basically waking up and then her meeting an Omega level mutant so powerful that he can overwhelm and overpower Rachel Summers even with the power of the Phoenix Force. Okay, so picking up with our whole X-Men chronology, at this point, we start to transition away from the traditional X-Men team, and we kind of jump back to uh, really the aftermath of the whole event of Decimation. Remember, this was a huge branding initiative, so I mean, almost all the X-Men related titles tied into it in some form or fashion. But the other thing to keep in mind is that because this was X-Men Reload, and because it was designed to sort of rework the X-Men mythos, that's exactly what happens here. The whole publication with regards to New Mutants, and New X-Men, and the X-Men title, and Kenny X-Men, all that kind of stuff. Because the publications had grown so just out of control for the most part, the idea was to consolidate them all down into a handful of titles and progressively start weeding out other publications and condense them into a more manageable form. And so really, while this is called New X-Men, it's kind of a misnomer. This is really more of like a continuation with regards to like Generation X. So a little bit of history here. In Marvel Comics, you have different versions of the X-Men teams for the most part. Originally, you just had X-Men by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Because it wasn't that popular, Marvel relaunched it under Chris Claremont as Uncanny X-Men, and it stayed as Uncanny X-Men for something like 17 years. This continued on until about 1992, and then what Marvel did is they split the publication in half, and they basically launched the second run, the second volume of the original St uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby run, and that's where you get X-Men Volume 2. But the whole idea is you had X-Men, and then you had Uncanny X-Men, and they were two different publications. And of course, you had the X-Men roster split in half, which was, you know, the gold team and the blue team. By the time we got into the early 2000s, we started getting things like the Extreme X-Men. We got things like New X-Men from Grant Morrison, which was kind of like a reworked X-Men volume two. We got all these different publications that sort of tapped into the whole X-Men roster, the X-Men line, so on and so forth. But Generation X was actually a really, really popular X-Men related team. And it really focused on the nature of a character by the name of Emma Frost. Now, Emma Frost was really, really interesting in Marvel. She was introduced by Chris Claremont all the way back in 1981, I think. And she was actually the leader of a mutant school of her own called the Massachusetts Academy. And the whole idea behind this was that it was one of those really prodigious prep schools that also had ties to the Hellfire Club. Of course, the Hellfire Club, as we've talked about before, being one of those organizations that kind of operates behind the scenes. The whole idea behind this is that as she was part of the Massachusetts Academy, where Charles Xavier had the X-Men at the Xavier Institute, Emma Frost had a group called the Hellions. And the whole idea behind this was that it was a way to sort of provide an antagonistic team to the X-Men, but really more to the New Mutants in the sense that the New Mutants were the younger generation of X-Men and the X-Men comics themselves. And so where the main X-Men team had like the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants as their main villains, the New Mutants had the Hellions to face off against. But the idea with this whole thing was that what we found was that eventually in the 1990s, I think, uh, they introduced a villain called Trevor Fitzroy. But basically Trevor Fitzroy had shown up in the present day and launched an attack using the Sentinels. The problem is that because of the fact that it was kind of a reshuffling of the X-Men in the 1990s as a response to the comic bus, at least I assume it was in the 1990s, what Marvel ended up doing was killing off the Hellions and then bringing Emma Frost into the X-Men proper. And so when she was basically vouched for by Charles Xavier as having basically turned over a new leaf, the result is that she taught a new generation of mutants within the Xavier Institute called Generation X. And they were largely hands-off. I mean, there was really no involvement from Charles Xavier. It was strictly ran by Emma Frost herself. But by the time we got into the early 2000s, Marvel had revamped, you know, some of the X-Men titles to new X-Men. And that was basically this idea of Grant Morrison coming on as writer and revitalizing 
interest in the X-Men. And so that runs all the way up to this volume, which is really kind of like volume two of New X-Men. But while it's titled that, it's really more akin to New Mutants or to Generation X. But what this does is again, because of the fact that this picks up immediately after the events of House of M, we basically end up joining with a guy who wanders into a church that belongs to someone named William Stryker. Now, we have talked about William Stryker so much on this channel. Really, you know, we've talked about him moderately, you know, recently, uh, but I love the character of William Stryker. God, he's one of the best villains in Marvel because he's one of the most dangerous villains who has no powers. Instead, he is extremely good at just swindling people to his cause. And we're going to find out exactly what he, you know, how he does that in this story. He basically travels to this place two years before the events of House of M. And of course, you know, swearing and being angry at God because he believes God forsaken him. Suddenly he's met with a massive bright light and we never find out where it's coming from. Instead, what we do is we pick up to the morning after House of M happens. And it's cool because where a lot of the X-Men stories after House of M, you know, during Decimation follow the main X-Men team, this follows the teenagers. So it's an immediate aftermath with regards to the kids who are being affected and the kids who are losing their powers. So we have all these different former mutants, these different teenagers, Kevin Ford, known as Wither, who basically has a death touch that he can't really control, Dallas Spector, who could kind of put on a shadow form. You got all these different characters who are basically waking up and all their powers are gone. Some people are terrified and some people love it. And that's why I love the X-Men story so much is because when we look at superheroes, we imagine, man, you know, what would it be like if you could fly or how awesome would it be to shapeshift or something along those lines? But for a lot of these kids, even if the powers they have is something that we would want, they don't want it because it makes them a cast off in society because a lot of these kids have powers that don't take on physical forms. You wouldn't know they had any powers if you walked by them down the street, but because of the fact that they know, because they're educated in a special school, different things like that, there's kind of a stigma that's attached to them. But a lot of these folks are celebrating. A lot of these folks are excited about it while some are terrified of it because when they gain mutant powers, they finally understood their place. They finally understood where they resided in the grand scheme of things. But when that's yanked away, they end up right back into the this existential crisis they've been suffering the whole time where they didn't know what their place was anymore. What we also end up doing is picking up with Emma Frost who basically communicates with the three in one. Now, the three in one is actually a really cool concept. The best way to think about these is really just kind of going by their name, the Stepford Cuckoos, but they were basically an attempt by Weapons Plus, the creators of Weapon X, to clone Emma Frost. Now, originally there were four, but the idea is that I think you had uh, Quentin Quire who launched a sort of revolution in the Xavier Institute and then one of them died. But basically they're one of these things where they have a hive mind, but they are individual telepaths. They're not nearly on the same level as Emma Frost, but they are pretty powerful. The problem with this is that the Stepford Cuckoos are sort of experiencing this massive backlash from all these people who are panicking, this huge surge of emotions from all these kids who are freaking out. What we also end up learning is that where Kevin Ford had this death touch and really praised the idea that he'd be able to touch people now, suddenly that's not the case anymore. And so again, it's kind of crazy and it's kind of wild because for some of these kids, for a brief moment, they believe they have a life of normalcy. For others, they want a life of normalcy. In the case of Melody Guthrie, you know, Arrow, she has the ability to fly, leaps out a window, believing that she still has her powers, B saves her on the off chance that she doesn't. Now, one of the saddest things that takes place is with a kid named Hydro. Now, Hydro was interesting because he basically had the ability to control water in a lot of ways. But the problem with this is that he basically drowned. He ends up dying because of the fact that he loses his powers in the process. And so it kind of shows us this impacts people in a multitude of different ways. Now, one of the individuals who does maintain his powers is Josh Foley. He's also known as Elixir. He's basically a character that has bio manipulative healing. What this means is he can heal anybody from virtually anything. But again, it's cool because we're sort of getting this refresher for a lot of these different characters. But one of the things that I hope you guys notice is much like the main X-Men story in the aftermath of House of M, we're rapidly figuring out who the stars of this story is going to be. The ones who maintain their powers and get the most limelight are the ones who are going to be the stars. Everybody else, their background characters, or they get sent away. What this also does is it picks up with Danny Moonstar. Danny Moonstar was one of the original New Mutants when the first story was, when that story was originally launched, she's been part of the X-Men line for years. Now where she did have the ability to sort of create these telepathic illusions, meaning that she could basically create these sort of uh, holographic constructs using her mind based on what other people were feeling at the time, her powers are gone. And Emma Frost's immediate response is, you have to go. And that's what's so ruthless about this. Emma Frost in Marvel Comics in a lot of ways is pretty hardcore. She's pretty cutthroat and it did work for her students 
importance in some ways. But remember, all the Hellions died. So while she is kind of hardcore here, she's not nearly as hardcore as she was when it came to the actual Hellions themselves. But the other half of this is the stance of Emma Frost is that this is a school for mutants. This is not a school for humans. If mutants have lost their powers, they have to go. And that's pretty cold-blooded. And so because of this, we of course pick up with Wolverine with regards to the character of X-23. Now remember, Laura Kinney has been part of the X or been part of the, the Marvel Universe for a little while now by the time this took place. So for the most part, Laura Kinney was always just kind of off by herself. The idea of Wolverine is to say, if you still have your mutant powers intact, then you have to come here. It is interesting because he basically, you know, like any parent says, you need friends. You have to basically form social attachments because remember, she doesn't have friends. And so grabbing those human aspects and saying, you need to be able to socialize with people. You have to be able to like start conversations is basically an attempt to bring her back and to try to, you know, continue this connection that he's been trying to build all this time. And so again, following this, what we end up doing is picking up two weeks after the events of House of M. And we basically join with a kid named Jay who simply shows up with his wings having been amputated. So it's really a crazy scenario. And so what we end up doing here is we jump back to a year before House of M. So remember, we're kind of following William Stryker here, but what he ends up doing is basically grabbing a guy named Jack Abrams. But notice what William Stryker does here. Well, you have uh, Jack Abrams who's gonna catch a cab and then William Stryker pulls him off, sends the cab away. The cab is hit by a bus and basically it would have killed Jack Abrams if he'd gotten into it. But William Stryker doesn't pawn himself off as, oh man, I am a guy who has all these abilities and the answer to life's mysteries. No, 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 it's subtle. It's easily believed. All he simply says, when Jack Abrams says, you know, how did you know that? All he simply says is, do you believe in God? Because God believes in you. That's why I love his character, because it's not some grandiose display of power or anything like that. It's basically him just kind of subtly manipulating people. Now, of course, the aftermath to this is exactly what we would expect it to be with regards to the whole event of House of M, mutants losing their powers. You know, the kids are channel surfing. They're sort of going through all these different things. And the news broadcasts are all the same that, you know, there's this reported massive reduction in the mutant population. But following this, they basically end up on this broadcast with regards to William Stryker, who's directly addressing all these different people. But notice the people in the purple cloaks those are his followers. They are basically the purifiers. And it's kind of crazy because once he actually does this full on interview, we get a little bit of the backstory, you know, with regards to his character, the fact that he first popped up, he was basically a mutant hunter. He was on TV, pulled a gun on Cyclops. He was arrested, ultimately freed. There was a massive battle that took place between him and the X-Men in Madison Square Garden, so on and so forth. All these different things that go on to the history of his character. But notice the things he says. He constantly brings in religious tones that God has a plan, that God has a goal. If this happens, happened is because God wanted it to happen. But what he says here, really one of the final statements he makes is of the most ominous. One of the things he says is that sure, all this happened because God set it in motion. Now it's up to us to take the next step. He's advocating for the elimination of mutants. He's telling everybody mutants have to go away. But from here, we really kind of join back in with the, with the students and dealing with issues and so on and so forth. One thing to bear in mind is that with uh, Emma Frost basically sort of, you know, coming back to the, or I guess going to the Xavier Institute, sort of launching her her own, uh, her own training program, so on and so forth. Inevitably, a group formed that was kind of like a continuation of the Hellions. It was sort of Emma Frost's favorite kids, more or less. Now, of course, with this whole scenario, you kind of have infighting among these kids. You have those who are aspiring to be X-Men versus those who are aspiring to be Hellions. And so it creates a little bit of infighting, but also notice the interpersonal relationships, the arguing, the fighting, the romance. You know, you have like Hellion who's chasing after a girl, but this girl doesn't really like him. You know, Julian's like, look, you're kind of a jerk. I don't want to have anything to do with you. He insults one of the people who have gone back to being a normal human while insulting her at the same time. It's the, the nature of what it means to be a teenager. And so what we end up doing is, of course, joining with uh, Wolverine showing up alongside uh, X-23 and basically saying, this is your new classmate. She can kill every last one of you if she wanted to. So don't give her a reason to. You guys are introduced. Peace. It's classic Wolverine. <laughs> a man of few words. But with regards to the whole idea of Cyclops, Emma Frost, the, the arguments that go on between the two, one thing to bear in mind is that Cyclops is very old school when it comes to the X-Men. Charles Xavier believed in a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants. And as terrible as the circumstance is with regards to so many mutants, losing their powers in the mind of Cyclops, it's an opportunity to extend an olive branch and to show humanity mutants are not a threat. Why? Because some of the kids who are mutants lost their powers, they're human now, but they're still allowed to stay there. In the mind of Cyclops, all Emma Frost is doing is driving a wedge between humanity and mutants even more so than there already is. They both have these diametrically opposing views, but they're both right in a lot of ways. In the mind of Emma Frost, you know, if these kids are here, it's going to make them a target. It's going to draw people here. But if the kids go out into the world, they're also going to be targets 
Pirates as well. That's the argument of Cyclops. But in the minds of both of these characters, they staunchly believe they're right when it comes to their own viewpoints. So of course, at this point, we have the Hellions and we have this, you know, the new mutants more or less kind of coming together into a makeshift danger room that have been, you know, they've prepared for themselves. And it's kind of cool because we get throwbacks to a lot of these old stories. For example, Fall of Mutants and Elixir, Joshua Foley is kind of like, you know, I don't, I have no idea who I am right now. You know, I've got a mullet and I got blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a character called Longshot. One of them becomes Destiny. Another one is Archangel. Another one's Havoc. It's a classic story. There's the whole uh, scenario with the brood. All these different things are going on. You know, these last little tidbits of storytelling that are jumping in with regards to getting some history here. But at this point, we jump back six months ago, continuing to follow William Stryker with regards to a guy who's taking out someone named Bob Forward. Now, Bob Forward isn't really relevant here, but this guy gets a call and basically says, if you don't get your family out of their house by 4.01 a.m., which is roughly 45 Five minutes from now, they're going to die. And so this guy, of course, Matthew Rissman, who's basically an assassin for hire, treats it as an absolute truth and then runs, grabs his family just because of the fact there's a storm, there's a mudslide, gets them out of the house in time, and he's met by William Stryker. This is why I say I love his character. You know, he basically called this guy and said, your family's going to die if you don't get him out of the house soon enough. When he shows up, he's there to greet the guy and to say, look, just because of the fact that you're a man who's done some bad things does not mean that you don't stand the right to be in God's army. God needs soldiers just like anybody else. And sometimes what you need to catch the sinners is a sinner himself. William Stryker is so charismatic. He's so good at drawing people in, praying to their weaknesses and inducting them into his ranks. And so it's really interesting. It's really fascinating to me how his character is written. The other thing I'd like you to take note of here is how Emma Frost views X-23. With Emma Frost herself, her perception of Laura Kinney is that she's a killer and she's nothing but a killer. And in a lot of ways, Emma Frost is right. Laura Kinney was trained to be an assassin for hire. She would be sold out to the highest bidder who in turn would have Laura Kinney take out whoever it is that they wanted to have taken out. The result is that where she's been trying to find her way ever since, Emma Frost does not see her as a potential asset to the team. She sees her as someone who's a legitimate danger. Now remember, this is kind of cool because in a lot of ways, this is designed to mirror the original X-Men stories. When Wolverine first showed up, there was a lot of opposition. When people learned about Wolverine's past with little tidbits that we got as a reader, the kind of things he's done, how ferocious he is, there was a lot of opposition to Wolverine being on the team. This was compounded by the fact that Wolverine was basically sniffing after Cyclops' girl. <laughs> he was gunning for Jean Grey. And it was kind of funny in terms of how all that works because Laura Kinney is much the same way. But where Charles Xavier gave a shot to Wolverine and said, you can be on the team, but mind your P's and Q's, Cyclops is extending that branch to X-23 because Wolverine vouches for it. Now that's designed to show the trust that's formed over the years. Despite the fact that they don't always see eye to eye, despite the fact that there have been times where Wolverine and Cyclops have gone to blows where you're not sure if one of them's gonna survive, at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, they've got the others back 100% of the time every step of the way. And that's the kind of camaraderie that forms in the X-Men team. Emma Frost doesn't see it that way. Emma Frost's argument is this girl is evil. She starts playing mind games with X-23, tricks X-23 into seeing her dead mother, trying to run X-23 out of the school, trying to get Laura Kinney out of there. The response is one way or another, you're going to leave this school. Whether it's because you leave in a body bag or if it's because you leave willingly, you're going to be gone. And so what we end up doing here is we basically pick up a little bit when it comes to William Stryker, again, joining right after the events of House of M. So again, this is the point at which, you know, the, the characters are starting to realize their powers are gone, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Again, this is the multifaceted nature of William Stryker. It's not always calling somebody up and saying, hey man, your family's gonna die. You gotta get in there. You gotta save them. Sometimes it's just preying on the weak and emotional. When people are in a weakened state, when they're in a vulnerable state, they will believe almost anything they wanna believe if it makes them feel better. And where William Stryker shows up to Jay, who's basically questioning his role in life, whether or not he should really be part of the Xavier Institute, so on and so forth, his idea with William Stryker showing up is to basically say, hey, look, man, there was an angel there the day that you lost Julia and these terrible things happened in your life. God has angels to protect people. You have angels' wings. You are a servant of God and you are going to send a message to the X-Men. And so what seems to be happening here is that William Stryker is the person responsible for severing the wings of Jay when he showed back up at the Xavier Institute with his wings amputated. Now that is classic William Stryker. On the surface, he's nice. You could see him being the kind of guy who would show up to his grandkids, give them presents, you know, and they would bounce on his lap and he'd tell them stories, be the nicest guy ever. And then as soon as they go to bed, he's plotting and scheming on how to kill all the mutants. That's classic William Stryker. But of course, Emma Frost basically initiates an exercise to essentially stem out those who can't hack it. Those of you who succeed will become the new mutants. You'll become the new X-Men. Those of you who don't will be dismissed. You'll be on the sidelines and we'll use you if we need you. Now, what she's really doing here is she's using this 
as a scheme, as a smoke screen. She basically tells Hellion, I want X-23 taken out of here. This is all designed for the purpose of trying to find a way to get rid of X-23. But by happenstance, everything seems to benefit X-23. Even when Emma Frost shuts her body down and keeps her from being able to move, where other members of the Hellions try to take her out, where other members of the X-Men try to take her out, at the end of the day, Hellion is the one who basically saves her and tells Emma Frost, I'm not going to take this girl out. We need this girl just like we need everybody else. Now, of course, initially, X-23 is not given a spot, but of course, Cyclops steps up and says, yes, she is. She's going to be given a spot on this team. And so what we do as this starts to wind down is we pick up with William Stryker, who's basically amassed a massive following. There's hundreds of thousands of people here to say nothing of the millions who are watching. Again, feeding on the weak feeding on the desperate. And so the result is that he basically comes out and he says, God's taken the next step. It's up to us to finish it. The mutants are a credible threat. We have to get rid of them because they're not like us. And instead of people shying away, instead of people saying, this is bigotry, this is racism, this is evil, people celebrate, people cheer. But notice this, they're not thinking rationally because what would happen if somebody came along and they said, you know, if Magneto popped up and they said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, because of everything that's going on, mutants are, are in danger now. In order to keep things safe. We're going to kill all the humans. We're going to kill every human we come across because look at their history. The world's better off without humanity. How many of these people would celebrate that? How many of these people would cheer and say, yeah, yeah, humanity's dangerous. We all need to go away. Of course they wouldn't because the standard is okay when the standard doesn't affect them. And so again, it's interesting with regards to how this whole thing unfolds and how these people view the world. And so what we end up having is basically all these kids who have essentially lost their powers and they're basically sent on a bus, you know, and they're, they're sent about their ways. I mean, presumably they're going to go back home home, you know, they go back to their families. But before they get even 20 feet from a house, a missile comes in and blows the whole bus up, killing everybody on board. Okay, so following up to Decimation, what I want to do here is I want to cover Wolverine origins and endings, because I think this is going to give you guys a pretty good idea of the direction that Marvel was going in with regards to the different characters and teams and stuff like that. So this focuses almost entirely on Wolverine. It involves Bucky Barnes, Captain America, so on and so forth. But this is an example of where Marvel was kind of going back to the drawing board with characters, because by this point, we're at the tail end of Wolverine Volume 3. And what this story does is it actually sets the stage for the start of Daniel Way's Wolverine origins, which was really kind of cool. It involved Romulus, it involved the introduction of Dakin and involved all kinds of really cool things. But what this does is it kind of follows up to Wolverine regaining his memories. Because remember, at the end of House of M, Wolverine remembers everything about his past. And so this is a little ambiguous in terms of how it starts, because it initially just kind of starts with a conversation between Wolverine and uh, Emma Frost over the phone. But this was the most logical course of action, because with Wolverine regaining his memories, now we had a lot of questions. And that's one of the things that he says here, is that for him, regaining his memories, he thought would be like an answer to all of his life's problems. But all it's done is open up more questions questions in terms of what's been happening so far. And so what happens is his journey has basically taken him to Tokyo, Japan. And the reason why is because he's basically tracking down the prime minister of Japan. Now, on the surface, he's not intending to find the prime minister. What he's intending to do is find the captain of the prime minister's personal security detail, the Silver Samurai. Now, the Silver Samurai is the son of uh, Shinjin Yoshida, I think it is. That's part of Clan Yoshida. It's one of these uh, many clans that existed in Japan for quite some time that was involved in criminal activities. But the Silver Samurai Samurai served a pretty significant history in the realm of Marvel Comics. Not really popular. The Silver Samurai was like never part of the Avengers or anything like that, but he was part of like the Japanese uh, Japanese team, Big Hero 6, different things like that. And by the way, that was kind of an interesting thing. What Disney did with Big Hero 6 was borrow the name from Marvel Comics just because of the fact that I wouldn't really go see a movie about the big about Big Hero 6 in Marvel Comics, but it was kind of a cool uh, cool situation. But Big Hero 6 was really like a like a Japanese oriented uh, team. It was based with like, uh, like I want to say Sunfire, uh, Silver Samurai, a handful of small time characters, and it was kind of interesting. But the reason why Wolverine is here is to basically question Silver Samurai, just because of how far back his uh, his his knowledge in Japanese history goes, the various ties that he has through uh, his aspects or through being the son of uh, of Clan Yoshida. It, it makes a really interesting situation because Wolverine is basically trying to retrace his steps. Now, what he's doing is basically tracking a guy down, and who that person is, we'll find out. But what we end up doing is we basically switch over to uh, to Dum Dum Dugan along with. Captain America, Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, and uh, Iron Man. The reason why is because they're panicking at the moment. Remember, Wolverine is a one-man army. I mean, if you want to wipe out a government, you send in Wolverine. Like, we saw that with Enemy of the State. 
right? I mean, when, when Wolverine was brainwashed by the Hand and Hydra, he ended up going through and fighting off against a multitude of superheroes. Now, the What If story that I covered, where he kills the entire Marvel Universe, saw the, the fruition of that, where every single time superheroes tried to stop them, he killed them, and it got to the point where he killed them all. Eventually, Kitty Pride had to kill Wolverine by phasing her hand through his head and basically destroying his brain. She lost her hand in the process, but by the time that happened, he killed Captain America, he had killed Iron Man, he killed most everybody at S.H.I.E.L.D. I mean, he killed every single person that tried to track him down. So it was a really cool situation. And that's what Emma Frost says. Emma Frost says, you know, where, where S.H.I.E.L.D., where everybody wants to know what Wolverine was doing, why he went after a head of state, you know, the, the, the or at least it was believed to be the Prime Minister of Japan. The question they have is, why is he doing this? And Emma Frost says, because he's regained all of his memories. And this sends the world into absolute panic, or at least it sends S.H.I.E.L.D. into absolute panic. And the reason why is because now Wolverine remembers all those, uh, all those abuses. Wolverine remembers all the times that he's been tortured. He remembers all the times that he's been used and his memory has been altered so he would forget. I mean, S.H.I.E.L.D. is just kind of in a position now where they're just like, oh my God. <laughs> Because now there's no telling what he'll do. With the memories of Wolverine, while Logan himself is kind of a mishmash, the different people in S.H.I.E.L.D., Dum Dum Dugan, of course, the one-time friend of uh, Nick Fury, or at least fighting alongside Nick Fury, that eventually, you know, took the Infinity Formula to keep him young, as part of S.H.I.E.L.D., they were able to consolidate all these different pieces of Wolverine's life and kind of bring them together to figure out what direction his life had actually taken. But even then, a lot of things were left ambiguous. And so between this fight with Wolverine and with Silver Samurai, what ends up happening is the journey basically takes him, or at least it it leaves him injured to the point that he kind of makes his way aboard a ship, at least aboard a, uh, a ferry of sorts, and then just kind of passes out from the experience. But what it does is it allows Daniel Way to kind of go back a little bit, focus on some of these memories that Wolverine's having about a wife that appears to be pregnant, so on and so forth. But it creates kind of a, a funny situation because there was a person that apparently killed his wife, and we don't know who that person is. The question being, who was it that killed his wife, Itsu, which is the person he's presumably tracking down. Now, of course, once he comes to, what this does is it leads him to Canada's Department K. Now, this is when Daniel Way begins the process of going back and retconning a bunch of things. We talked about this before in our video on the origin of Wolverine's adamantium, where we talked about how, you know, the adamantium bonding process was done, that he had his whole memories based on that. What Daniel Way is going to do is he's basically going to go through here and he's going to begin changing things up. He's going to begin altering the history a little bit. And the way that he does this is by showing that Wolverine's time at the facility was not exactly what he expected it to be, where he believed there was, you know, Carol Hines, Dr. Cornelius, all these different people, where he believed that they may have been there where he was lashing out and he was going through and he was tearing things up what he's coming to realize is that his memories were not exactly like that that his memories were not exactly in the same capacity where he believed that he had escaped the containment unit where he believed that he had gone through killed all these different members as part of a uh, part of canada's department k and the whole weapon x project that instead it wasn't just him that in all reality he had help escaping the weapon x facility somebody engineered his escape somebody went through and they basically let down the security precautions so that wolverine would escape in an animalistic state, kill everybody, and then get away. And that's what Wolverine himself says. He says in his mind, the way that his memories were before they were restored during the events of House of M, that he was able to make his escape from the Weapon X facility because the people who were running it just got careless. That they considered him to be an animal, but he still had thinking ability. He just waited for a moment when they were at their weakest, when they were at their, their most careless, and then engineered his own escape, basically got away. That is not actually what happened. Now, in terms of who it was that engineered his escape, we'll basically get to that here in a second. But what ends up happening is that as he He's making his way through this Weapon X facility, uh, he basically contacts Captain America. And when he gets a hold of Steve Rogers, Steve's is like, hey man, like you gotta come back in. They literally try to corral him back. And Wolverine says, no, I've got stuff to do. But one of the people that I'm looking for is your old friend, Bucky Barnes. And so what this does is this transitions over to Belgrade, Serbia. At least I think it's how you pronounce it, Belgrade. I'm not really sure, but it transitions over to Serbia where Wolverine is trying to track down Bucky Barnes. Now, with regards to Bucky, you gotta keep in mind, uh, this is that whole point where he's still underground. Like he's still operating hidden away from the world. Because remember, following the, the return of Bucky Barnes in Marvel Comics during Ed Brubaker's uh, Captain America Volume 5, that Bucky Barnes had basically had his memories restored by uh, by Steve Rogers, and then Bucky Barnes had just kind of taken off. That was really kind of like the magnum opus of that whole run of Ed Brubaker. The whole idea was bring Bucky Barnes back. He doesn't know who he was. He's still operating as the Winter Soldier. Have Captain America use the Cosmic Cube. Bucky Barnes' memories are restored, and then he just kind of goes back to recollect himself. So it was very similar to what you guys 
saw in Captain America the Winter Soldier when Bucky saves Steve Rogers and then just kind of roams off and tries to go understand or try to piece his life back together. That's really what was happening here. Now, what uh, what Wolverine did when he had left Canada, when he had left Canada's Department uh, Department K, is he had basically put the word out that he's looking for uh, for Bucky Barnes. Now, here's how things work when it comes to Marvel Comics with regards to this whole criminal criminal underworld. There are all kinds of contacts that are all sorts of resources. It's really just like this giant underground. Now, a lot of it has its roots in Madripoor, which is basically this city where all the criminals hang out and even S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't go there. But when someone says, I'm looking for a person, word will get back to them. People will whisper, you know, birds will talk and they'll say, hey, like somebody's looking for you. They're trying to track you down. And so by the time that Wolverine got to Serbia, where he discovered that Bucky Barnes was hanging out, Bucky Barnes was lying in wait. Now, when he gets in, of course, he's basically being shot at by somebody on a roof. And when he gets in, he basically walks into an old news facility, into an old, you know, newspaper facility. And the reason why this is so significant is because this goes to the intelligence of Bucky Barnes. It shows us how smart he is. And that's one of the great things about his character. When Bucky Barnes was part of the old Captain America stories back in the 1940s, and the 1950s, up until the point where Captain America was basically killed off and Bucky Barnes was gone, when he was brought back and Ed Brubaker basically retconned his history and said that Bucky Barnes wasn't just like a 1940s, you know, sidekick, like, yeah, I love you, Captain America, that he was actually, uh, he was trained to be an assassin. That the reason why Bucky Barnes was paired with Captain America is because Bucky was willing to engage in torture. He was willing to engage in murder if it meant that his mission would be achieved. He was willing to do the things that Captain America wouldn't do. And Captain America tolerated that because they were in World War II, because there were some things that were necessary in order to uh, in order to ensure the Axis didn't succeed. And so it was really just kind of like the lesser of two evils. But once Bucky Barnes' time had basically come to an end, once the explosion that led to the presumed uh, death of Captain America when he was frozen in ice, once Bucky Barnes was taken by the Russians and transformed into the Winter Soldier, well, then at that point, he just kind of became an assassin. Like, that's all he did. He just went around killing individuals, carrying out all kinds of different missions. But what that did is it honed his skills as an assassin. It made him more capable. He had a mission and it was complete this mission, do whatever you have to do, and he would have to learn to adapt. With regards to Wolverine, Wolverine's senses are some of the best in Marvel Comics. His sense of smell, his sense of sound, his ability to see, so on and so forth, are some of the best in Marvel Comics. Bucky Barnes leading Wolverine into a printing facility, into a, a newspaper facility, is done for the purpose of Bucky Barnes covering himself in ink. And so basically, Wolverine's senses cannot detect him. He wouldn't be able to smell him. He wouldn't be able to track him down. He would just have to rely on his sense of sight. Now, this is genius because it's almost like that instance from the movie Predator when Arnold Schwarzenegger covered himself in mud so the Predator couldn't see him because the Predator wouldn't be able to see through the mud to detect body heat. That's basically what's happening. Bucky Barnes hides himself from the senses of Wolverine. So it's so cool because it's basically him just drawing on all this experience as an assassin. That's one of the reasons why I love Bucky so much. In the end, Bucky's able to get the upper hand on Wolverine and the woman that's that was on the roof that was shooting kind of shoots Wolverine from behind and effectively kills him. And so the result is that Wolverine's more or less dead or at least it seems like he is. Now, of course, the cool thing about this is that there's an exchange between Bucky and this woman that he hired. And this woman says, you know, I'm I'm staying here until I get paid. Bucky says, go to this location, get an ATM's, uh, ATM card, take money out of this old slush fund from the KGB, and then get out of here. N like, just go into hiding, never allow anyone to see you. Now, when the question is asked why it is Wolverine had come after Bucky Barnes in the first place, Bucky says, he came after me because I killed his wife and his unborn child. Now, this is a huge retcon in the realm of Marvel Comics that, that Bucky Barnes basically killed the wife and, and the unborn child of Wolverine because what this does is it goes to the heart of the fact that Bucky Barnes had so many things that he didn't, or he did so many things that he wasn't aware of because remember, when he was the Winter Soldier, he would go on a mission, his he would be brainwashed, his memories wouldn't really be wiped away so much as they were replaced and then he would go on and complete another mission. He was kept constantly in a docile state and while he is still recovering a lot of his own memories, this particular memory of being involved in the uh, the death of Wolverine's wife is something that's come back to him. And so that's why he realizes that's why Wolverine's there. Now from here, we transition to a place called Jasmine Falls, and we actually jump back to the past to this memory of Wolverine. And what had happened is over the course of his life, following his experience as part of uh, Canada's Department K, following, you know, his whole time being a killer, kind of being this mindless animal, that he had traveled to Jasmine Falls for the purpose of trying to basically find solace. And he 
he comes across a man by the name of Bando Saboro. And this is a guy who is essentially kind of like this uh, instructor or this man who's at peace with himself. But Jasmine Falls is basically where, where assassins go in order to find inner peace. And that's the whole basis behind this. That's what Saboro says, that at this location, this is where men who were previously killers go to cast off who they were before and become better men. And that's why Wolverine is here. Wolverine's in Jasmine Falls to cast aside that dark nature of himself and to be a better man. Now, the cool thing is that Master Saboro goes to him and says, this plot of land will be your home. And when Wolverine goes to lay down to basically sleep, Saboro says, you're not an animal, you're a man. This will be your home when you build it. And that's the cool thing about this is because it's very Doctor Strange-esque in terms of Stephen Strange, uh, more or less tearing down the barriers of his own mind. It is Wolverine tearing down the barriers of who he was to reveal who he can truly become. And it's really cool because with each brick that he builds, with each you know piece of, of wood that he constructs to make his home, he's building himself up to be a better person. Along the way, he falls in love with Itsu and the two of them basically become, become pregnant. They bear a child. Now, the cool thing about this is that this also uh, initiates a ceremony. When Itsu is revealed to be with child, Wolverine basically celebrates with Master Saburo. Master Saburo says, this is a time of celebration. This is you becoming a better man because now you have something to live for. And that was really the significance of Wolverine's wife being pregnant. That's why it was so big for him is because now he had someone to live for. Now he had a reason to be a, uh, be a role model. And that's one of the reasons why this whole Wolverine dichotomy works so well is because for us as people, for you and me, right? Like if we have a goal to aspire towards, if we say, you know, well, I'm having a son, I want to be a better man, then that's what you become. That's one of the reasons why they say motherhood is when girls or when women stop being girls and they become women. They step into motherhood, they begin to realize that they have a responsibility to a life beyond their own. And in turn, they step into that role and become better people. And that's what Wolverine was doing. He was trying to become a better human being. Now, the issue is that in the midst of this celebration, the celebration is designed to serve a couple purposes. The first is to literally just be a celebration. It's to say, yeah, man, like Wolverine's wife is preggers. <laughs> but the other half is to also show what Wolverine's become, to, to show that he's left his animal instincts behind, that he's left his darker nature behind. The problem is that in the midst of this whole dance, his animal instincts take over temporarily, and in doing so, his claws come out, and he accidentally injures one of the guys that he's, uh, that he's kind of dancing alongside or fighting alongside. And the result is that he's basically failed this test of him leaving his darkness behind. Now, what this also does is this co size with an explosion out in the mountains. And this is when Saburo reveals the identity of a guy named Muramasa. And so this ties into that whole origin of the Muramasa blade. Those of you guys who are intrigued by that element of Wolverine's, uh, Wolverine's warrior, you know, how to kill Wolverine, those of you guys who are intrigued by that whole Muramasa blade concept, this is where we basically learned about this, you know, Wolverine origins and endings. And so what Saburo does is he basically gives this rundown on Muramasa, right? You know, where Saburo says that he exists as a man that's designed to basically cleanse men's souls, to help them become better people, to help them remove the stench of, of past deeds and lay the foundation for them to become better than, than what they've been, that Muramasa is the opposite. That Muramasa is basically a bad guy. Muramasa feeds on the darkness of men's souls by putting that darkness into weapons forged by Muramasa, which in turn those men use to carry out evil deeds. And so with Logan kind of taking time to himself and, uh, you know, on the mountainside and sort of realizing that he had basically failed this test in the sense that he had lashed out accidentally during this dance, that he wasn't quite at peace enough with himself to raise his own son, that he had gone back to see each but when he got back there, that she was dead, of course, having been killed by Bucky Barnes. And so what this does is jump back to the modern day. And this is the conversation that he has with Bucky. Bucky basically says, look, my mission at the time was to lure you out. My mission was to kill Itsu and to get you to follow me and then lead you to Madripoor. Now, the reason why this was done leads into the introduction of a character named Romulus. And that goes into the whole, you know, Daniel Way Wolverine origins thing. And that's him basically retconning the entire origin of the Weapon X project. It wasn't John Sublime or anything as, as crazy as that. That instead, it was Romulus running the whole thing. What Bucky Barnes says is, where you were supposed to follow me, instead you didn't. That you traveled up the side of the mountain and you went to go see Muramasa. And that's what happens here, is Wolverine went to go meet Muramasa. And he told Muramasa, I want a weapon. I want a blade that will kill them all. And so Muramasa says, fine, I will help you. I will take a fraction of your soul. I will take out the darkest elements of it and I will put it in this weapon. The issue is he says, it'll take me years to do this. It'll take me years to make it happen. What ends up happening here is Wolverine's basically kicked off the side of the mountain and no one certain terms, and he's more or less just sort of left out there, and Muramasa's argument is if Wolverine is able to survive however long it is that he's out there, if he's able to survive the rest of his life, then in the next few years he will come to me and he will look for this weapon. And so what this does is it kind of wraps back around with uh, with this, this conversation between Wolverine and Bucky Barnes. And so, you know, of course Wolverine says, hey look, you know, you and me aren't done, but the reason why he doesn't kill him is because keep in mind, all these things that Bucky Barnes did prior to, really, his return, you know, when, when Captain America used the cosmic cube on him, all those things were done without Bucky in 
intending to do it. He was basically being used. And Wolverine understands where it is that Bucky's coming from because they're, in terms of how their minds work, their skewed memories, the fact that they don't remember everything about their lives the way they actually were, that they share that concept. They share that, that entire standard. Now, Wolverine will come back for Bucky Barnes eventually. But in the meantime, he basically just sort of dumps a whole bunch of information on Bucky Barnes with regards to the past deeds that he'd done. Now, I don't really know what it is that he said. And as far as I know, Bucky, I don't think had an origin story or had a, had a solo series at the time. So I don't really know what it is that ends up dropping here. But what Wolverine does is he basically throws on, you know, a, a fake identity and he basically takes back off to Jasmine Falls again. And when he gets there, he comes back into contact with Muramasa and Muramasa says, I finished crafting this sword. I finished crafting the Muramasa blade. This blade will give you the tool to kill anyone that you come across. Wield it like an angry god. So again, this sets the stage for Wolverine Origin by Daniel Way. This sets the stage for that great big huge, I don't, I don't remember how long it was, 30, 40, 50 issues long. It sets the stage for that whole great big huge story arc with the introduction of the Muramasa blade itself. So keeping on with our whole X-Men chronology, for the next few videos, we're gonna be covering Wolverine Origins, just because when you go through the chronological order of the X-Men, you pick up with like new X-Men, or I guess new mutants really is kind of what it is. It's really called new X-Men, but it's basically new mutants. You pick up with like uncanny X-Men, Fall of the Greys, and then you go into like three stories of Wolverine Origins. Now, this is kind of weird because I feel like I've done this before. I know we did Origins and Endings, and that picks up immediately after House of M, and it's basically what happens when Wolverine first gains his memories back, which is kind of one of the after effects that happened. Instead of him losing his powers, he regained all his memories. But that goes into like the formation of the Muramasa blade, which of course is one of the only blades that's out there that's capable of shutting off the healing factor of Wolverine if it's plunged into him and left there for any real measure of time. And so because of that, I was going through and I was like, dude, I feel like I've done this before, but I searched all over my channel and I haven't been able to find it. So it may just be one of those things where it's like I read through it a whole bunch of times or something along those lines and it just feels like deja vu. But regardless of the circumstance, Wolverine Origins by Daniel Way is one of these stories that Marvel produced where it got mixed reviews. On one side, you had Wolverine traditionalists, people who didn't want to see things change and who liked the way Wolverine had been progressed over the years in this publication. Wolverine Volume 1, Wolverine Volume 2, his run in Claremont's X-Men, all those different things that had been fleshed out, the Weapon X story, you know, the 12-issue limited series. On the other side, you had people who kind of said, Wolverine's origin is an absolute mess. Like, you have to go through all these comics. You have to read, you know, three, four hundred comics in order to be able to gain his overall origin. And so it's easier if it's all just in a concise location. Overall, the idea is that it does consolidate things. It basically goes through the whole origin of Wolverine, introducing his son, all the things he'd done in his past when he first met Deadpool. All those things go into this great big huge 50 some odd issue thing. I think it was 56 issues, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But it goes into all this stuff. But initially, this basically just kind of picks up with Wolverine kind of going on this mission of sorts. Because remember, with him regaining his memories, what Daniel Way does is he grabs a lot of the things that we know, and then he makes up things that we didn't know about, and then just kind of throws them all into this comic. And so what we actually end up doing here is picking up with a secretary of defense or whatever it is for the president of the United States. There we go. <laughs> and the whole idea behind this is that it basically just sort of coincides with Wolverine breaking into the White House. Now, this is a huge deal. The idea of Wolverine breaking into the White House is huge because it's designed to say two things. The first is that he's brazen, that he's really like a man on a mission. But the other half is to show the ingenuity, the stealth, the guile, and the kind of espionage that Wolverine's involved in. Because remember, for a guy that's lived for a couple hundred years, he's seen and done it all for the most part. I mean, he's fought in various wars. He fought alongside Captain America. He was part of Weapon X. He worked with the CIA as part of Team X. He's very well versed in how to infiltrate uh, places that are not supposed to be accessible. Now, all hands are on deck here. The President's Secret Service response, the military response, and SHIELD response. And so Wolverine has, in the blink of an eye, become the most wanted man in America by finding a way to get into the White House. At the same time, somebody fired a missile that offered some measure of a distraction. Now, it wasn't designed to actually hit the White House. The missile was basically designed to take everyone's attention away from the actions of Wolverine. So that's why it's kind of a big deal because when it comes to S.H.I.E.L.D., their main goal is to basically maintain safety in the United States, but monitor all these different threats, different things like that. And where Wolverine is a blip on a radar where suddenly someone's in the White House that's not supposed to be there and the Secret Service is responding, a missile comes flying in. And that's where everybody begins to panic and everybody begins to scramble. But with Wolverine making his way in there, what he immediately does is seemingly go after this secretary. 
military. Now, a lot of that's because of the fact that what's established here is that she's not supposed to be there, that she's basically working for another agency. Where Wolverine goes after her, he's basically met by the arrival of a Shiva, which was stationed inside the rocket, which crash landed on the grounds of the White House. Now, the Shivas are pretty interesting. They're basically robots, but they were designed for the purpose of tracking down and neutralizing members of the Weapon X program that went rogue. That's one of the reasons why Wolverine's memories were kind of scrambled for a time, is because over the course of the Weapon X project, what you had before Wolverine is you would have people who would be inducted into the project. Individuals would go in, they would receive whatever kind of training, something along those lines, and then at some point, their memories would come back to them. And when they did, they would basically defect from Weapon X. The Shivas would be tasked with finding them and either bringing them back in, if at all possible, or simply neutralizing them, i.e. taking them out. And so because of this, these Shivas are designed to withstand a pretty significant amount of punishment. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the Muramasa Blade, because it's designed to basically nullify healing factors, and it's kind of a combination of some of the hardest metals in existence, combined with a little bit of mysticism and magic and so on and so forth, makes pretty quick work out of this Shiva. The problem is that Wolverine comes to the realization whoever sent this Shiva was also the same person this secretary was working for, and so ultimately, they end up taking her out. Now, in response to this, the federal government taking S.H.I.E.L.D. off the whole thing and saying, look, if you guys couldn't even stop a rocket from crash landing on the White House, then we're going to take things into our own hands. And the result is the federal government initiates the launch of Frank Simpson, also known as Nuke. Now, Nuke has been a long-standing member of the Marvel Comics landscape for, for a really, really long time. I mean, he's been around for, for ages and ages. And the cool thing about this is that he was always one of these guys that was kind of tied into the Weapon X project. And it really kind of goes back to like 1989 with Wolverine Volume 2 in terms of, you know, the, the kind of stories that dealt with a little bit of Wolverine's origin, different things along those lines. But again, this is designed to sort of consolidate all that information and bring it together in an easily accessible way. And so this is going to kind of retell the origin of Frank Simpson to a degree. But the idea here is that Frank Simpson is a guy over the course of his life, he's basically had various aspects of his body replaced with cybernetic implants. And so at this point in time, he's more machine than human, but he still functions according, according to the wishes of what the federal government wants to do. The other half of this is that instead of having him pop pills, which are something that he can either choose to do or choose not to do, what's happened here is they basically replaced the red and the blue pills by putting in a second heart. And so what this does is it allows the government to remotely decide whether he gets amped up or whether he whether he calms down. Now, in terms of his actual origin, this is where things get kind of interesting. We actually sort of jump back to 1968 in the Vietnam War, and this is really just Wolverine operating as part of Weapon X. Remember, because Weapon X in its earliest days was kind of a joint venture between the CIA and uh, Canada's Department K, what this meant is that Wolverine as part of Weapon X would carry out missions for Weapon X. And the result was that during these early days when he was part of the Black Ops team, before he underwent the Weapon X project, that he was basically just kind of carrying out these various missions. One of these missions dealt with the idea of Frank Simpson being brought in and kind of being transformed into a sort of killer, where he was kidnapped uh, during the Vietnam War. And then you had Wolverine, who was part of the CIA and so on and so forth, operating as a Russian advisor for the, for the Viet Cong. What this meant was that he jumped in and started going through and torturing Frank Simpson. But while he was doing that, he was planting a keyword, which comes in the phrase of no VC. And what this means is that no VC was basically a way of saying, I'm not Viet Cong. The idea behind this was that by planting that phrase in there, Frank Simpson, when he hears the phrase no VC, will simply snap. He'll lose his mind and he'll just start killing everything in the vicinity. Again, because of this, what it also does is it picks up with the Silver Samurai conversing with the federal government. Now, Silver Samurai is a guy who's been around for a really, really long time. I want to say he was introduced in Daredevil number 11 back in like 1974, but he is a guy, and I can never pronounce his first name. So it's like, it's like Kinyu Ochi Harada, I think is how you pronounce his first name. I apologize if I've butchered that. I've never been able to pronounce his first name, but Silver Samurai is actually the illegitimate son of a guy named Shinjin Harada. Now, uh, Shinjin Harada is actually the father of a woman named Mariko Yoshida, and Mariko Yoshida was at one point the uh, fiance of Wolverine. So it really all kind of goes back to Wolverine himself. Now, of course, Shinjin ultimately met his demise, which meant that Mariko became the head of Clan Yoshida, and then following her death, Silver Samurai took up leadership of the group. But the idea behind this is that Silver Samurai is very much honor-bound. You know, he's really one of these guys where he sort of maintains this old-school code of honor among his own people, as well as when he makes a vow of, si of silence, meaning that he won't tell anybody anything about what he's heard, he takes it to the grave. So he's like one of the most trustworthy people out there. The kicker to all this is that 
that what he ends up doing is kind of spilling the beans to the federal government, not in terms of what he was asked not to tell, but what he was asked to tell, in the sense that Wolverine basically says, look, tell them about the Muramasa blade and let them know what's going on, because in the end, it doesn't matter. So this is really kind of like Wolverine taunting the feds in a lot of ways. Now, of course, Silver Samurai basically says, hey, look, there's this thing called the Muramasa blade. It's the only thing capable of destroying Wolverine, but he asked me to tell you this, which is why I'm telling you. It's kind of interesting because this doesn't, this doesn't really serve like any major purpose. It's just kind of, again, a little bit of a reminder that Wolverine's life and times span a great deal amount of time in Marvel Comics. And there's all of these different characters that he's impacted over the course of his life. Now, because of the fact that Nuke has been sent in, what this means is that it's Wolverine basically confronting Frank Simpson. Now, again, this really kind of hits home at the nature of the fact that Wolverine's regained all these memories from his own life. And so the reason why this matters is because him confronting Frank Simpson is not necessarily for the purpose of killing him, it's for the purpose of making amends, because Wolverine was the one that transformed him into the person that he is. And the reason how that happened is it all really kind of goes back to the early days of his life. And this shows us how involved Wolverine and the CIA and, you know, Team X and even the early stages of the Weapon X project, it shows us how it all kind of came together. When Frank Simpson was a little kid, the government had basically targeted him for Project Homegrown. Now, in truth, there wasn't really a rhyme or reason for it. It was just, we need someone, and so this kid's gonna be it. What ended up happening is the whole Project Homegrown crew had basically grabbed this woman and threw her into Frank Simpson's family as a maid of sorts. Now, Frank Simpson himself was subject to a very, you know, drunk and abusive mother, and his father was more or less a coward. But the idea behind this was that because he had been targeted, this maid had been brought in for the purpose of surveying the family and deciding whether or not it was a good choice. And because of the fact that Frank Simpson in many ways came from a broken home, basically what it meant is that if his mother had died, if his father had died, then he would just kind of be out there and there would really not be anybody else. And so where this woman, this maid kind of, you know, subliminally implants this idea of you should take out your mom, it's kind of left out there in the background. And then of course, you know, where the father of Frank takes the maid back home, we end up having a Wolverine show up who basically shoots the maid and then gives the gun to the father and saying, hey, look, this is your gun. It came from your house. The whole world is going to believe you killed this maid after trying to take advantage of her. And so the result is that the father of Frank Simpson turns the weapon on himself. Following this, Wolverine goes back to the house of Frank Simpson to find that the subliminal implants of this maid worked when Frank Simpson took out his mom. And so this basically leaves him an orphan in every single sense of the word and all loose ends are tied up. But because of the fact that this combined with Wolverine visiting Frank Simpson later on in his life when he had enlisted in the Vietnam War and then basically planted the subliminal wording into him basically meant that from the time he was a child until the time that he was an adult, Wolverine had quite literally crafted Frank Simpson into the person that he is. These, these memories sort of being restored back to Wolverine basically means he's trying to make amends here. But because of the fact that Frank Simpson spent so much of his life being mentally tormented and tortured by the federal government, being turned into a living weapon of sorts, having various biological parts of his body replaced with cybernetics means that he's almost completely inhuman now. And so as a response to this, because of the fact that this will inevitably result in the destruction of Frank Simpson, at least that seems to be the case. And because the feds, you know, basically invested $130 million in him, what they end up doing is sending Captain America in to neutralize Wolverine, to bring him in and to bring Frank Simpson back so that Frank Simpson can be recovered and he can still continue to be used as a weapon. Now, this is interesting because this basically pits a battle between Captain America and Wolverine. And this is actually a topic of a pretty big battle that still goes on on the internet. One of the big questions people ask is who would win in a fight, Wolverine or Captain America? Because where Wolverine has studied all manner of martial arts, he doesn't quite have the super soldier enhancements that Captain America has, meaning Wolverine's body is not pushed to the peak of physical perfection, and he certainly doesn't have the learning capabilities that Captain America has. At the same time, Wolverine's been around for a few hundred years, and so he does have all this wisdom and all this experience under his belt. And so even if they stand on equal footing, it does come by two different means. The cool thing about this is that what it does is it does actually put them on an equal footing. And that's what's cool about this, is it really just kind of says, hey, this is probably how this would turn out. Captain America and Wolverine fighting, at the end of the day, Captain America's not really better than Wolverine any more than Wolverine's better than Captain America. It's really just kind of the nature of who they are. Wolverine's healing factor combined with his adamantium, combined with all of his experience, puts him on par with Captain America, who's got a healing factor of his own, not quite on the same level as Wolverine, but you know, his enhanced ability and speed and reflexes and so on and so forth. And so the fights pretty drag out. It's pretty knock down, drag out, and pretty brutal in a lot of ways. Now, of course, Frank Simpson, who's basically kind of like half a man at this point, really just kind of throws the Muramasa blade to Captain America, who in turn turns it on Wolverine. So this is kind of interesting because at this point, Wolverine doesn't have a whole lot of an opportunity here. Now, the other half of this is that when it comes to Marvel Comics with regards to Weapons Plus, we've talked about this before, so if you're familiar with this, bear with me for a second. Uh, when it comes to Weapons Plus, that's the umbrella organization. Under Weapons Plus, you have Weapons 1 all the
the way up to 10, also known as Weapon X, and even beyond Weapon 10. You know, you have weapons 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, different things like that. By and large, it was always believed that when it came to the Weapons Plus program, that it was all rooted on the nature of Captain America. Captain America was Weapon 1, and the goal up until they found Wolverine was to duplicate Captain America and create a version of himself. With Wolverine, it was Weapon X, and because of his healing factor combined with the fact that he was the first successful implantation of uh, adamantium to a person's bones grafted to their skeleton, the goal after Wolverine was to not duplicate Captain America, it was to duplicate Wolverine. One of the big controversies in the story is that it really kind of comes back and it says, no, Frank Simpson was designed to duplicate Wolverine, but that assumes that Wolverine came before Frank Simpson, which isn't necessarily true. And so because of this, it is kind of interesting because remember chronologically, Wolverine was weapon 10. Frank Simpson was weapon seven. So again, it is, it is kind of weird. It's a little bit of, of a controversy here. I mean, it, it still works for the purpose that it serves, but it also kind of begs the question, how far along was the planning for the character of Nuke by the time he was brought into Project Homegrown? But again, it's Wolverine basically saying, hey, look, they weren't trying to duplicate you, Captain America. They were trying to duplicate me. But in truth, they were trying to duplicate Captain America. So again, one of those little oversights made by Daniel Way with writing of this story. But the fact remains here, with Wolverine kind of, you know, using the distraction of Frank Simpson to overpower Captain America to take the Muramasa blade, where it seems as though he's initially going to go after him. Instead, we end up with the arrival of Cyclops, Hellion, and Emma Frost. But the whole idea behind this is that Emma Frost had previously tried to enter the mind of Wolverine while he was fighting Captain America. And the reason for that was because by going through and reading the mind of Wolverine, as well as kind of, you know, looking around the world, uh, looking around the world as it exists, Emma Frost started coming to these realizations that there's a whole other side of this equation that Wolverine doesn't know about, specifically the son of Wolverine. Wolverine does not know that he has a son. Now, of course, this also goes in and it grabs things like Silver Fox. Silver Fox was kind of an on, you know, an, an older standard when it came to the Wolverine comics, hadn't really been referenced for quite some time, and she was never really essential. The only real role she served was kind of like the reason why it is that Wolverine and Sabretooth hate each other so much. So if this was a video on the topic of Wolverine and Sabretooth, then certainly it would be vastly important. But because it's not, because it kind of deals with the early days of Wolverine with regards to him learning about his own past and kind of, you know, consolidating all this information to the realization that his son's alive, Silver Fox was really just kind of a person that Wolverine fell in love with for a while. Sabretooth ended up showing up and taking out Silver Fox. Now, the motivation for why Sabretooth did that will become important later on down the line, especially when we get into the introduction of the character Romulus. But for right now, uh, he was just a person that took out Silver Fox and it kind of engendered a hatred between Wolverine and uh, and, and uh, Sabretooth. Now, of course, you know, Wolverine was overpowered in the experience. He was kind of left for dead and that was really about it. But this kind of led him on, the, you know, into this path, led him into the circle of coming across all these various people and sort of set him on the path of becoming part of Team X, the CIA, you know, all those different things like that, you know, kind of bring all that back together again and, and so on and so forth. But again, with this whole scenario, because of the fact that, you know, Wolverine realizes that he does have a son. His son has been brought into the Weapon X project. His son is basically where Wolverine was however many years ago when he was originally brainwashed and part of that whole system. Wolverine comes to the realization that this is eventually going to boil down to him fighting his son. And so if that happens and he has the Muramasa blade, one of them will use it to kill the other. And so as a result, he hands it over to Cyclops. He simply says, I do not want this blade with me because I do not want to be forced to kill my own son, assuming it comes down to that. Now, of course, this also kind of gets hinted at by Emma Frost that Wolverine's son hates him, which of course, you know, we'll see that later on with the character of Dakin and how all that unfolds. But again, you know, the Wolverine origin stories were very much designed to sort of introduce these small little nuances here and there. Everything will build on everything else. And so we'll go back and we'll reference this first story. We'll reference the story after this. You know, as we get further on down the line, we'll end up finding out that the Wolverine origin line of comics is very important, especially once we get to like Dark Wolverine, the rise of Dakin, the events of Dark Reign, the Dark Era of the X-Men, all those different things like that. It's all going to play a pretty significant significant role. Okay, so continuing our X-Men chronology, uh, we sort of pick up again with Wolverine Origins. Now again, for those of you guys who saw my video on the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe Phase 1, one of the reasons why I really emphasize the idea that Wolverine and the Marvel Cinematic Universe would serve the purpose of basically explaining the back end to everything that's going on is because of the fact that Wolverine Origins did exactly that. Wolverine Origins took the character of Logan as we knew him and basically went through the entire publication history of Marvel ever since Logan had been born and covered like all these really cool important points. Now, the other half of this is to remember, because of the fact that Daniel Way's Wolverine Origins was designed to be this huge 50-some-odd issue origin story for Wolverine, basically covering everything about his past, a lot of former elements, a lot of these disconnected themes, concepts that were sort of out there, but we didn't really know where they stood with regards to the larger picture, and even some of these concepts that contradicted other pieces of information, they were all sort of brought together and consolidated into one great big huge origin. And that's one of the reasons why, whenever people say, like, what's the origin of Wolverine, my advice 
advice is go read Daniel Wade's Wolverine Origins because while it does change some things and while there are Wolverine fans who don't like some of the things that were changed, the fact remains that as it stands right now, even in Marvel Legacy, the definitive origin story of Wolverine is basically found in this story. Now remember, one of the things that we found with regards to the, the post House of M event was that all of Wolverine's memories were basically restored. And what this did is it allowed Daniel Way to set the stage to essentially say there was some hidden hand behind the scenes. Someone somewhere was pulling all these strings when it came to all these events that took place in Wolverine's life. Now, historically speaking in Marvel Comics, it was largely just Weapon X. There was no singular person really operating behind the scenes. It was simply just that Wolverine found himself working for Team X in the CIA. He would do these Black Ops missions. He was grabbed by Weapon X. He was thrown into the program. He had adamantium bonded to his skeleton. He escaped and the rest is history. What this is designed to do is to say there's actually someone out there who was controlling all these things. Now, with regards to the formation of Weapon X, with regards to like Grant Morrison's new X-Men, we found out it was John Sublime, this bacterial entity that was taking possession of different humans and realized that mutants could basically withstand his mental control more or less. And he wanted to create super soldiers to kill mutants, hence the reason why Weapons Plus was created and the weapon projects started with Weapon 1, i.e. Captain America. And so the cool thing about this is that again, a lot of that stuff gets wiped away. With regards to all the original history of, of the Weapon X project, John Sublime and all those things that went into it, all that stuff gets replaced. And so the best way to really think about Wolverine's history is that if you don't see it in this origin, there's a really good chance it doesn't exist. But of course, with this whole idea that he came to the realization that someone was pulling the strings, it basically set in motion this mission whereby he was trying to figure out who that person was. But jumping back to the past, jumping to around 1963, what this does is this really kind of fills in the idea that as part of Team X to a degree, Wolverine would go on these missions. He would basically be sent on these tasks and when that wasn't ha well, wasn't happening, he was more or less kind of being held prisoner. But he was effectively fed a red pill and when he ingested it, it turns out it's carbonadium. Now, with Marvel Comics, we've talked about this before, but for all the new folks who are getting into this just because it's called Wolverine Origins, with regards to carbonadium, this was an attempt by the Russians to duplicate adamantium. And what it actually did is it created a kind of, you know, radiation aspect to it. It's kind of like a death touch, more or less. And we'll actually find out the extent of that with regards to, to really Omega Red in this particular story because this will see his return for the most part. But the idea behind this was that carbonadium was a lot more malleable, it was a lot more durable than traditional metals, but it was nowhere near adamantium in terms of indestructibility. This carbonadium basically slows down Wolverine's healing factor. Now in truth, in a lot of ways, Daniel uh, Daniel Way is borrowing this from just the publication history of Wolverine, but that's what carbonadium does. It basically slows down the healing factor of Wolverine, it doesn't actually end it. And so what this does is it really kind of jumps back to the modern day, which is to say an instance where Wolverine just kind of sneaks aboard a freighter and then just basically starts making his way, taking a few people out here and there, and then that's really about it. At this point, we transition to Eastern Washington State, where he finally manages to reach the Puget Sound. And the cool thing about this, and it's one of the funny exchanges, remember, when it comes to Wolverine, it's usually his way or the highway. And where he comes across the trucker and says, I need to make my way to Queens, I need to get back to New York, this trucker is initially just kind of like, look man, I can't take you that far, that's kind of ridiculous, but if I do, what are you going to give me? And the funny exchange here is, it's not necessarily what Wolverine's going to give him, it's what Wolverine's going to allow him to keep. <laughs> Presumably, he's going to remove the most important thing that any man has in his possession. So following this, of course, it really just kind of allows him to sort of go forward and basically discover a kind of safe house. And the reason for this is because Wolverine is looking for a particular person. He's looking for one guy. And this guy's name is Christopher Nord. Now again, because of the fact that this is part of a cohesive line of comics that follow the events of House of M, really running up until like Endangered Species, is all just kind of un the, um, under the umbrella name of Decimation, is really what this is. But the whole idea behind this is, remember, a lot of mutants lost their powers. In fact, all but 198 mutants lost their, uh, lost their powers, give or take a few who were in there uh, who were, you know, basically undocumented. Jubilee is one of those. But this safe house is basically a place whereby mutants who formerly had powers can basically stay underground in order to avoid a lot of the anti-mutant groups who are out there because remember after the mutant population decreased and it hit the news and all these different anti-mutant groups friends of humanity and the purifiers and things like that once they began to learn that the mutant population had been decimated they saw it as their chance to wipe out what's left of the mutants or to wipe out those people who were well known to have been mutants and lost their powers the other half of this equation is that along his journey wolverine kept picking up this scent now this is where daniel way gets a little off and that's one of the reasons why there's a little bit of inconsistency here historically speaking when it comes to wolverine one of the most uh, most well 
well-known aspects of his character is his ability to pick up smells. When Wolverine picks up a scent, he never forgets it and he never loses it. And so because of the fact that he's getting whiffs of this scent here and there, the idea is that he believes it to be familiar, but he can't quite put his finger on it. If we looked at the publication history of Marvel, he should have immediately known who it was. And the reason why is because the scent of the person he picked up is Omega Red. Now, Omega Red is a character who actually appeared in X-Men Volume 2, issue number four, but he is a guy called Arkady Rosevich. Oh my God, I pronounced it right. But the funny thing about Omega Red is he was kind of a new influx of villains. Remember, back in the 1990s, really the early 1990s in Marvel Comics, stories were moving from being more character focused to taking character development and intertwining it in with super high octane and violent stories. But the whole idea of, of Omega Red is he is basically the attempt by the Russians to create their own super soldier. Now, he wasn't really designed to, to mimic Wolverine. He was actually designed to mimic Captain America to a degree. Now, the issue with this was that he was largely unpredictable. There was no real way to know what it, what it was he was going to do. Was he going to follow orders or was he going to just kind of go rogue, go off and do his own thing? So eventually he was kind of shunted away. But one of the major aspects of Omega Red's character is that he has what are called carbonadium tentacles. And what these do is they basically draw life energy out of individuals, but he can also use them just to like slash, impale people, different things like that. Usually they're used to ensnare and then drag the life force out of a person, but he's always been one of Wolverine's most notable enemies with regards to Marvel Comics. Now, the idea of him kind of being a uh, a spinoff of Captain America, that wasn't actually introduced until Ed Brubaker's run with Captain America Volume 5. For the most part, in the original introduction of his story, back in the first, uh, the first you know, maybe six or seven issues of X-Men Volume 2, he was basically just an attempt by Russians to create their own super soldier and faced off against Wolverine. Now, it worked. I mean, Omega Red was wildly popular when he first showed up, but the idea behind this is he's always in pursuit of something called the Carbonadium Synthesizer. Now, what this story is going to do is it's going to grab a lot of those themes and it's going to sort of rework them. So we'll cover the kind of back end of that in terms of how it used to be versus how it is now as we progress through this. But what we end up doing is we actually end up leaving the modern day and we jump back to about 40 years prior to this. And this is after Wolverine consumes that red pill. Now, of course, after taking the red pill, after being knocked out, essentially what happens is these doctors on staff begin going through and dissecting him. Of course, they remove the carbonadium pill out of his system, which means he immediately begins to jump back too. Because of the fact that carbonadium suppresses it, if carbonadium is removed, his healing factor will kick back in again. So the idea here is they basically show us that when Wolverine goes on a mission, they feed him a carbonadium pill. The carbonadium pill knocks him out. It basically suppresses his healing factor. He ends up collapsing. They throw him into a machine. They wipe his memories. And then when he comes to, they basically say, oh man, here's everything that went on and here's everything that happened. That's how they kept him under control. Now, because of the fact that, you know, they had really kind of undershot exactly how this would happen, what ends up taking place is Wolverine's healing factor kicks in faster than it's supposed to. And the result is that he actually attacks the doctor. Now, one of the other big changes that's made here is the time that Wolverine's claws pop. Now, on the surface, people will try to find a way to reconcile the Wolverine Origins one-shot when his claws popped as a kid to Wolverine as he exists right now. Now, one of the things he says here is, look, I remember everything, I remember it all. And so it's almost like he basically makes this connection of, yes, my claws popped when I was a kid and my memories have been altered and I basically forgot about it all. But he'll actually make a comment later on where he talks about his newly discovered claws. And so that's where it sort of brings in this idea that this is when his claws pop for the very first time. But one thing to bear in mind is that when it came to the Wolverine origin story by Daniel Way versus the Wolverine Origins one shot, the Wolverine Origins one shot was rushed by Marvel Comics. It was basically just thrown out there. And the reason why was because word had reached the ears of Marvel that Fox was going to launch an, an X-Men film. And it was entirely possible that they were going to tell the origin story of Wolverine. So in order to beat Fox to this, Marvel rushed out the origin of Wolverine in a six issue limited series. And basically it, it introduced the idea that Wolverine's claws had popped for the first time when he was a little kid. And so the result was that it kind of went forward as just part of this origin story because Wolverine's origin was always enigmatic. It was always kind of cloak and dagger, which is one of the things that made him so curious. How did we get to the point from Wolverine presumably being born up to the modern day when he joined the X-Men and he was part of Team X and all that kind of good stuff? Now, of course, again, this is kind of designed to go back and retell all that, to sort of alter all those things. So again, there's really not a lot of information offered here, at least in this part of the story with regards to his claws popping for the first time outside of this. So a lot of people really choose to ignore that and stick with the original six issue limited series from 2001 to 2002. Now, following this, Wolverine basically goes forward and says, look, what I'm searching for is a carbonadium synthesizer. He's basically hot on the trail for it. He believes that Maverick, or I guess Christopher Nord, is the one that has access to it. So jumping back to the modern day, Jubilee's among here because she's one of the people that basically lost her powers. But with Omega Red hunting for the carbonadium synthesizer, the last one to be in possession of it, according to Omega Red, was Maverick, was Christopher Nord. Now, Christopher Nord exists in a couple different forms. There's basically the pre-legacy virus Christopher Nord, and there's the post-legacy virus Christopher Nord. Of course, legacy virus basically being this sort of uh, 
a disease that was introduced to Marvel Comics with regards to mutants that presumably could wipe them away in their entirety. And it was Marvel kind of toying with the idea of, you know, will mutants go extinct, you know, and that kind of a thing. But Christopher Nora basically had the ability to absorb kinetic energy and then rechannel it. Now, after the legacy virus, that was amplified several times over. So in a lot of ways, he had the same powers as Bishop. Christopher Nord was also on Team X alongside Wolverine. Christopher Nord was accepted into the Weapon X program, so he's played a pretty significant role with regards to the life that Wolverine's had. And this goes directly into the origin. The funny thing about this is that with Omega Red under any normal circumstance, when Omega Red subdued Wolverine, he would have killed him on the spot. The issue with this is that Omega Red basically allows Wolverine to be knocked out and then leaves. And so what this means is that Omega Red was never there for Wolverine in the first place. Omega Red was there for either Jubilee or Maverick or somebody else, but presumably someone who has the Carbonadium Synthesizer. Now, the basis behind the Carbonadium Synthesizer is something that'll actually be covered later on, so we can go ahead and, and sort of jump into this. The Carbonadium Synthesizer basically means that it can uh, effectively liquefy or create Carbonadium. And so the result is that if it's sold to someone, they can in turn use it to create something akin to Adamantium. Remember, Adamantium is very, very difficult to make, but what this will do and what it'll basically lead to is the idea of Omega Red trying to find the Carbonadium Synthesizer and then selling it off for a cure to his Carbonadium. And the reason why is because the tentacles in his arms are effectively poisoning him. And so if he can find a, find a cure that'll basically nullify the radiation put off by the carbonadium that's imbued in his body, then it means he'll continue to survive. Up until this point, the only way for, what, for uh, Omega Red to live is to basically draw the life force out of other people to sustain his own life energy. So again, that's why he functions the way that he does, and that's why he does the kind of things that he does. But again, the idea behind this is that once Wolverine gets inside, Christopher Nord seemingly appears to be on his deathbed in the sense that he basically says, hey, look, what you're looking for is in like Russia or something like that. Omega Red grabs Jubilee, takes off leaves a message behind, says, if you come for me, I'm going to kill Jubilee. And so it's basically a way to keep Wolverine at bay. Now remember, because of the fact that Omega Red had been an on-again, off-again villain of Wolverine's for so incredibly long, he knows a lot about Logan. He knows about his interpersonal relationships. He knows how to keep him at bay. That's why Jubilee is so important here, because Jubilee is like a daughter for Logan. And so if Logan knows that going headstrong into Omega Red means that he will kill Jubilee, which he will, then it basically means Logan can stay hands off for the most part. And so following this, he travels directly to Berlin. And when he gets there, he basically just sorts a thousand code to a person in particular, different things like that. And it basically draws in this idea that he's well versed in, you know, accessing all these different themes for different groups that operate underground and so on and so forth. Now, what this does is this transitions back to the past with regards to one of the first major missions, really one of the final missions of Team X with regards to the Carbonadium Synthesizer. And the only thing that we're really given here is their first encounter with Omega Red in the sense that Wolverine and Sabretooth and, uh, and Maverick have been sent on a mission to basically retrieve the Carbonadium Synthesizer. Now, again, the the reason they were sent on this mission is because it was ordered by the hidden hand pulling things behind the scenes. So again, once they go on this mission, while well, Sabretooth was very much kind of a rogue guy, which is to say he would sell out his own teammates if it meant saving the mission. Ultimately, it ends up with uh, Wolverine kind of saying, look, whoever it is that's pulling the strings here isn't giving us all the answers. They're not telling us the truth. And so Wolverine had intended to actually go off reservation to take the Carbonadium Synthesizer and to leave with it. The result is that where he initially gets the assistance of Maverick, Sabretooth actually kills the doctor that's being escorted out by Wolverine and company to basically remind him, look, your job is to stay on this mission. And if you don't, then I'll take out the people who are closest to you if it means keeping you in control. So it was a way to basically keep things contained. Now, back in the modern day, once we pick back up with Berlin, what we end up finding out here is that the whole reason why Wolverine's here is to get back in contact with Natasha Romanoff with Black Widow. Now, a little bit of history here where this part of the story will go through and it'll basically change up a lot of the history when it comes to Natasha Romanoff. One of the things that I want you guys to, to, to know about is how the history of Black Black Widow fits into the larger Marvel picture. In a lot of ways, the history of Black Widow with regards to the average comic book reader and Marvel Comics is still pretty ambiguous. They know she hails from the Red Room, but in terms of how the Red Room Academy fits into everything else, a lot of folks find that kind of cloak and dagger. But in Russia, again, because of the fact that a lot of their attempts were to basically create a kind of super soldier program of their own, all that fell under the umbrella of Department X. That was really their whole thing over there. But Department X was not just about traditional super soldiers and Avengers teams. You also had things like Project The Winter Soldier, when they grabbed Bucky Barnes and they turned him into the Winter Soldier. Omega Red, an attempt to create a Super Soldier. The other half of this was that not every conflict needs to have somebody who's super capable and able to do all these different things. The CIA had Team X, and so they basically had their own covert super black ops team. The Russians wanted the exact same thing. They had the KGB, they had their spy organization, but what they needed was an extremely secret organization that could operate behind the scenes and be virtually undetectable, just like Team X. Russia's answer to that was the Red Room Academy. And what they would do is they would go out and they would grab these young girls. They would basically be orphans. They would throw them into the Red Room Academy and they would train them to be the absolute best 
assassins where they could essentially infiltrate almost any situation. Now, this goes into the early days of Natasha Romanoff and it actually feeds into Natasha Romanoff and her ability to escape the Red Room Academy. The way this plays out is that Wolverine initially stumbles across a guy named Terrace Romanoff and he's effectively this guy that basically wrote the book on espionage and spy work. He's like the spy spy. And so because of that, Wolverine's kind of brought in by Terrace for the purpose of essentially teaching him everything he knows. Now, it's really kind of happenstance that leads into it, but it is kind of cool because while Wolverine is being trained by Terrace, he's also training Natasha Romanoff. The way this plays out is initially she just kind of seems to be the daughter of Terrace Romanoff, and that's it. She's just some young girl. So with regards to Wolverine, from his perspective, he's teaching the daughter of Terrace how to fight and how to hold her own. The problem with this is that one night, she suddenly vanishes, and of course, Terrace comes running in with a sword and a handgun, pointing it at Wolverine, thinking he's the reason why it's been done. We end up having all these different members of the uh, of the guards who have all been killed, have their throats slit. They've all been basically assassinated. Now, of course, Wolverine's response is, this is a trap. Stay here. I'll go out and find your daughter because they're looking for you. You're the most wanted man in the world right now. When he gets out there, Natasha Romanoff makes her appearance known. And that's when all this information begins to come out. That Natasha Romanoff, as a young girl, was thrown into the Red Room Academy. She was trained to become an assassin. And she's been operating on her mission this entire time. Now, her mission was to assassinate Terrace. The problem with this was that Wolverine had the exact same mission. He was there for the exact same purpose, and he's the one that killed Terrace. His mission was to get there, figure out what Terrace knows, and if he knows too much, take him out. And because of the fact that Terrace did know too much, he eliminated him. In turn, Wolverine basically tells Natasha Romanoff, as far as everybody here is concerned, you're dead. The world believes you're dead. And what this means is it allows Natasha to leave the Red Room Academy. The Red Room Academy will believe she died in her mission, and so she can escape her captivity and go out and try to find some semblance of a normal life. Now, of course, she makes a promise, I'll pay you back, you know, for this, you know, I, I owe you a huge favor. And essentially, she doesn't really keep it up here. Where we would expect the favor to be returned, what she ends up doing is she basically says, look, I know that you're hunting for Omega Red. I know that you're looking for this carbonadium synthesizer. The one that I have here is a fake. The safe one is locked up somewhere and it'll be kept there. No one knows that it's actually there. But what I've done is I've basically contacted S.H.I.E.L.D. and I've told them they're with Omega Red. The problem with this was that at the time that Black Widow did that, she didn't know that Jubilee was being held by Omega Red. And so Wolverine's initial response is one of panic because what this means is that in turn, S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to show up at the location of Omega Red and Omega Red is going to keep his promise and say, if anybody comes here, I'm going to kill Jubilee. Effectively meaning that Natasha Romanoff is about to get Jubilee killed. And that's when Wolverine immediately shows up to the scene. He basically travels over there. But of course, Wolverine showing up with a fake carbonadium synthesizer offers a distraction of sorts for Omega Red because that's what he wants. That's what he's hunting for. And so despite the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. is there, and despite the fact that Omega Red could easily just eliminate every single one of these S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, while he does do that, his main focus is a carbonadium synthesizer. So like a dog chasing a bone, Wolverine throws it over the edge and in turn, Omega Red goes to chase after it, S.H.I.E.L.D. uses their sticky goo stuff or whatever it is, attaches him to a rooftop, and basically Omega Red is allowed to be taken prisoner. Following that, Wolverine goes in and tries to rescue Jubilee. Now, this is kind of interesting because Marvel toys with the idea that Jubilee might die. What ends up happening is that where she's on the verge of basically dying, Wolverine simply hands himself over to S.H.I.E.L.D. He says, look, save this girl, save Jubilee, and I'll go with you willingly. I'll go wherever it is that you guys want to go. So, of course, this leads to Wolverine basically being taken into custody by S.H.I.E.L.D. and kind of being held in a sort of a medical containment unit that basically holds him in stasis. The problem with this is that somebody starts coming along. Now, of course, Dum Dum Dugan, one of the closest members of Nick Fury and really part of the original Howling Commandos who consumed the Infinity Formula, which means that he'll never really age. He's the guy who's basically watching Wolverine. He's kind of keeping a tab on all this kind of stuff, making sure that nothing really happens. The issue is that somebody comes walking in and this person has claws, just like Wolverine does. They come walking in, they stab Dum Dum Dugan in the chest, they slash Wolverine across the gut and they free him. This character character is a guy that refers to Wolverine as dad. Just for the sake of immersion, while a lot of this information is readily known, and a lot of you guys are like, I know exactly who that is. Just for the sake of immersion, I'm not going to tell you who he is. <laughs> for those of you guys who are really immersed in this, I'm not going to spoil it for you. We're going to kind of let the story continue on and, and that kind of a thing. I do not advise looking at the comments because people will spoil it in the comments because some people are just dicks like that. But what I might do is I might go through and just ban people who spoil the identity of this guy in the comics. I might do that. But the fact remains here, uh, this guy just refers to Wolverine as dad. And so this sets the stage that Wolverine's son does exist. Wolverine's son hates his father, just like Emma Frost said. And this kind of begins the process of expanding on the origin story and basically delving more into what's going on behind the scenes with the character of Logan, as well as dealing more into his past and how it all really kind of comes to a head with regards to this particular character. 
Okay, so we are getting back into uh, Wolverine Origins. And of course, we're going through our whole X-Men chronology. So this is really just kind of designed to feed into uh, a, really a lot of stuff that we've covered so far. <laughs> <laughs> and the overall idea here is that in the last video, uh, we had talked about how Wolverine had basically kind of handed himself over to S.H.I.E.L.D. You know, just because of the fact that he had gone on this crusade to basically track down the guy who was running the show. Essentially, this new introduction, some character that had been pulling the strings behind the scenes the entire time. And it actually just kind of like manufactured the life of Wolverine, which is to say they had engineered all the circumstances that led up to Logan being thrown into the Weapon X program and even some of those events afterwards, all leading up to the time when he joined the X-Men. And so handing himself over, what we ended up having was someone who basically broke in, slashed him, and then freed him. What we end up finding out in this story is that the person who basically freed Wolverine was his son. It was his son, Dakin. And this is cool because Dakin's a new introduction. It had always been this kind of idea that maybe Wolverine had kids, but it was never really anything fleshed out. There was never really anything to believe that Wolverine had a kid. Uh, this whole introduction, this whole idea kind of brings this all to a head, kind of takes the most logical step in the development of his character. Now remember, Wolverine Origins is also designed to basically consolidate the life and times of Wolverine. And it was cool because you know following him basically being freed he does what wolverine does <laughs> and initially goes to free himself you know to basically get out of the whole facility now the funny thing about this too is that this really kind of highlights the evolution of logan's character over the years you know when he really when like when he first popped up for example you know the old incredible hulk stories he was really kind of introduced as a character who was pretty ruthless to a degree and even when he was rolled over into the x-men with giant size x-men number one and then was written under chris claremont it was kind of cool because you basically had this idea that there was like a darker side to logan and every once in a while it would pop up but as the years have gone on his character has been fleshed out and a lot of old school wolverine fans will actually say that he's become softer over the years but when it came to a situation like this he would have killed every last one of those soldiers and left but in this instance he's kind of like well i mean these are young guys and they don't really know what they didn't know what they were getting into and they were probably shanghaied into this situation just like me and then of course it basically you know ends up with him taking out one of the guards only to steal his costume run out say hey wolverine's behind me and then basically make his escape and that's about it but it is kind of a cool little tidbit here because switching over to the character of Dakin, this is when we start to get a lot of development with him and, and you know in terms of how he sees himself and what his character is about now this was one of the first indications you know i mean if, if we hadn't really picked it up already in the first you know 10 issues <laughs> this was one of the first indications that the wolverine origins uh, line of stories we're going to be moving pretty fast because what would normally happen over the course of this is you would see little tidbits peppered in about the nature of a character little things take place here and there instead we get this development right off the bat and what we end up finding out here is that he's pretty cold hearted I mean, he basically ended up just kind of, you know, pairing up with some chick. And of course, her parents said, hey, look, this guy's bad for you. But like any young girl <laughs> and even any young guy, it's all about bad decisions. <laughs> it's all about making bad choices. And so the result is that she'd basically been used by Dakin, having no idea that that was the case. And the way he responds to this is ruthless. I mean, he basically says, look, you're an object. You're, you're, you serve a particular purpose. You're a fork. You're a spoon. You're a knife. When your purpose is served, you are discarded. And that's that's the nature of his character is that he's classic Wolverine. The way he acts here is classic Wolverine in a lot of ways. Now, what Dakin basically says is when I went into that bar and I met with that guy, I knew that you were following me. I could smell you. You know, I knew that you were there You know, and I knew that you were watching and I engaged that whole scenario because I knew that it would send you back here and you would get drunk. And this whole purpose, the whole basis behind this was that I basically fill that entire bottle of alcohol with sleeping pills. And I knew that you would come back and you would be sad and you would drink all that alcohol just to spite me and you would basically get yourself killed. And that's how everybody's going to view it. That's the nature. Anybody who walks in and they see this the scene with this girl who's dead they're basically going to say you did you know she did it to herself something happened and she was sad the guy she ran off with left her and then she just took a whole bunch of sleeping pills and died you know and and that's that's going to be the story of her it's actually pretty intelligent but from this point we switch over to another part of the story with a guy named milo now milo's kind of cool in a lot of ways he's a throwback to the old colossus character you know to pietro when he was first introduced in giant size x-men number one and the reason why i say this is because while Milo has the brain of a child and the, you know, the physical structure of a full grown man. I mean, Colossus was a, he, like, he was smart. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't by any means like dumbed down, but he was one of those archetypical examples of like brawn over brain, you know, strength over, over intelligence. For the character of Milo, the way we're introduced to him is that he was petting the horse and he was cleaning out the horse's stable and the horse kicked him and it made Milo mad and Milo punched the horse and knocked its head off. And so as a result, Milo basically has super strength, but it's interesting because his life and the, you know, the, the fact that a problem like this has arised indicates that other problems like this have arisen because 
his father's response is we should have registered him we basically should have gone to the government and said here's a person with superpowers you know here's a person with super strength and so on and so forth and we feel like you guys should be aware of him and the result is that they would have taken him and they would have thrown him into a facility now for his father it's just kind of like look good riddance to bad rubbish i mean that's really kind of his father's stance which is pretty cold-hearted but his mother of course is the opposite that hey look it's our child and it's our job to take care of him and so it's really interesting because in the middle of him basically crashing out for the night he is met with a kind of psionic presence basically met with a guy that really calls himself cyber i have no idea why they brought him back for the story <laughs> cyber is not relevant at all cyber had like a very short stint of relevancy and that basically happened in the old uh marvel comics presents stories and then in the old x factor stories that's where he got one of his biggest appearances really he was just kind of like a main enemy of x factor cyber was killed off pretty quickly he was literally eaten alive by like cybernetic bugs that was really about it it wasn't until this story came out years later you know in 2007 that he was basically brought back so he was absent for really over 20 years you know he was gone for quite some time now the cool thing about this is that cyber has different abilities and different aspects to his character the most notable is that in his old appearances he had these kind of adamantium tips but he also had like an adamantium uh coating on his body so he looked like colossus except for his face but it basically made him indestructible and so the whole idea was that because it coated his skin all you'd have to do is take out his head and then bugs would just eat him from the inside out but one of the other abilities he had and this is actually something that's kind of introduced here is he had the psionic ability to basically detect anybody anywhere and so the result is that it kind of allowed his consciousness to sort of exist out there basically he ended up taking over the body of milo and that's it you know essentially kills his dad and calls it a day but it is kind of intriguing because what this also does is it feeds into the idea of who it is that's pulling the strings and with the character of dakin you know we're not initially told all we're told is that it seems like to a degree he's terrified of this guy and where you know this this head honcho sends a messenger and says stay away from your dad do not mingle with wolverine do not do anything with him the time will come when you can fight but for right now you need to stay hidden away and you need to stay removed Dakin of course kills the messenger but ultimately it seems like he's basically going to defy these instructions he's going to go off and he's going to do his own thing now what this also does is this picks up with the character of the tinkerer now, Phineas Mason, he appeared back in Amazing Spider-Man number two in 1963. He was made by Stan Lee of Steve, uh, Steve Ditko. And the funny thing is he's just like this super genius, or not really super genius, but he's a really, really good at like inventing things or working on things, different stuff like that. And the funny thing about this is that originally he was a villain of Spider-Man. He was called the Terrible Tinkerer. Eventually, he was basically a guy whose services were available for hire. And so he was brought on board by people like Quentin Beck and you know, Rocket Racer and so on and so forth. But he's one of those characters that you see in Marvel Comics where he'll just appear from time to time. And he'll never really have any major role aside from the fact that like some villain somewhere will go to him or even some some heroes will go to him and say i need you to work on this or i need you to tell me how this works or where it came from or something along those lines and that's what ends up happening with the character of uh of, of cyber he ends up showing up and basically you know telling his whole backstory to the tinkerer and what we end up finding out here is that somewhere along the line he was brought on board at a training academy where wolverine had worked and this seems to be the academy he partook in uh up in hudson before he became part of like alpha flight and so the whole idea behind this was that uh, he was basically designed to train Wolverine. That was really about it. And the result was that eventually his escapades and exploits led him to Nick Fury, whereby he became an informant for S.H.I.E.L.D., just providing him with all manner of information. Now, eventually he was freed, and that run ends when he ends up, you know, being killed basically by uh, these little robot bugs. <laughs> it is kind of crazy. And then, of course, he provides a little bit of an explanation with regards to him basically showing up on the doorstep of Milo and then taking over his mind and so on and so forth. But for the character of Wolverine, remember, the carbonidium synthesizer is what he's been hunting for this entire time we had that in the last in the last video uh the carbonadium synthesizer basically synthesizing a metal that can weaken people's healing factors and that's what wolverine's hunting for especially now because his, hunt, his son is hunting for him now notice wolverine's not going after the muramasa blade the initial indication here is that his goal is not to kill dakin his goal is to disable dakin it would allow him to injure dakin just enough that his healing factor would shut down and then in turn subdue him or whatever it is that he ends up you know feeling like he wants to do and so where he ends up going into this uh to this bank in brussels more or less to access the safety deposit box where he'd been told by uh, Black Widow Natasha Romanoff that the actual carbonadium synthesizer was being held, he suddenly met with the arrival of Dakin. Now, again, this is old school Wolverine versus new school Wolverine. Dakin is designed to represent classic Wolverine, ruthless, hardcore, cunning, but also remember he's headstrong and he's a bit arrogant here. The other thing to bear in mind here is that Dakin does not have adamantium. He's just got bone. And so again, that's one of the reasons why his character works here is because it's kind of a response to the way Wolverine used to be. Now, again, this is kind of cool because Wolverine even comments and says, 
defenses look like you're weak and again that's true i mean we're talking about classic wolverine i mean let's say for example this fight took place when wolverine was in his feral state then like dakin would get torn to shreds but again because of the fact that he's grown soft over the years because of the fact that he's not nearly as hardcore and ruthless as he used to uh, used to be and because it's his son and he's not really fighting to kill ultimately dakin gets the upper hand temporarily now of course again slashing him across the throat doesn't make much of a difference in terms of killing wolverine what it does is it slows him down because while his healing factor will kick in and it'll basically heal his throat the problem with this is that he's bleeding out which means oxygen's not reaching his head and it'll ultimately cause him to become woozy and then pass out now of course once the healing factor kicks in his throat heals and blood starts pumping to all the veins like it's supposed to he'll be right as rain but until that time comes we're met with the arrival of cyber and this is interesting because the response of cyber is i'm here for you like i have been sent here on a mission to find you by the person who's pulling the strings and so again this hidden hand behind everything is the one that's running this entire show and that's what's cool because with cypher basically having gone to tinkerer and said i want you to put adamantium on this new body while dakin is capable dakin's not strong enough to be able to take on cyber by himself i mean in this body cyber's got super strength and he's got adamantium bonded to his physical form and so there's no way that dakin's going to be able to take this guy down and so the result is that we just kind of end up having wolverine of course coming to he subdues cyber for a bit of time trying to give dakin the ability to take this guy out and then of course dakin just kind of says whatever and then just ultimately ends up leaving what we also end up finding out here is that this body that cyber is in is inhabiting at the moment actually has a heart defect his body grew too fast for his heart to be able to handle and so the result is that you know if he pushed himself too hard too fast he'd suffer a heart attack and that's exactly what happens to cyber he literally starts to suffer a heart attack wolverine just kind of you know takes him rescues him and then that's really about it now this is not done because wolverine is legitimately like a good guy where he's like oh man no i can't let you die because that would be the wrong thing to do instead it's basically like i need information and in the here and now you're the only one who has it it's really more of like i'm going to preserve you if for no other reason than the fact i need your help with this and so the result is that it's really kind of an exchange of sorts and that's one thing to bear in mind when you get into this level and that's one of the reasons why i like you know a lot of the wolverine stories and even street level hero stories when you get into this level of storytelling what you're talking about is people who have been forged in the fires of conflict and there is a kind of bond that forms between those two guys even if they're the most mortal of enemies there's a bond that forms between the two of them and with regards to you know wolverine and with regards to to cyber because of the fact that they have such a lengthy history together it really kind of works now the other half of this is that when wolverine takes uh cyber back to the tinkerer just because of the fact that you know cyber's like hey look tinkerer is the one that put this stuff on me ultimately wolverine hands the uh carbonadium synthesizer over says hey look here's what i need tinkerer ends up giving cyber you know some pills to basically help him recover from his injury and then we start to get this whole backstory and what we end up finding out here is that the training facility that wolverine had been stationed at was actually ran by a guy named frederick hudson now frederick hudson is the grandfather of james hudson also known as vindicator for you know those of you guys who are familiar with alpha flight if you're not familiar with alpha flight the only thing you really need to know is they kind of feed into the history of wolverine which is to say that james and heather hudson had basically come across uh wolverine while he was in the woods and the result was that they brought him in and then wanted to induct him into the alpha flight team but ultimately wolverine turned it down alpha flight is uh is really kind of like a black ops superhuman team more or less or really just kind of superhuman team in general operating as a joint venture between canada's department h and their federal government so the fact remains here that what we're told is that on the back end a part of the story that we didn't know about was that where wolverine was being trained in this facility by you know at least that was being led by frederick hudson that silas burr had been brought in due to the fact that there was a previous point in his life when he had managed to convince a, a handful of guys to engage in all these heinous acts and so frederick uh, frederick hudson bringing him in was basically saying your job is to train specifically wolverine to make him an animal because the whole idea here was that's who he is that's his nature is to be an animal is to be violent sadistic and your job is to make sure that happens and so what uh what silas burr basically ends up bringing up is that where wolverine had fallen in love with a woman named janet and then silas burr had killed janet under the orders of frederick hudson that this was actually a recurring theme every single relationship that wolverine was ever in you know all the women that wolverine loved and were killed that was done intentionally it wasn't just because wolverine was in the wrong place at the wrong time or because he brings doom and gloom to everyone he ever falls in love with it was orchestrated to be that way by this guy pulling the strings behind the scenes in addition to that we also end up finding out that wolverine had basically had the tinkerer form bullets out of carbonadium using the carbonadium synthesizer the other half of this is that with a character of cyber because of the fact that he literally suffers from a heart condition what the tinkerer did is essentially attach a pacemaker to his body but it's funny because he's you know when, when cyber says like like how in the world did you pull this off like what is this you know is this thing adamantium the tinker says no it's carbonadium well carbonadium is radioactive <laughs> it'll kill you if you have it on you long enough and that's what cyber re you know immediately realizes is dude no way this is gonna get me killed man you have to take this off you have to get this off of me and what tinker says is there's no way you can it's stuck on there forever there's no feasible way to 
remove it. Now, what this does is it creates a ticking clock. Some point along the lines in the story, a cyber is going to die. That's basically what that means. It's, it's really the only conclusion you can draw from that, just because of the fact that we know that, again, if a person is exposed for carbonadium for any measure of time, meaning if it's part of their body, if they walk around with it, and they keep it that way for however long, it'll eventually it'll emit so much radiation, it'll just kill them. So again, that's the, that's the crazy thing about this. But the final little tidbit of the story basically comes in an epilogue. And what we end up having is Bucky Barnes. And essentially, Bucky Barnes has been told by Wolverine, hey, look, we got to settle up. You know, and again, this all goes back to the origins and endings video, if you haven't seen that yet. But it's basically saying we got to settle up. And so in a bus station at locker number 93, you'll find something and you'll find a note. And when he gets in there, he ends up finding those three carbonadium bullets. And of course, a note that's left there by Wolverine that says, I'll let you know when to use them. So again, Bucky Barnes being drawn back in. The story is really kind of progressing and, and actually moving pretty well. I loved Wolverine Origins. It's definitely one of my favorite stories. Okay, so continuing on with our X-Men chronology, which we've moved to Sundays, we're going to cheat a little bit. We're actually going to kind of take part of a story and cover that. Not really part of a story. So here's the deal. So as part of the whole aftermath to the House of M, which is to say the Scarlet Witch taking everybody's powers, there were a whole bunch of ancillary stories that came out of this. And it was really kind of like reworking and revitalizing the X-Men. For the villain Apocalypse, who had long, st you know, long stood as one of the X-Men's most dangerous villains, he had always had something called the Four Horsemen. And the Four Horsemen, originally, as they were introduced, well, really with Luis and Walter Simonson, the whole idea was to basically have the four horsemen be uh, this kind of Marvel Comics embodiment of like the four horsemen of, bi of the biblical apocalypse from the book of Revelations. Now, the idea was that originally apocalypse would grab mutants whose powers complemented the role he would give them. So for example, one of the, the really one of the first members of the uh, four horsemen was a Morlock called Plague, uh, who had the ability to spread like disease and illness and apocalypse turned her into pestilence. Now, because of the fact that apocalypse having horsemen was such a popular popular concept, which was really kind of like bolstered by X-Men the Animated Series, the idea of the horse in themselves became wildly popular. And so it was one of those things where every time Apocalypse showed up, he'd usually have a different set of horsemen, just because of the fact that the horsemen he had before had been defeated. But over the years, Marvel began to kind of move away from the powers have to complement the role they play to just what would make a really cool horseman. Now, by and large, when Apocalypse has his four horsemen, really like the being death is kind of like the, the cut above the rest. Usually when Apocalypse sits down and says, who am I going to make? into my horsemen. There's pestilence, there's famine, these different roles that people play. And then there's death. And death is like usually the most popular one. That was a trend that was set in motion with Angel, with when Warren Worthington became the horseman death. And it was cool because I mean, he was leading like famine and war and pestilence. And it was cool to see him leading those, those particular roles. But the fact remains here that the, the character, the person that plays death is always the most popular. The only exception to that, I think, is the Incredible Hulk who was war. But like Wolverine, for example, was the horseman death at one point along the line. And so the idea, and we'll talk more about this once we actually cover the Blood of Apocalypse story. But the idea was that with this story, Blood of Apocalypse, it was essentially a scenario whereby Apocalypse had been woken up from his slumber by virtue of the fact that so many mutants had lost their powers. Just this massive reduction in energy, it just kind of snapped him out. Now remember, when it comes to Apocalypse, he usually lays down and slumbers to kind of rejuvenate his abilities, and it can depend. Marvel just kind of plays it fast and loose on how long he sleeps. For the most part, it's usually for anywhere between a few thousand years, sometimes even as short as like a few hundred years. But the idea is that ever since Apocalypse first woke up within the last, you know, couple thousand years or so, the idea was that he's been on a constant crusade to try to take over the world. Now, eventually he'll go back into his slumber and he'll sleep for like another 2000 years. And then when he emerges, he'll try to take over the world again, which he successfully did in Cable's future. But the whole idea is that when he emerged, when he basically woke up, he actually showed up on the grounds of the X of the Xavier Institute of the X-Men mansion and was like, I come here with vials of my blood. Those who believe in me drink my blood and you will basically gain your powers. You'll get your powers back or get some kind of powers back. And those of you who don't, feel free to just kind of live down here in the slums, so to speak. And so what you ended up having was kind of like this mutant civil war to a degree. You had those who were faithful to Apocalypse and those who were not. The idea was that Gambit turned himself over to Apocalypse and we didn't know why. What this does is it explains why, but it kind of gives us like the transmogrification of Gambit, which is to say the process he undergoes to a degree on how he becomes the Horseman Death. Now it's kind of funny because when he first showed up to Apocalypse, it was, well, the X-Men never appreciated me. So I'm turning myself over to you because hopefully you could show some measure of appreciation. Now remember, most all the X-Men know who Apocalypse is. And for those of you guys who are not familiar, the Apocalypse you saw in the Fox movie, that was a sham. That's that's nowhere near how powerful Apocalypse is. Apocalypse is crazy powerful. Like he can augment any of it. He can augment his body to become anything. He can give himself the power of flight. He can change his limbs into like weapons and shields and like energy projections and you know, like, like shoot energy beams and things like that. He can grow to like any size. He can shape shape 
shift. It's crazy the kind of powers he displays. He's a one man army. And if it really came down to it, this is kind of the funny thing about the character of Apocalypse. Because he's so powerful, you don't really see him fight the X-Men all that often. And usually the way the fights happen is Apocalypse shows up. He sends forth his horsemen. His horsemen are defeated and Apocalypse says, you know, he says, fine, I'll see you guys next time. But if it came down to it and Apocalypse, like, uh, you know, you wanted to write a story where Apocalypse killed the X-Men, he would just show up at the Xavier Institute. He would just blast the entirety of the Xavier Institute. Every single X-Man that tried to face off against him would stand no chance. They would be totally obliterated and Apocalypse would just walk away. That story would be like three pages long. It would not be huge and it would fit in because he's just that damn powerful. It's crazy how capable he is. But Gambit showing up, it's one of these interesting things because when you're Gambit and you've been part of the X-Men, in a lot of ways, he has the right to feel betrayed because he has been multiple times. You remember when Gambit first showed up back in the old X, the, the old uh, Uncanny X-Men stories, his appearance came with the fact that he was very ambiguous. Nobody really knew anything about his past. When the X-Men discovered that he had basically led the uh, the marauders of Mr. Sinister into the tunnels of New York, and then the marauders had engaged in the Morlock massacre, while Gambit did not partake in the massacre, the X-Men thought he did, and they immediately kicked him off the team. They wouldn't even let him plead his case. They just kicked him off the team, and that was the end of that. Now, Gambit eventually came back, but it's always been this idea that despite the fact that Gambit has been part of the X-Men, the X-Men have never fully trusted him. Now, a lot of that's because Gambit's never really like put all his cards on the table, so to speak. He's never laid his whole life to bear for the X-Men to see. He has with Rogue to a degree, but even the conversations with Rogue have been like, don't tell anybody else what I've told you because this is very important to me, that kind of a thing. And so because of that, it's, it's one of those scenarios where he really is very mysterious, even in the eyes of the X-Men in a lot of different ways. And so when he shows up here and he hands himself over to Apocalypse, in a lot of ways, he kind of wants to believe. It's kind of that desire to belong somewhere, you know, where Apocalypse shows up and says, I will make this world better. I will give you guys your powers back. You know, Gambit kind of wants to believe that and wants to say, look, you're going to make the world a better place. I hope you will because you can. But it's also kind of funny too, because Gambit asks questions like, what in the world does that thing do? And, and Apocalypse is like, uh, that's the Claw of Horus. And I actually don't really know. It just kind of messes with your body a little bit, I guess. Now, this is kind of funny here because in truth, Apocalypse inherently, like, like let's say for example, we strip away all the technology of Apocalypse. He's just a mutant who's immortal and is like really strong. And that's really about it. Uh, Apocalypse's ability to access celestial technology, that's what grants him all the special powers that he has. That's what elevated him from just like an external, a legitimately immortal mutant to like a godly, like a demigod mutant. That's that's the only thing that really elevated him to that position is a celestial tech. But despite having meddled with it to a degree, Apocalypse doesn't understand it fully. He understands like if you expose someone to it and you set the machine in motion, it'll start augmenting their powers and they'll come out either with a new set of powers or with like a heightened uh, a heightened level of their existing powers. But Apocalypse doesn't understand it 100% of the way. And that's kind of the interesting thing is because for him, if you go back and you read the old like Cable and Deadpool stories where it talks about how Cable was the trap and he went back and met Apocalypse for the first time and like fought him and was the reason why Apocalypse was able to augment with celestial technology anyway. Despite the fact that he had this access, his mind couldn't necessarily comprehend this technological stuff that was there that was hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, way ahead of anything humanity was able to achieve, even right now in the modern day. Apocalypse being able to use celestial technology is essentially you being exposed to like an alien space, uh, spacecraft and then being able to turn it on. That's basically what it amounts to. Like, okay, cool, you turned it on, awesome. All right, now, like, you know, if I do this, this thing happens, but I don't really know why it happens. I just know that it does happen. That's just kind of how Apocalypse functions when it comes to that celestial tech. Now, the other half of this is also with scribe Ozymandias. Now, remember, Ozymandias was one of the generals of Cain the Conqueror back when Cain the Conqueror lived in ancient Egypt and Apocalypse first rose to power. Now, Apocalypse, of course, uses power to essentially turn Ozymandias into like living stone. And the idea was that from that point until the end of time, Ozymandias would be doomed to do nothing more than just chronicle the events of Apocalypse. Every action Apocalypse makes, every action that takes place that's the result of Apocalypse, all those different things, that's the entire role Ozymandias plays, nothing more than that. But it is kind of funny because Apocalypse initially tries to play on the idea of Gambit feeling abandoned by the X-Men, which Gambit kind of allows him to do to a degree, but then we learn Gambit's true motivation. And what Gambit basically says here is, I'm not doing this because I truly believe in you. I believe you might do some good. I believe that like you you say you want to do some good things, but I'm doing this because somebody's got to keep an eye on you. That as the Horseman Death, 
my powers, which were already formidable, will be augmented and heightened. And in your hubris, you will likely believe that I cannot take you down. And so when these events unfold, when everything begins to come to fruition, if what we find out is that this whole charade of like, I'm here to make everything better and I'm here to bring you guys to a better place, you know, if that's all just a facade and if it's really just classic apocalypse who's using the moment to try to seize control of the world, if that's really all it is, then Gambit will be there to stop him. Now, whether or not Gambit could truly do it on his own, we'll have to wait until we get to the story to find out. But this is the process by which Gambit undergoes to become the Horseman Death. And let me tell you something, man, like as Horseman Death, he looks amazing. Dude, he looks so good. He's one of the coolest looking Horsemen of Apocalypse that there's ever been with like the all black and the red eyes and like the long hair. It looks so beast. He's, he's pretty amazing. But I figured you guys might enjoy this. I, I thought you guys might dig this whole thing of like Gambit becoming a Horseman of Apocalypse, becoming the Horseman Death. All right, so continuing our videos on the X-Men chronology, which we need to get back on track with this. Remember, all this stuff comes after House of M, and this is kind of cool because this is basically like the return of, Poco of, of Apocalypse after the events of House of M. Now, Apocalypse has always been a really, really interesting villain. He's one of these characters that nobody ever really knows how to write, and the reason why is because from the time he was introduced and over the years, especially in the 90s, and like the X-Factor stories with the original team and the X-Factor stories with the second team, the government sanctioned team, Apocalypse was always one of these villains where it's like, if he chose to, he could eradicate the X-Men. He could just destroy them in their entirety. He's just that powerful. And so the question became, what do you do with a villain like that? Now, in truth, all that goes back to X-Factor issue number four or five, when he made his first appearance by Louise Simonson and Walter Simonson. And he always used horsemen. And that was kind of the caveat that Marvel would introduce, but it was always kind of a skewed eye. Like, okay, Apocalypse sends out his horsemen, the X-Men or the X-Factor defeat, you know, defeat the horsemen. So why does an Apocalypse step in instead of just leaving? Apocalypse just kind of takes off. And the way that Marvel worked to basically explain this was essentially say that Apocalypse believes in a social Darwinism. Apocalypse makes efforts to conquer the world because in his mind, he believes that he's making people in the world stronger. And so if he has horsemen and if he sends those horsemen out and the X-Men defeat the horsemen, the X-Men have proven themselves worthy for the time and Apocalypse just leaves. That's kind of how Marvel managed to work that whole thing in in terms of providing an answer of why Apocalypse doesn't just destroy all the X-Men. Now, there have been times where Apocalypse has made moves and jumped into different schemes that are outside of determining whether or not the X-Men are worthy and it's for a specific goal. And like it's taken the power of multiple groups, the Avengers, the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, X-Factor, so on and so forth to like get him to go away. But one thing to bear in mind is really as far as I'm aware, when it comes to the character of Apocalypse, he's never truly been defeated. He's just kind of been staved off. It's kind of been like, okay, I don't feel like dealing with this anymore. And then he just leaves. But the cool thing about this is that after the events of House of M, because 98% of the mutant population lost its powers, Apocalypse just woke up. Now remember, Apocalypse slumbers, right? Like he goes through like these one or 2000 year slumbers where he'll just kind of stay dormant for a while. And it's a way for Marvel to kind of write him out and then just bring him back, you know, five years or 10 years down the line, whenever they want him to return. But he basically shows up here with this massive Sphinx that he's built, of course, modeled it after himself, uh, alongside a character named Gazer. And Gazer was just one of these mutants out there that was pondering ending his life more or less. And the result was that he was basically taken by Apocalypse and he's going to be transformed into a horseman. Now, this is one thing to keep in mind. Whenever Apocalypse turns someone into a horseman, he usually doesn't take into individuals who lust for it. There are people out there who want to be a horseman of apocalypse and he usually rejects them because what he wants is to basically grab a person who is deemed to basically be weak, whether they're weak in mind or spirit or they're weak physically. You know, it's the idea that like he can push them and make them worthy by subjecting them to genetic modification, to brainwashing and turning them into a horseman. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm making you someone worthy and then in turn, you'll go forward and do my bidding. But at this point, we switch over to the horseman of pestilence. Now, of course, the whole role of pestilence is to basically spread illnesses across the world. Now, depending on what era we're talking about, this can be done in different ways. Whenever Apocalypse chooses a person to become a horseman, he usually selects an individual whose powers will complement whatever role they're going to be playing. And so historically speaking, when a person became pestilence, it was usually a mutant, sometimes a human, but usually a mutant that had the ability to basically kill things with, you know, they had like a death touch of sorts or the ability to like spread disease or to make a person sick or something along those lines. That was the original pestilence. In this instance, with the mutant population being so low, to be quite frank, the piggins are slim. That's really all it is. <laughs> and it's kind of cool because in this instance, Pestilence is actually going to like various places around the world and grabbing all these different diseases, the bubonic plague and smallpox and things like that, just rallying all these illnesses that humanity would normally have a kind of cure for, and then in turn, destroy the various cures that exist for those illnesses. So it's essentially having all these illnesses in his possession and no way to stop it. Now, at this point, we jump back to Gazer. And again, this is the nature of becoming a 
a horseman. For the most part, most horsemen are already like tried and proven in the sense that like they've been forged in the fires of combat or they know how to fight or whatever the case may be. But this goes all the way back to the original X Factor story. The idea was that when Apocalypse first made the horsemen, there was no real leadership among the horsemen. It was just four horsemen. And so what he did is he had them all fight each other and whoever won would be the leader. And it turned out to be Angel or I guess Archangel, who was the horseman death, who became the leader of the horsemen. The result is that in this instance, and because of Apocalypse is basically in a rush, it's let's test these guys. Let's see what they're worth. We're going to put their metal to the test essentially to see if one of them is going to become a horseman and whoever wins, they're the one who will become the horseman war. Of course, Ozymandias steps in and takes out one of the other guys and spares Gazer. Now, Ozymandias is of course the chronicler of Apocalypse. The only real role he serves is to essentially write down the whole life and times of Apocalypse. And so the result is that Ozymandias has really kind of become this scheming guy. Now, a lot of that goes into the origin of Ozymandias, which you're welcome to watch the video down in the description, which will give you the origin on his whole character. Suffice it to say, he was unwillingly forced into his position. And the result is that he's really been working over the millennia to try to find a way to like destroy Apocalypse and free himself from his imprisonment and possibly even replace Apocalypse. And so that's the whole basis behind his idea. The issue with this is that for Apocalypse himself, he has to find a new horseman, you know, or at least find, you know, the, the third horseman that he's looking for. And so what we end up doing is switching over to Sunfire. Now, this picks up out of an existing story that there really was no reason for us to cover, but it was basically an idea where Sunfire was, you know, had a kind of jumped into a conflict. He was double crossed and he had his legs cut off by uh, Lady Deathstrike, who was the one time love interest of Wolverine turned into a villain and having cyborg modifications. The reason why he's kind of in this infirmary is because of that, because his legs have been removed. But the idea with Sunfire is he's always been exceedingly proud, if not arrogant. Now he had a huge empire under his belt and that's why it was all really happening. That's why he kind of maintained that mindset. But the idea that he's now bedridden because he lost his legs is a pretty crushing blow because in his mind, he's kind of like half the person he used to be. But the idea is that upon Apocalypse showing up on his doorstep and basically saying, hey, look, I recognize you lack faith in yourself now. I can give you the means to return yourself to who you were before. Sunfire almost leaps at the opportunity. The problem with this is that Sunfire knows who Apocalypse is. And when the devil makes deals, those deals always have caveats. And that's what this is about. It's really kind of this situation where Sunfire is like, yeah, you show up. This gift is too good to be true. There has to be something with it. But in the end, he ends up going with it. He ends up taking the offer that's provided to him by Apocalypse. And so what we end up doing is jumping back to the Xavier Mansion. Now, one thing I also want, to, want you guys to bear in mind, this takes place before the events of Deadly Genesis. And I'll throw this into that playlist before that story so that you guys don't really get confused in terms of where it's supposed to reside. But the idea is that Xavier hasn't returned yet. The issue with this is that Polaris has basically gone missing. Now, of course, Lorna Dane, the daughter of Magneto, or at least, you know, it was believed she was a daughter of Magneto at this point in time, was a love interest of both Havoc and Bobby Drake. Havoc being the brother of Cyclops, Bobby Drake being Iceman. The issue with this is that while she wasn't really dating them at the same time, they've dated her at different points in time. And so they both have a romantic interest towards her. Now, at this moment, Havoc was the one who was believed to be romantically involved with her, but ultimately things kind of went awry and she just sort of vanished and that was about it. But the issue is that Apocalypse pops up on the scene and suddenly people begin to panic. And the reason why is because again, when Apocalypse shows up, your head turns because that's when things are about to pop off. The guy can do all manner of things. He's one of the most powerful mutants to ever exist. And when the X-Men face off against Apocalypse, it's always preceded by the horsemen and then the question has to be asked, is this the day Apocalypse will kill us? And by all rights, he should be able to destroy them. The other half of this is that Apocalypse doesn't show up looking for battle. He shows up and says, I'm here to save you all. That what you guys are at right now, because of the fact that you guys are basically at 10% of the population that you used to have, you guys have proven yourselves worthy. Now, that's kind of the irony of it because they had no hand in that. It was like a massive battle went on and the, you know, whatever 198 mutants survived would be the ones who would be allowed to keep their powers. They had them all stripped away by the Scarlet Witch. But Apocalypse deems them worthy. And that's kind of the thing to bear in mind when it's, with his character. When it comes to who the, uh, who's worthy and who's not, it's really just kind of left to his own devices. It's whoever he likes the most. It is cool because when Apocalypse shows up, he basically says, I am planting the seeds of like plague and disease and illness. And like 90% of humanity is going to be destroyed. But what I have here is something that can keep you protected. The other half of this is that famine suddenly starts showing up. Now, of course, famine, like you would expect, basically has the ability to force people into believing that they're, they're basically starving starving, that they're, you know, dehydrating, you know, because they're exceedingly thirsty. And Apocalypse says, well, I have this, this drink here. One sip of this drink will quench any thirst you have. It'll satiate any hunger that you have. If you want it, all you have to do is pledge your loyalty to me. People just come 
flying at him. Some of them kind of stand back and sure they're struggling just like everybody else and they're, they believe they're starving just like everybody else, but they don't really give in. And those individuals who don't really give up are the ones who are experienced with this. We're like, look, this is the game that Apocalypse plays. This is how he does this. But for the most part, people don't care. They're just kind of like, whatever, you know, this guy has the ability to satiate whatever hunger I have. I will do whatever it is he asks me to do if he gives me some measure of nourishment. So again, this is why he kind of shows up as a messiah of sorts. The issue is that in the middle of all this, we're suddenly met by the arrival of Gambit, who effectively hands himself over to Apocalypse. Now again, we covered this in terms of like Gambit becoming the horseman death. So if you want to know what happens after this moment between, you know, what we're about to talk about here in a second and like this point where he shows up, that's covered in that particular comic. But it is kind of intriguing because Gambit's always been one of these guys who's who's kind of been on again, off again in X-Men and, you know, felt betrayed by the X-Men, but he always comes back. So there is a, a lot of loyalty to the X-Men there. And in fact, that's something that he says when he's being turned into a horseman. I'm not doing this because I believe in your cause. I'm doing this because someone needs to keep you in check. But again, there's a lot of scheming and stuff going on here behind the scenes with Ozymandias. And this is kind of the funny moment because Ozymandias is talking to Apocalypse and he's basically saying, look, you should have just obliterated them. Like, why not destroy humanity? Like, why not wipe out humanity in its entirety? They're weak. And if, the, if they're weak and the weak don't deserve to live, then destroy the weak, destroy humanity. And where Apocalypse kind of counters with this and saying, you have no idea what's going on, Ozymandias' initial response is, well, you've grown weak over the years. And Apocalypse slams his head into a wall. <laughs> And that's what I love so much about that because he's like, I've had enough of your trash talk, man. Like, and, and that's, that's, that's what's so ironic is Apocalypse could just kill him. Apocalypse's belief system of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, only the strongest deserve to survive. It is both the platform by being, by, by which he makes his case and his own prison. Well, only the strong deserve to survive. And a person who's strong enough to kill me must be exceedingly strong. If I'm destroyed by this person, then that person deserves to destroy me. I deserve to die. Whereas he looks at this circumstance and it is, well, we can't destroy humanity because they have to prove them themselves worthy. But life would be easier if humanity was obliterated off the face of the earth and all that was left is mutants. But again, with this whole idea of, of scheming, sneaking behind the scenes, all this cloak and dagger stuff, initially Ozymandias tries to strike a deal with, with war, simply showing up to Gazer and saying, look man, I saved your life when you were Gazer so that you could become the horseman you are now. I told you a debt would be owed. I'm asking you this favor. I need you to help me destroy Apocalypse. And initially Gazer doesn't really offer an answer. War doesn't really tell him what direction he's going to go in. He just kind of shuffles around a bit. Now, this is something else that also want you guys to notice too. When it comes to characters in Marvel Comics, take like Franklin Richards for example, exceedingly powerful. As powerful as they always are, Marvel always builds in caveats, or at least they try to. In this instance, there is a way to basically shut down the powers of Apocalypse. You have this guy named Pulse, who seemingly has the ability to do that. You know, Pulse has this ability to kind of take down Apocalypse's powers, even if it's only temporary, even if it's only for a short amount of time. The issue is that a being of that caliber, a being of that power, almost seems beyond Pulse's ability to basically take down on his own. And so of course he'll play the role and he'll do whatever it is that he needs to do. But it is kind of cool because it, it's like you trying to bench press 500 pounds having never lifted weights before. And so ultimately we basically pick up with the idea that Sunfire is famine having made his arrival and you know forcing everybody to believe they're starving and so on and so forth. He'd basically been captured by the X-Men. And what this did is it allowed the X-Men to hold him in stasis and then in turn decide how they were going to revert him back to being Sunfire. Because bear in mind when a person becomes a horseman there are modifications, genetic modifications that are made to them. Sometimes they're given new powers and their old powers are wiped away. Sometimes their old powers are enhanced. Sometimes they have no powers and they're given powers. But when it comes to like believing that they're horsemen death or they're horsemen war or famine or pestilence, they're brainwashed into believing that. For the most part, it usually works depending on the character. But Marvel always builds that in as like a way to bring them back. When Wolverine became a horseman of apocalypse, it took like, I think it was Jubilee or Kitty Pride. I could never remember which one, but it was one of the two who basically showed up and said, look, like you have to come back. Like you have to be one of us. Remember who you are. And then he regained his mind and that was really about it. But of course, Ozymandias shows up, basically sneaks into the X-Men mansion. Uh, you end up having War who runs to Apocalypse, spills the beans about the traitorous nature of Ozymandias. And so Ozymandias says, look, I want to take down Apocalypse just as bad as you guys do. Our motivations for why we want to take him down are different, but we both want to take him down. He leads them inside the Sphinx through a secret passage. And when they arrive, Apocalypse is basically ready for them all. And that's what's so ironic. This moment right here, this moment when like Havoc shows up and Rogue shows up should have been the destruction of these guys. Apocalypse 
Apocalypse should have just been like, nope, and then just wipes them all away, you know, and just obliterates them in their entirety, which he could. But instead, he's just like, I am not alone. Here are those who follow me as well as my horsemen. And it's just kind of like, okay, I mean, I guess that works. But then you also have him revealing the newest horseman of Gambit, the Horseman Death. And I'm going to say it right now, he looks so amazing as the Horseman Death. I love how he's got the whole like, you know, like early 2000s goth, like I'm so misunderstood by the world, you know, the whole emo look. But initially, Rogue tries to bring him back. And again, you know, the, the kind of inner turmoil that you deal with when it comes to these various individuals who end up being turned into horsemen, Rogue tries to bring him back by, by sort of building on that connection the two of them have shared over the years, the fact that they've been in love. It doesn't really work, not initially anyway, at least it doesn't seem like it. Instead, he just kind of continues this campaign to take on these various X-Men. Now, of course, this leads to the destruction of the Cure, which of course forces Apocalypse to kind of scrap the plans as they exist now and modify them a little bit. Apocalypse says, okay, fine, look, it's time to go. We gotta get out of here. Like, like we'll go modify our plans. We'll worry about the X-Men later. For right now, we need to go focus on bigger things, on better things. And so what ends up happening is Apocalypse alongside his horsemen shows up at the United Nations and essentially makes this giant declaration to all of humanity. He, you know, he basically says, look, here's what's gonna happen. Only 10% of the mutant population is left. And so humanity will call its population by 90%, meaning they'll eradicate 90% of their own population, you guys will be on an even keel. But it's kind of cool because he backs him into a corner. He says, right now, my horseman pestilence has all these illnesses and diseases that are out there and we'll unleash them across the world. Either you can sacrifice 90% of humanity or I will wipe out 100% of humanity. The choice is yours and you have a week to decide what you want to come up with. Now, this is kind of cool because logic would dictate you would wipe out 90% of humanity. Like you, you would say, okay, fine, we got to wipe out 90% and maintain the last 10%. It's utilitarianism. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But when you're dealing with numbers that are almost that small when there's there's a 10 percent difference between the many and the few is there really a difference at all percentages make huge differences when it comes to like numbers and things like that so it is kind of funny when you look at it from that perspective but the fact remains here that what ends up happening is we end up switching over to uh, you know valerie cooper meeting up with uh x-men and havoc now of course valerie cooper was at one point the liaison between the government sanctioned x-factor team and like the federal government itself and so she would pass information to them and she would keep the government abreast of what X Factor was doing, and they would usually get their missions from the federal government. And the result was that once Valerie basically left that position, she kind of went on to, to other things, but still worked alongside the government. In fact, she was originally part of Project Wide Awake, which was the government program to control and contain the mutant threat when it first started popping up. So she's been around for quite some time. But the idea here is that what they've basically been working on are like these more advanced versions of Sentinels, basically Sentinels that are still manned, that are still controlled, so they don't have to worry about like a Days of Future Past event, but they are are, they are more capable of taking down more powerful threats. It's basically them just kind of stockpiling weapons and planning for like bigger and more dangerous things. And so what we end up doing is switching back over to Apocalypse in a conversation that he's having with uh, with Pestilence only for us to find out that Pestilence is actually Polaris. That when she had gone missing, it's because Apocalypse had taken her and shanghaied her into becoming one of his horsemen where she fought and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Ultimately, she was press ganged into it and she's become a horseman this entire time. And so she's the one kind of operating behind the scenes. Now, the cool thing about this is that with Apocalypse, you know, at the United Nations in New York, what we end up having is like the arrival of the Avengers and the X-Men, these massive superhero teams, but the Avengers aren't really there to like defeat Apocalypse. I mean, they're there to beat him if they can, but the whole idea is to try to like take him out, take out his various forces, take out his horsemen, which for the most part happens. Now, this is usually what goes on with Apocalypse and comics. His horsemen pop up and by whatever manner and whatever means, the horsemen are systematically destroyed. And it's a way for Marvel to just kind of knock over the different pieces, remove the different pieces from the board so they can wind the story down. And so in this instance, Apocalypse basically just kind of retreats. He just sort of says, okay, time to get while the getting's good. And that's one of the things about him is usually whenever he leaves, he's always got a backup plan to bail out as fast as he can. Of course, Gambit's defeated, essentially knocked unconscious. Polaris is knocked unconscious. And so they're basically taken away. And so Apocalypse retreats to the core of the ship with the intention of just sacrificing himself and killing himself. And that's what's so important about this story is because Apocalypse has never done that before. He's come very, very close to dying, but Apocalypse usually always escapes, sometimes by the skin of his teeth, sometimes because he just walks away and says enough is enough. But this is one of the first times, if not the first time, that he basically sacrificed himself and tried to die. And the reason why is because what we end up finding out is when Apocalypse was younger and he first encountered celestial technology, he didn't know how to use it. Now, largely that was all due to the fact that he was living in ancient Egypt. And so, I mean, if I went back there with a TV, he wouldn't know how to use it. But he was basically technology way beyond his ability to understand. Even right now in the Marvel Universe, for the most part, with the exception of like Reed Richards and maybe 
maybe Tony Stark. Celestial technology is way beyond anybody on Earth's ability to understand. It's, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years into the future in terms of how advanced it is and what it is that people can do with it. But what Apocalypse is given is basically all the information on how to access this technology and how to use this technology. So for those of you guys who are familiar with the Cable and Deadpool story, where we basically get the uh, the origin where like Cable jumps back in time and he basically fights Apocalypse and then Apocalypse merges with Celestial technology and then becomes uber powerful. This takes place right between that, that particular story. This one right here takes place between that Cable and Deadpool story before that story happens. But when Apocalypse is basically, you know, met with the arrival of the Celestials, they basically say, we'll teach you, like we'll give you all the information you need. You know, we'll, we'll send it to you, like we'll beam it into your brain and you'll know exactly how to use all of our technology, but there will be future payments. Now, this is where things are ambiguous because we're not told what those future payments are. But because of the fact that this is all part of X-Men Reload, which again was Marvel's way of basically getting rid of all these older characters or shuffling them around or taking them off the board or whatever the case may be, it was a way for Marvel to essentially remove Apocalypse, who had just kind of been, been a lingering villain for a couple decades, who just floated around from time to time. In all honesty, Marvel didn't really need to do that. It's not like Apocalypse showed up all the time. You know, he'd show up whenever. So, I mean, if he never, if we didn't see him again for 20 years, fans would have been like, yeah, he was probably just sleeping, you know, whatever. And they would have just written it off that way. But Marvel decided to kind of take this story to basically remove him from the equation. And as far as I'm aware, the original intention was to actually kill him off so that we would never see him again, which of course didn't happen because he comes back later on. Okay, we're getting into X-Men Deadly Genesis. And to be honest, there are a couple of stories that we've left out so far. A lot of those stories are because I'm just kind of pacing them out to cover them later on. For example, um, Uncanny X-Men, The First Forsaken, that deals with the idea of Storm moving to Wakanda and taking up residence in Africa. Then of course, there's a Black Panther story which follows that up where Storm and Black Panther get married. There's also Cable and Deadpool, like Bosom Buddies and you know Living Legends and so on and so forth. We're gonna cover that when, the, when Cable and Deadpool drop, or at least when Deadpool 2 comes out. And that brings us to what it is that we're going to do next. So right now, X-Men Deadly Genesis leads into a few stories. I mean, really, uh, X-Men Deadly Genesis kind of wraps up the decimation branding, so to speak, which is to say the aftermath of House of M. And it starts moving the X-Men into the new era of storytelling, which is really, I, I call it like the dark age of the X-Men. And that goes into things like Messiah Complex, Messiah War, and all that kind of cool stuff, you know. But because of the fact that Deadpool 2 has been moved up to May from June or July, or whatever it was supposed to be, one of the things that I'm thinking about doing is going back to the mid-90s and covering the story of X-Men, of Nate gray after the events of age of apocalypse and covering the solo series and then running into cable and deadpool so regardless the cool thing remember when it comes to the uh after you know the the house of m aftermath and really when it comes to like the x-men titles as a whole for the most part they're really just kind of standalone you don't have to read through all the x-men publications and again i'll provide a reading order for everything that that happens between house of m running up to deadly genesis so you guys can kind of pick and choose what you want to read but you can read them in isolation if you want to for example if for whatever reason you're interested in like multiple man and uh X Factor, you can just read the X Factor stories. You know, if you really care about the X Men, you can read Uncanny X Men, New X Men, different things like that. There's a lot of stuff that you can do when it comes to picking and choosing what it is that you want to cover. But Deadly Genesis is a retcon. So, for those of you guys who have been on my channel for a while or you're new to comic books or something like that, and you've heard me reference the phrase of a retcon, this is that in real time. So, you're literally going to be watching it unfold in real time. Now, what this does is it picks up with regards to the, you know, Office of National Emergency. But the whole idea behind this was that following the events of Decimation, when when the Scarlet Witch stripped 98% of the mutant population of their powers, the Office of National Emergency mobilized, and then they basically stationed sentinels around the Xavier Institute to keep anybody from going in and to keep anybody from getting out. And so the X-Men are prisoners, but they're also protected from any external threats. But regardless of the circumstance, what we do is we pick up out in space with a giant chunk of the Earth that was catapulted into space, and it's a guy who basically wakes up. And this is cool, because when this person wakes up, what he does is he basically obliterates the entirety of this astronaut team, and then in turn goes into the their ship and starts analyzing everything going on only to find out that he's in the 21st century and this is cool because again we'll figure out who this guy is because he's actually crazy powerful but from here we pick up with you know how each individual person is largely dealing with not only the events of decimation but the vanishing of charles xavier remember when it came to the main house of m storyline one of the things that was established was that charles xavier had died you know well at least it was believed that he had died nobody could find charles xavier and for the most part he's just largely been presumed dead and that was the big question people were asking 
where's Professor X? And was he just wiped from existence? How did he die? That was a lot of the questions that were being asked here. Now, of course, picking up with Emma Frost and of course the use of Cerebra, which is a huge computer system they use to basically analyze mutants across the planet, different things like that. This is basically one of those attempts where Emma Frost goes in every day and sees whether or not there were new mutants who were popping up. Because remember, from their perspective, the number was reduced, but Beast made a really, really good point. One of the things that Marvel does is they'll use like real world science, but only when it's convenient. And this is one of those things where it's convenient, when they basically say, look, you know, mutant power, whether it's telepathy, whether it's reality warping, whether it's energy projection or what have you, it takes a physical form. When you shoot energy out, that energy comes out, like it impacts things. If it can impact something, it has mass. And according to, you know, the law of conservation of matter, mass can't simply just disappear. Because of the fact that these powers, whether it was telepathy that was influencing the mind of others, you know, whether it was energy projection, someone who can just like shoot energy out of their body or something along those lines, that energy had to have gone somewhere. It can't simply just vanish. Now, as we know, that energy is orbiting Earth. It's just nobody's really aware of it. Most likely because it's kind of a, you know, um, non-corporeal form and it's just kind of out there and, you know, just, just not necessarily detectable. Regardless of the circumstance, with Emma Frost going into Cerebra and trying to analyze whatever mutants are out there, she's suddenly hit by this massive blast of energy that actually knocks her unconscious. And the first question everybody has is, what in the world's going on here? Because remember, Emma Frost is one of the most powerful telepaths in the world. And in fact, right now at this moment with Charles Xavier out of the picture, she's the most powerful telepath on the planet. The fact that somebody was able to overwhelm Emma Frost and send her into a catatonic state is insane because it means that their power is so extreme that her mind couldn't handle all the energy that was put off. But the fact remains here, because this energy signature emanated from a shuttle, which has since crash landed into the Earth, of course the X-Men respond. The other half of this is that varying members of the X-Men begin to see these like horrific images. For example, Kitty Pride sees a dead body, Nightcrawler is forced to basically relive his experience living in West Germany. And this is kind of a big deal because what this means is that all these different mutants are basically being forced to kind of relive some of their most horrific moments in their lives. Once they also arrive onto the scene, they end up finding out like this giant hand was basically reached out of the ground and, you know, grabbed the space shuttle to keep it from smashing into bits. But at this point, we kind of pick up with uh, with a couple things that are going on. The first is with Sean Cassidy and the second is with the arrival of the X-Men. Now, Sean Cassidy has been in Marvel Comics for quite some time and he was a Chris Claremont creation, I want to say, but he goes by the name of Banshee and he's actually the love interest of Maura McTaggart who's long since died in the realm of, of Marvel Comics. But Sean Cassidy, of course, was, was head of like Cassidy Keep and part of like the whole Cassidy family. But because of the fact that Maura's been gone for quite some time, when Cassidy, or you know, when Sean basically kind of has these visions where he sees Maura, then the question is what in the world's going on? So of course, like anybody, he chases after her. Now the exact same thing happens with the X-Men with regards to like Cyclops and Rachel Summers and so on showing up where the shuttle crashed and then Cyclops seeing Jean Grey and chasing after her. Now, of course, once Cyclops and Wolverine chase after Jean Grey, because of course, you know, back in the day, they were both in love with her. They turn the corner only to find out that Rachel Summers has been captured and she's being held by this super powerful guy. Now, picking up with Sean Cassidy for a second, this kind of a uh, mental image of Moore McTaggart that he's seeing has led him to this office that she had that he never really knew about. And inside this office, she kind of has like this diary where she basically talks about how terrible of a human being Charles Xavier was, that he was a horrible person, he was manipulative, he was duplicitous, that he didn't really do anything that wouldn't benefit him. Now this is huge because this is one of the first times in Marvel Comics where they basically come along and they say that while Charles Xavier on the on the outset was like really firm and really harsh with students with regards to their training, but was more of a loving father figure, this is them coming back and saying actually he was a horrible human being. He was a terrible person. And it's really, really interesting because when this story first dropped, things like this were huge. But well, the fact remains here that with the, with regards to the, the current moment and the X-Men dealing with, uh, you know, Rachel Summers who's been captured, this guy dominates the X-Men. I mean, it's crazy. Well, really it's Cyclops and Wolverine, but like dominates them in their entirety. Like he levitates Wolverine, you know, knocks him unconscious. He slows down the impulses to the brain of Rachel Summers, effectively knocking her out. But the coolest display of power, and this is one of the things that I love the most, is when Cyclops goes to shoot his optic blast, the guy forces the blast to go around him and right back to Cyclops, which is cool because we've never seen a person control optic beams like that before. And, if, uh, you know, initially when I saw this, I was like, okay, so this guy's like a reality warper, which is crazy, but he's not. He's not really a reality warper, but he almost might as well be because of the kind of things that he can do. But the fact remains here that we end up having the Office of National Emergency responding due to the fact that the X-Men had basically left the grounds without permission, more or less. They just kind of, you know, flew the coop without telling anybody. And of course, you know, once they arrive, Cyclops and uh, Rachel Summers have been taken and Wolverine's the only one left. And so, I mean, from here, it's kind of a straightforward moment in the sense that Emma Frost and the other X-Men fly over to where the military is hanging out at, where they're holding like Wolverine and so on. And uh, Emma Frost just uses her telepathy in order to free Wolverine. And that's really about it. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what we would expect for them to break Wolverine out. The cool thing about this comes with Rachel Summers and 
named Cyclops. Now, we'll talk about Rachel Summers here in a second because she's a character that we really, really, really need to explain in order for you guys to understand where it is, is you know, her character's coming from and why she's here. But the initial exchange between the two of them is that, you know, with, with this guy basically using his powers to slow down the brain impulses of Rachel Summers, it's all she can do to stay awake. But the other half of this is that where she and Cyclops are talking to one another, what we end up finding out is this guy shut off the powers of Cyclops. Now, technically speaking, this should not be possible. And and in truth, it's, it's kind of interesting because this means a couple of different things. One, it means this person can control the mind of Cyclops and effectively turn off his powers, but Cyclops' powers don't work that way. If there's any scenario where Cyclops has his, has his uh, visor off and his eyes open, optic beams are going to come flying out because his eyes are portals to another dimension. And so what this seems to indicate is that this guy was basically, you know, by virtue of shutting off Cyclops' powers, blocked access to his eyes being portals to this other dimension. And again, if that's the case, it's still pretty extreme. But for the character of Rachel Summers, I want to talk about her for a second. And so Rachel Summers is basically a time displaced character. One of the things that we've talked about when it comes to Marvel Comics is the nature of like alternate realities. Marvel uses something called branch universe theory. Marvel basically says there's a singular universe. There's, there's the main Marvel universe. And then at some point along the line, you know, events will take place. Like Spider-Man will get the Venom symbiote and the Fantastic Four will get their powers and Charles Xavier will form the X-Men or something along those lines. But like an event will occur that will branch off to a different universe. And sometimes it creates a new universe. Sometimes it's the guaranteed future of the existing universe. For example, the guaranteed future of the main Marvel universe was Days of Future Past. At some point in the future, Mystique was going to form a new brotherhood of evil mutants and they were going to assassinate Senator Robert Kelly, Moore McTaggart, the mutant geneticist, and Charles Xavier. In response, humanity would jumpstart the Sentinel program, the Sentinels would become autonomous, and they would basically conquer North America. That was the absolute future. What Chris Claremont also said is in this future, this Days of Future Past landscape, Jean Grey and Scott Summers would have a daughter named Rachel, and Rachel would have all the powers of Jean Grey and none of the powers of her father. The result is that Rachel Summers would use her powers to send the mind of Kitty Pride into the past and stop Days of Future Past from happening. Now, this is where Marvel began to experiment with the idea of the multiverse, because the questions fans had is, okay, if the Days of Future Past is a guaranteed future, and then Rachel Summers sends the mind of Kitty Pride into the past to stop the Days of Future Past, then it creates a paradox. If the Days of Future Past is stopped, then why would Rachel Summers send the mind of Kitty Pride into the past to stop a future that never happens? And so what Marvel did is they said, well, it's an alternate reality now. Because of the fact that Days of Future Past was stopped, now it's an alternate universe. In that alternate universe, Days of Future Past continues on just like it always did. But the, the guaranteed future in the main Marvel universe is still unwritten now. We don't really know where that future is going to hold. And so because of that, Marvel started using that as a way to basically explain all these alternate universes, all these alternate realities. But because of the fact that the Days of Future Past became an alternate universe after it was stopped, Rachel Summers didn't understand why her future didn't change. And so in an effort to understand why it didn't change, she traveled into the past. And because she went back, she basically traveled along this line and then back to the point before Days of Future Past was supposed to happen, back before the assassination attempt, basically, by Mystique and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. What it meant is that she jumped from her universe into the main Marvel Universe and into the past of the main Marvel Universe. And so that created a story called Days of Future Present, alongside like adult Franklin Richards showing up, going insane, different things like that. But the whole idea behind this was that with Rachel Summers in the present day, uh, she was one of those characters that Marvel just kind of brought in and then never really knew what to do with. And so she was rolled over onto like the Excalibur team, different things like that. But she's just kind of been free floating in the Marvel Universe ever since because nobody ever really knew what to do with her. She was originally designed to kind of be a stand-in for Jean Grey, but fans immediately rebuked it. And they were like, we do not want anyone but Jean Grey. And so eventually, of course, Jean Grey made a return, different things like that. And Rachel Summers' relationship with Jean Grey was a little tenuous, you know, but it was still a pretty cool scenario. But the fact remains, that's why Rachel's here. So having said that, hopefully we didn't uh, we didn't burn your mind your mind out too bad. <laughs> we didn't fry your brains. But at this point, we pick up with Havoc with Alex Summers. Now, Alex Summers is actually a pretty cool character when it comes to his whole story. I mean, he just kind of shoots energy and different things like that. The fun fact about this is that he and Cyclops are immune to the other's powers because they're brothers. So it's actually a cool little caveat when it comes to the two of them. But the cool thing about Alex Summers is that this deals with the idea of Iceman Bobby Drake and then Lorna Dane Polaris. And the cool thing was that originally it was Havoc and Polaris who were together and then she bailed on him for Bobby Drake. And it was kind of cool because that really went into like X Factor, that line of storytelling that kind of dealt with this whole uh, tenuous love triangle. The fact remains, it's really just, you know, Alex Summers being forced to relive these darker memories 
memories that he would really just kind of rather avoid. Now, the other half of this is that, again, this guy shows up and just kind of taunts Cyclops to a degree, basically saying, I know everything about you. I know everything that makes you who you are. We've met before. You just don't know it. And so, again, it's kind of cool when it comes to these characters interacting with one another, because what we ultimately end up having is Sean Cassidy reaching out to uh, Nightcrawler and, and Wolverine and saying, hey, look, I have something you guys need to see. It's effectively the last will and testament of Maura McTaggart. And so you guys have to be aware of this. What we end up having is that the actual Blackbird is basically being controlled and is going to fly directly into the plane that, you know, Sean Cassidy's flying on. He basically jumps out and he intends to try to stop the plane, which he might have been able to do using his voice, but it's just not powerful enough. And the result is that he's actually killed in the explosion, which is big. I mean, it was one of those things where if you were only reading Uncanny X-Men, then basically you had House of M, you had Decimation, and then like three story arcs later, Sean Cassidy dies. And it's not really often that Marvel kills off an X-Man like that, at least, you know, a one that's been around for so long. And so it's kind of crazy because the response is, you know, from the X-Men, okay, so anybody who looks at this crime scene is basically going to say, the X-Men's Blackbird tried to fly into a commercial aircraft, a mutant jumped out and was killed in the explosion. What are the X-Men doing? And they're immediately going to come in and they're going to start storming the place. Because remember, the Office of National Emergency kind of takes precedent here. And so while it is one of those things of, you know, hey, we're here to keep you safe, it's also, we can raid your house anytime we want to. We're basically going to have the Office of National Emergency raid the place, trying to figure out what in the world is going on, why someone took the Blackbird and tried to fly it into another facility. Now, picking back up with Alex Summers with Havoc, the cool thing about this too, is we end up having this sort of mental image that he picks up when he sees Charles Xavier talking to Corsair. Now, Corsair this is a really, really cool character. Him and the Star Jammers were actually really, really fun. And it was an attempt by Chris Claremont back in the 70s and 80s to kind of expand the greater Marvel landscape. Remember, when it comes to like the Marvel cosmos, one of the things that we talked about is that there were a lot of people who were working on building the Marvel cosmology, but it wasn't a cohesive effort. It's not like Chris Claremont sat down with Jim Starlin and Roy Thomas and said, okay, so like, how do we flesh this out? It was one of those things where they each contributed their own piece in isolation from the other. And so Corsair was basically the father of Scott Summers and Alex Summers. Now, what's going on is that this whole idea, at least in terms of Charles Xavier talking to Corsair, what he's really saying is Scott Summers and Alex Summers, they can't know, you know, and it seems to be, you know, seems to indicate that he's telling Corsair, you can't tell them that you're their father. That's the, the impression that's being put on. What we're actually going to find out is that's not necessarily the case. Not only that, with regards to, uh, you know, everything going on with Scott and, and Rachel Summers, what we end up finding out is these psychic images that are being put into the minds of people are being done by this guy. He's effectively seizing control of Rachel Summers' mind and then forcing her to put all these images into everybody's head. Now, a lot of this is because of the fact that Charles Xavier kind of left these psychic imprints. What it does is it allows this guy to use the telepathic abilities of Rachel Summers to scan the Xavier Institute and grab these key moments from either his own life or the life of Xavier when he was there and then broadcast those images into people's minds or take some of the most horrific moments from their own experiences and force them back into those people's minds. So it's basically this guy pushing the powers of Rachel Summers in order to instigate his own ends. But not only that, Rachel Summers provides these little tidbits where she says, look, you know, when this guy was controlling my mind, I was also reading his a little bit and I've learned that he trained with the X-Men. And so it's these small little tidbits. This guy was at some point along the line an X-Men, but piecing together this, this, uh, you know, this video of Maura McTaggart after raiding the crash site and basically grabbing what it was a Banshee was bringing, Beast and Wolverine kind of break it all down. And in this last little moment, what Maura McTaggart says is that Charles Xavier was a terrible guy because he had gone to Maura McTaggart and asked to use her X-Men and then got them all killed. Now, this is a very important part of her character's history because with Maura McTaggart, she was a mutant geneticist, but it was one of those things where she also helped to harbor and find mutants that were basically kind of cast-offs. Now, whenever it was that she found characters like Wolfsbane or something along those lines, the characters that would basically go on to form the new mutants, Charles Xavier would serve the purpose of being a training ground for them. So Maura McTaggart and Charles Xavier were actually quite the team and it was really cool. And so what this does is this jumps back into the whole idea of the Battle of Krakoa. Now, longtime X-Men fans will be well aware of this. And in fact, as soon as this was called X-Men Deadly Genesis, they were like giant size X-Men number one. This goes into the nature of the X-Men, right? And we talked about this before. When Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Roy Thomas, you know, these major contributors, I think Alan Fine, when they were working on the X-Men stories back in like the 1960s and going into the early 1970s, the X-Men were not popular. After about 63 issues running over the course of like seven years, the comic was canceled and then reprints were issued for like the next 30 some odd comics. This ran into 1975 when Marvel relaunched for the giant size 
Size X-Men number one by Lynn Wine. And the whole idea is this is told the story of Krakoa. And this was basically a living island. It was a sentient island that had captured the X-Men, the original X-Men of Jean Grey and Scott Summers and Iceman, Beast, and Angel. And Charles Xavier had to form a second team, which is where he brought in the new generation of X-Men, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, all those guys, the ones that you're most familiar with with regards to the X-Men roster. The result is that with those newer characters being rolled in, with them being brought in, uh, what it meant is that fans kind of got the best of both worlds. They got a more diverse lineup of X-Men combined with the X-Men they were already used to. Now, eventually that went out into Bob Layton's whole, you know, initial launch of X-Factor with like the first like five issues and then Walter Simonson and Louise Simonson took over and they wrote it for a little while. But the fact remains here that this is how this all kind of kicked off. And this is basically what ends up happening in the story. We have this flashback of sorts where Charles Xavier shows up to, to Maura McTaggart and says, okay, my X-Men have been captured and the psychic link I had with them has been cut off. But here's the last few images that I saw before that happened. And it was the X-Men doing the best they could. But the problem is that it seemed as though the X-Men had either been killed or had been captured. And so the result was that the desire of uh, Xavier was to find a way to bring them back. Now, following this, what Xavier did is he had gone to Maura McTaggart and said, I need to use your X-Men team. And so in effect, this was a secret X-Men team that nobody ever knew about. The first of these members was a girl named Sway. And Sway had the ability to like slow down or stop time in a localized space, meaning it was only in like a small vicinity. And so basically it would be like in a bubble. And so if you traveled outside her sphere of influence, time would pass just like normal. But after Sway came a character by the name of Petra. And Petra was basically a geomorph, meaning she could alter the structure of Earth. She could basically, you know, create things. She was able to evolve a coal into a diamond, different things like that. But she was basically able to manipulate the planet Earth. Following this is the character of Darwin. And we've already done an origin video on him, but Darwin was basically a guy who could adapt to any circumstance. He could adapt to anything. It didn't matter what it was. If it was fire, he wouldn't really feel it. His body would adapt so the fire wouldn't burn him. If it was dark, he would develop, you know, uh, night vision. I mean, his body would physically adapt to any situation. But one of the more powerful versions of these characters, and one of the most powerful characters on this team, was a kid named Gabriel. And nobody really knew anything about Gabriel's past. All they knew was that he was an orphan somewhere along the line, but his power was to manipulate energy. And it didn't matter what that energy was, exotic, normal, whatever, he could control it and manipulate it. So if you had like a gun and you shot a gun at him, that bullet lets off kinetic energy, he can effectively stop it. That's why one of the arguments that's made is that Vulcan borderlines on reality warping because everything is composed of energy. And if he can manipulate exotic energy in the form of energy blasts or something like that, what would stop him from manipulating the energy of the universe? And so if it's pushed high enough, he could be a reality warping character on the highest order because he would be manipulating the energy of the universe as opposed to just energy beams and different things like that. So again, Charles Xavier basically enlists these kids as, hey, look, I need your help. We have to go rescue the original X-Men. They're immediately on board because they're all vying to be part of the X-Men. And so Charles Xavier, instead of training them in real time, throws them into the mindscape, but doesn't tell them. And this is where Charles Xavier starts to demonstrate this kind of duplicitous, dishonest nature in the sense that as far as, you know, Darwin and Gabriel and Petra and Sway, as far as they're aware, it's real. Everything they're experiencing is real, but Xavier is basically tricking them and not necessarily telling them the truth. But the reason why is because they're on a tight schedule. Time is in such short supply. Xavier does not know how long the original X-Men are gonna last and he needs them to be rescued as fast as humanly possible. And so trading these characters in the mindscape seems to be the most efficient way to do it, but it's not. And so what ended up happening is Charles Xavier had basically sent these kids out into a mission and they all got killed. And so what we end up having is Scott Summers and we end up having Rachel Summers who basically make their way out of this holding facility that, you know, that this guy was putting him in. And we find out this is Gabriel Summers, that this is the energy manipulator that we were seeing. And he's also the brother of Scott Summers. He's the brother of Cyclops that Cyclops never knew about. Now, the cool thing about this is we do have an origin story on Vulcan, I'm pretty sure. Uh, either it's an origin story or it's an Omega Beyond Omega level video. I can't remember which one. But basically, he's not born of Earth. Instead, what ended up happening is in the history of Cyclops and, uh, and, and Havoc, Alex Summers, where, you know, they were basically kind of thrown out of a plane by Corsair when, you know, Corsair and his wife were being kidnapped by the Shi'ar Empire. Empire, and in turn, you know, Cyclops and Havoc were given parachutes and they were said, hey, get to safety, you know, what have you. Where Corsair and his wife were taken by the Shi'ar Empire to basically be thrown into a workforce. And what we ended up finding out was that Cyclops' mom was about two months pregnant by the time that Gabriel had popped up. And so the result was that when they were in the Shi'ar Empire, she effectively gave birth to him. And then he in turn was thrown into a matrix where his growth was sped up. And then he was just kind of forced into a work camp. Now, eventually he was able to make his escape. He arrived back on Earth. The rest is history. But the idea was that he was just kind of inducted into the X-Men 
and that was really about it. And so following this, because of the fact that he's made such a huge display and the fact that, you know, the Office of National Emergency is able to lock onto his energy signature after realizing that he's the one that sent the, sent the Blackbird crashing into Banshee, effectively killing him. He, of course, overpowers the entirety of the, you know, the Sentinel and kind of obliterates everybody. But his whole stance here, his whole goal is to draw out Charles Xavier, which works. Because when he goes to Muir Island, what we end up finding out is that Charles Xavier's alive. That Charles Xavier is not dead. Not only that, Charles Xavier, when he shows up, basically confirms everything that, that Gabriel Summers has been saying. That like, yes, Gabriel Summers is the brother of Cyclops. Yes, Gabriel Summers was one of the one of the members of the secret X-Men team that no one was supposed to know about. And so again, it's a huge deal because what ends up happening is that in response to this, all the other X-Men basically start showing up. And so it was kind of this huge audience that Gabriel Summers was shooting for in the first place. The problem with this is that where Gabriel Summers says, show everyone the truth, use their powers, show everyone the truth, where Charles Xavier shows up with the ability to walk, he also shows up without his powers. And so he can walk around, but he can't use telepathy. And this is kind of like a curse is that he really kind of interprets it as the Scarlet Witch said, fine, I'll give you your legs back, but I'm going to take away your powers just like 98% of the rest of the mutant population. And so the result is that we end up having this branching scenario that takes place, you know, where Rachel Summers steps up and says, okay, fine, you can use my mind to broadcast the truth into the minds of everybody else. And again, this is where we end up finding out the whole situation that this Gabriel Summers led X-Men team did show up. They did seem to rescue the original X-Men, but Cyclops was the only one who was able to get away with the help of the original team. Where Cyclops took off, you know, where he was told, go find help, that the reality of the situation was that for Gabriel Summers and for Charles Xavier himself, that this X-Men team was seemingly obliterated. The Living Island had basically adapted itself to all of their attacks. It killed Sway, it killed Petra, you know, it seemed to kill Darwin, and it seemed to kill Vulcan, or at least that seemed to be the case. The problem with this was that while this battle was going on and these younger X-Men were being killed, Charles Xavier modified the memories of Cyclops so that Cyclops would believe the island sent him back to the X-Men to find more mutants, which is what the original giant size X-Men number one story told us. And so what we end up finding out here is that Charles Xavier messed with the mind of Cyclops, tricked him into believing something happened that didn't actually happen, and in turn, the rest of the mutants that were left on that island, they all effectively died. Now, Gabriel Summers and Darwin technically lived, but nobody else knew that. And so when Charles Xavier had rounded up this new generation of X-Men, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, so on and so forth, and sent them to the island alongside uh, Cyclops to rescue the original X-Men team, where that version was successful, and Jean Grey took the giant landmass and shot it into space, what they didn't know is that Vulcan and Darwin were still in that chunk of land. And so because of that, they were basically sent out there, you know, and they were just kind of floating in space. Darwin basically merged with uh, with, with uh, Gabriel Summers in order to keep him alive. And then they've just kind of floated in there ever since. Because of the fact, because of the events of House of M, with this massive amount of energy being given off by the 98% of mutants that lost their powers, it woke up Gabriel Summers. It kicked him up out of this, you know, catatonic state. And then he in turn went on this warpath because he remembered virtually everything. And the question was, why doesn't anybody else know? And so as a result of this, Darwin basically reconstitutes himself, more or less, because it's Darwin. And in response to this, with Cyclops learning the truth that his mind had been tricked by Xavier, that Xavier was being duplicitous, he was lying, Cyclops kicks him out of the Xavier Institute and says, you're no longer welcome here. This works because remember, Cyclops and Emma Frost have been running the Institute following the vanishing of, uh, of Charles Xavier. They've been running it for quite some time. Not only that, as far as Cyclops says, he says, you're not a mutant. You don't have telepathy anymore, so you don't really even have a place here. If we've told every person that's, that's not a mutant that they can't come here, that same rule has to apply to you. So you have to leave. And so what this does is it sets in motion the story called Rise and Fall of the Shi'ar Empire, where basically Gabriel Summers races into space in order to gain vengeance against the Shi'ar Empire, who are responsible for the death of his mother and the presumed torture of his father, you know, Corsair, and so on and so forth. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.